I work for Anthony J. Lyon, International Detective Bureau. They call me the Lion's Eye. Wednesday at 9, and CBS brings you Jeff Regan, Investigator, starring Frank Graham as Regan, with Frank Nelson as Anthony J. Lyon. So stand by for mystery and suspense and adventure in tonight's story of The Little Man's Lament. <laughs> They called it Margate Mansion, but the name didn't fit. It was a pile of old cement and cracked stucco held up by a half a dozen tired palm trees. The people inside didn't fit either. A crusty old lady who talked backwards, a redhead with an urge to travel fast. But it was Junior who won first prize. He was half Einstein and half Hollywood playboy. Only when this boy played, it was with poison. It started on a Tuesday... I was headed down Taft Avenue on my way to the laundromat. I had a date with a washing machine and a blonde cashier named Gloria. That's when a cab pulled up beside me and the lion hopped out. He was blowing sparks out of a fat cigar. I could tell by the 50-cent smell that we had a new client. Oh, Jeffrey, Jeffrey, my boy, I'm glad I caught you. Get back in the cab, fat, so I'm busy. But I have to talk to you. I was just going up to your apartment. Have a good time. I'll be out all day. Now, Jeffrey, is that any way to talk after all I've done for you? After the many opportunities I've given you to help your fellow beings in distress? I've worked three weeks without a rest. i got to wash my socks. Wash your socks? You can talk about a thing like that when I'm here to present you with a golden opportunity? An opportunity to demonstrate our humanitarian sentiments? A chance to lift one who's in trouble? How much did you lift from him? A hundred bucks, and it's not a image of her. Oh, it's really a simple job, Jeffrey. Very simple. I've just been over there. Lovely old house, fine old family. The Margates, flower of the old south. Gone to see him. Uh, well, yes. But you know how it is with descendants of old families. Fresh young growth choked back by the weeds of the old family stock. The fresh new plant smothered by decay and ruin. Try Vigoro. Regan, you don't seem to understand. We've been retained by Mrs. Margate. It's about her nephew, Hillary Margate. Strange youth, very strange youth indeed. If Mrs. Margate needs protection from him. I tell you, it's a very serious matter. Well, so's my laundry. Regan, will you listen to me? There's another choice? Yes. See, Mrs. Margate, root out the facts. Get her a gardener. She doesn't need a gardener. She needs you. And don't give me any more trouble. Okay, okay, sweetheart. Here. Wait a minute. What's it? My laundry. Put the shirts and socks in a washing machine. Put two bits in the slot. And stay away from the blonde. She doesn't like cigar smoke. Regan, this means you will see Mrs. Margate? Don't try to be coy. You knew I'd see her the minute you stepped out of that cab. I walked up Vine and turned right past Franklin. All the places up there are old, but Margate Mansion was old when William S. Hart was Gene Autry. A bunch of turrets made out of wood that termites wouldn't look at. But I was looking at what was standing in the front bay window looking at me. Red hair and wide eyes and a complexion like skim milk. She was what answered the door when I twisted the old-fashioned bell. Hello. I saw you from the window. Yeah, I saw you seeing me. Come in. Come in, please. Thanks. I... I hope you don't mind the disorder. I'm afraid I don't... Your name? Regan. Oh. Is 
sit here, Mr. Regan. Please don't mind the dust on the sofa. No one nice ever comes, so it doesn't matter. I like you. I want you to stay. It shows. You're not married or anything like that, Mr. Regan. Nothing like that. Oh, that's nice. I'm not married either, Mr. Regan. I heard it was Mrs. Margate. Oh, that's my aunt. I'm not married at all. Mr. Regan, you didn't just come to see my aunt. I've got a lot of time. Oh, I've been foolish again, haven't I? Sometimes I, I get so mixed up. I, I'm... Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. Yes, Mr. Reed. What's your name? Gwethelyn. Mrs. Margate's niece. Yes. Hillary's your brother? Yes, Mr. Reed. All those questions. Business. Business? International Detective Bureau. Your aunt's on the line for $100 worth. A detective? Well, that's polite for it. Oh, you shouldn't have told me that. You shouldn't have told me that at all. Suppose you tell me some things. I'm mixed up, Mr. Regan. I can't tell. Bless him. What's my aunt? Did I hear the front door bell? Don't say anything. Don't tell her. I did hear the front door. Well, Gwethelyn, who is this man? He's... Regan. Regan? Oh, you're the man they call the lion's eye. I've been expecting you. I'm gardening. I should have figured. What? Oh, I have a green thumb, as they say. Follow me. Go to your room, Gwethelyn. Yes, Auntie. Gwethelyn? Yes, Annie, I'm going. She went all right, like a rabbit at a greyhound race. Only I wasn't sure this rabbit could stay ahead of the dogs. But right then I had another problem, keeping up with Mrs. Margate. It wasn't the way she walked, it was her talk that went at me. Go to the garden. <sighs> my niece and my nephew, a problem is that weigh heavily on my heart, Mr. Regan. Oh, this way... Family collapsing and falling to ruin. Just three Margates left. Myself and the two children, Gwethelyn and Hillary. Only 52 years old with such responsibilities. Hillary? No, no, myself, of course. 52. But Hillary is the real problem. You follow me? Right behind you. What? Oh, yes, out this door. Uh, the garden. Uh, there. Do you see that pool by the date palm? Uh-huh. Fish. Carp, Mr. Regan. He concocts things. Hillary brews things, poisons. One day he fed something he had brewed to Hillary F. Margate Sr., the carp, and he turned bright green. Hillary? The carp. We found him next morning floating belly up, stock bright green. Hillary F. Margate Sr., the carp. We name our fish after the dear departed members of our family. Nice custom. Yes. Hillary poisoned the carp when he was only 146 years old. The carp? Yes, yes. Uh, come along. Uh, Hillary was only a boy at the time. Such a problem, Mr. Regan. Oh, here. My vegetable garden. Uh, have an onion, Mr. Regan. Delicious. Uh, yeah. Look, Mrs. Margaret. Uh, eat the onion, uh, Mr. Regan. Uh, George. George. George is my gardener. I'm over here, Mrs. Margaret. Oh, well, you, you can go out back and cut the weeds, George. Mr. Regan and I have some private matters to discuss. Yes, ma'am. Excellent, ma'am, George. Excellent. And be sure you get them all, George. We must be rid of the weeds. Yeah. Okay, ma'am. <sighs> now, we're alone, Mr. Regan. Uh, the onion, go on, eat it. No. Uh, as I was saying, Hillary, that boy, such a problem. Yeah, as you were saying. Yes, yes. Good, aren't they? Mrs. Margate, what is it you want me to do? Do? Well, I want you to look after Hillary. I was told you wanted protection. Well, it's the same thing, isn't it? No. Hillary needs a nursemaid. That's not our line. No, see here, Mr. Regan. International Detective Bureau has already agreed to handle my case. Mr. Lyon himself accepted my check. He'll accept anyone's check. But he promised to help. Well, then talk to him. I'm talking to you. I'm explaining. You're explaining nothing. You've given me a lot of double talk, and I have a feeling that's all you want to give me. Now, make sense. All right, all right, all right. You're going to force me to say what I hoped never to say to anyone. Not anyone. My life is in danger. I can believe that. My tea. Yesterday, I noticed the odor of almonds. I'm listening. No, I didn't drink it naturally. Naturally? Naturally. Hillary brewed that tea, Mr. Regan. My nephew. Now you've said something. Where is he? Ocean Park, the shooting gallery. Shooting gallery? Yes, he's strange, very strange. He boos things, collects guns, practices shooting. You won't like him. Uh, suppose I go talk to him. Well, you'd better. As I've said, Mr. Regan, I don't wish to be murdered. I headed the car down La Brea to Olympic and then out to the Ocean Park Pier. 
It was afternoon business, popcorn and sailor style. The shooting gallery had one customer, a kid in a corduroy sport coat with a face like a cantaloupe out of season. He was taking shots at the little swinging targets. You didn't need the family album to figure him for Hillary Margate. I walked over, but he didn't take the gun from his shoulder. Leaks. Come again? Leaks. Scallions. My name's Regan. Allium Ascalonica, Mr. Regan. Onions. You've been eating them. So? This suggests you're the private detective hired by my aunt. Bullseye? You read palms, too? I fancy myself an amateur detective, Mr. Regan. I seldom miss. I notice. As a matter of fact, Mr. Regan, I'm interested in hiring you myself. Oh, that's a switch. I think there's going to be a murder. Anybody I know? Yes, my aunt. Who plays the heavy? The heavy? Who's going to kill her? I am. Practicing? I don't need practice, Mr. Regan. Even experts get the chair. Possibly. All right, Junior, let's start making sense. Very well, Mr. Regan. My aunt is a domineering autocrat. Actually, I should hate to kill her. But I feel I must. Uh, to protect myself, you understand. From what? <laughs> you know, I dabble in poisons, Mr. Regan. I am empoisonné, as the French say, poisoner. When I was 15... I heard that one, yeah. Hillary F. Margate Sr., the carp. Oh, he died a horrible death. My regrets. Now, get to the point. Ours is an evil household, Mr. Regan. The last of the Margates, a decaying race. My aunt, for example, and Gwethlin. I met her. Then you understand that something must be done. This is an urgent matter, Mr. Regan. It would be wise to take my case. One Margate for a client's too many. Very well, Mr. Regan. But you want information. Perhaps I'll give it to you tomorrow. I'll phone you. As they say on the radio, you may save a life. Possibly... You're on? It made a real funny joke the way he said it. Only I wasn't laughing. And neither was he. I got in my car and started for town to tell the lion he'd been underpaid. All the way in, I kept getting a picture of a mechanical rabbit going around a track. I tried putting Gwethelin's face on it, and Mrs. Margate's, then Hillary's. The others didn't fit. Gwethelin's did. <laughs> I was still thinking about it when I parked on Hill Street and got out to walk. And that's when I put another face on the rabbit, my own. The guy who fell in behind me and started following was no greyhound, but he had squeaky shoes that slowed down when I slowed down. We stayed together for a block, and when I turned left toward the office, he turned left. I wondered if he was an amateur. I found out when I sidestepped into an alley and pulled him in after me. All right, Buster, this is where you get off. Hey, say, what the devil? Come on, come on, who hired you? Let me go. Give me some answers. I... Talk. You want muscles, huh? Muscles? All right. I got it. He had them all right. And he knew where to use them. He had a bald head and he used that too. Right in the middle of my stomach. I shouldn't have bent double, but I did. It was a setup. The next blow sent me around the fender of a truck parked in the alley. I went to my knees. When I came up, it was too late. The bald head was gone. But someone else was there. Mr. Regan. It was Gwethel and Margate. Mr. Regan, you should be careful. You all right? He was following me. No, Mr. Regan, no, he wasn't. I was going to your office. He was following me. She was ready to talk, but the fog in my head wouldn't let me listen. I got her around the corner into a bar. She waited until the waiter brought the drinks. Two bourbon straight, Mr. Regan. And if I may say so, this is a lovely tomato you are escorting to my humble palace. You said so. Ah. And may I say, Mr. Regan, I'm also partial to redheads. On account of my first love was a redhead. She played second flute in our orchestra. Sure. Keep the change. That was when I was with Stokowski. Ah, oh, the Hollywood Bowl, how well I remember. Me and my fiddle. We made together beautiful music. Me and the fiddle, you understand, not the redhead. She gave me nothing but the cold shoulder and account she was hot for a guy that played bass. Come on, you told me this story yesterday. You don't wish to hear the story of my life, Mr. Regan? Well, it was the same way with Mr. Stokowski. The artist is lost in the world of today. <laughs> All right. Now we can talk. I don't know, Mr. Regan. Who was following you? It doesn't matter. 
I'm used to it, Mr. Regan. Who was the mug? It doesn't matter, Mr. Regan. It's too late anymore. I thought... You thought what? I thought you'd help me, Mr. Regan. I was on my way to your office. Why? It's going to be trouble, Mr. Regan. Serious trouble. What says so? Everything. Hillary, my aunt. They're all acting so strangely. And those people who come to the house. People? Who? I don't know. But the man who was following me is one of them. Well, something strange is going on, Mr. Regan. Something terrible. You still haven't told me anything. But don't you see? It isn't anything I can tell you. It's a feeling. A terrible feeling. Everything's wrong. I've got to have facts, lady. I don't... Wait. There's one thing. Yeah? The gardener. Mr. Hendricks. George? Yes. My aunt knows him, Mr. Regan. Better than just a gardener. Something else. What? George has been in prison. I know he's been in prison. I heard him say something once on the telephone. To who? I don't know. There's so much I don't know. <sighs> that makes two of us. You don't believe me. You've got to believe me. Something terrible's going to happen. Sure. Hillary's going to kill your aunt. Hillary? Oh, no, no. That's not it at all. It's me they're going to kill, don't you see? They're going to kill me. After that, I couldn't get anything out of her that made sense. I loaded her in a cab and then walked over to Pershing Square to feed the pigeons. Maybe something would come to me. Nothing did. Except the pigeons. After a while, I went over to the examiner morgue to look up George Hendricks. There was nothing, not a word. But the lion has ways of finding those things out, so I went back to the office. The lion had information, all right, but not the kind I expected. Regan! Regan, where have you been? I've been calling every saloon in the city. You got the wrong one. I often wonder why I hired you. Okay, Fatso, why the steam? I'll tell you why, because you were supposed to be on the Margate case, that's why. What do you think I've been doing? I know what you're going to be doing. You're going to get out to Margate Mansion right now and fast. They just found Hillary Margate in his room. He's been shot through the head. <laughs> This is CBS, and you're listening to The Story of the Little Man's Lament. Tonight's adventure with Jeff Regan, investigator. Here's a special word for those of you who are interested in setting up a retirement fund. One that will permit you to have some of the good things of life before you're too old to enjoy them. Join the payroll savings plan where you work and invest in United States savings bonds. Under this plan, your firm sets aside whatever sum you name from each paycheck and uses the money to buy savings bonds for you. Buy United States bonds and keep them. And now, back to tonight's story of the little man's lament and Jeff Regan, investigator. Nothing made sense. There were three Margates. The old lady, her nephew Hillary and his sister, Gwethelyn. And all three of them wanted to hire me to stop a murder. Then the lion tells me Hillary Margate has just been shot. Well, one thing was sure. With three people to work for, one of them was bound to turn up dead. I put the lion to work looking up the gardener, George Hendricks. Then I hopped in the car and headed out to the Margate place off Franklin Avenue. By the time I got there, it was turning dark. Out front, a black and white gnash said, Police, in big letters. But when the old lady opened the door, she acted as though she'd never heard of police. Oh, Mr. Regan, please come in. I'm sorry you didn't get to meet him. Hillary, strange boy. I met him. You did? Oh, this way, Mr. Regan. Well, it's no matter. It was inevitable. Hillary's uncle, my husband, before he died, warned me something like this would happen. He was a young fool, Hillary. How did it happen? Happen? Oh, with a gun, of course. How else could one shoot oneself except with a gun? In here, Mr. Regan, we won't be bothered by them. Sometimes police can be so nosy. Oh, do sit down. We shall have tea. With or without almonds? I know what you're thinking, Mr. Regan, but I'm sure it had nothing to do with it. What did? Just a moment, Mr. Regan. There's someone at our door. Well, Gwethelyn? I was just coming to see you, Andy. I thought you'd want me to tell Mr. Regan about Hillary. Mm. Yes, a good idea. Uh, Mr. Regan, I'll let Gwethelyn tell you. She was here at the time. Oh, she was a lovely woman. Gwethelyn's mother, my late sister. Well, go ahead, child. Go ahead, go ahead. I, I got home about 
Why? Uh, better sit down, child. No, 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 not there. Here. Yes, Sandy. Well, Mr. Regan, Hillary was in the gun room reading. I went in to talk to him. But he ordered me out of the room. He said he didn't want to be disturbed. He was concentrating. Go on. I left the room. A couple of minutes later, I heard a shot. When I went back, he was there. Hillary. On the floor, dead. Then you called the police. I told Auntie. She called them. They've been so nice, the police. They promised not to disturb me any more than necessary. Wasn't that nice? They're um, in his room now? With Hillary. Dear Hillary. Yeah. You won't need me anymore. I think I'd better be going. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, Gwethelyn, uh, see Mr. Regan to the door like a good girl. Yes, honey. And come again sometime soon, Mr. Regan. We shall have tea together. Thanks. This way, Mr. Regan. Mr. Regan, I've got to talk to you this way quickly. What's on your mind? It's about Hillary. Something he did tonight. Like what? When he came home, before he was... Before that... He had a book. A big book. He was reading it when it happened. Why would he read a book and then shoot himself? You got me. What was the title? I don't know. But when the police came, the book was gone. Where did he buy it? I don't know that either. But I'm sure it's important, Mr. Regan. I'm sure of it. You don't think it's important? I don't know. I reach for answers. Sometimes they come up air. I know something else, Mr. Regan. It's about George. George Hendricks, our gardener. Yeah? He disappeared this afternoon after it. Go on. And he sent for him when the police arrived, but he wasn't in his room. The police were angry. They think he might have done it. And you think so, too? I'm not sure, Mr. Regan. I'm not sure of anything now. She turned and ran into the house and left me with a lot of night air and cool breeze. If Hendricks had taken a powder, the police would check that angle. That left me with a book. A very big book. I walked down Franklin toward my car. Up ahead, I saw a small man in a black suit locking up a shop door. Over his head, a sign said Franklin Avenue Bookshop. That did it. I caught him before he closed up. I beg your pardon. Do you know a Hillary Margate lives up the street? Yes, I know him. Why? Was he in today? He's a regular customer. Was he in, yes or no? Uh, yes. Did he buy a book? No. You sure? Uh, positive. He asked for a volume we didn't have. What volume? I don't remember the title because we didn't have it in stock. It was a textbook. Textbook? Uh, yes, on horticulture. Uh, plants. Pla plants? Does that mean something to you? Yeah. It could explain why the Margate family has gone to seed. It was crazy, but it was beginning to untangle. I headed for my car up the street. Before I touched the starter, I found out I had company. All right, Regan, drive. The gun in my back told me he meant it. One look in the mirror told me he was George Hendricks. Well, you're calling him. Where to? Your apartment. I want to talk. Have a chair, Regan. It's your house. Thanks. I talk. You sit and listen. I can stand. I say sit down. It's your party, Hendricks. There's been an accident at the Margate house. I heard. Hillary shot himself. That right? You think different? Changed my mind. I didn't kill him, Regan. Who said you did? I never could get used to confinement. Oh. San Quentin? Oh, sandstone. Sandstone and soda. Tell me more. Listen, Regan, the police don't like guys with a record. What was your rap, Hendricks? Checks, something like that. Forgery. So why tell me? You're moving in my direction, Regan. I don't like it. Is that why you're in? There's... Something else. Yeah? The name. It isn't Hendricks. It's Margate. What's that? Freehold Quincy Margate. No wonder you changed it. There were several reasons. Yeah, Old South family. Listen, Regan, you've got to believe me. I didn't kill Hillary. I didn't have anything to do with it. You know a big guy, bald head with a stupid face? Morley. He works at the Margate place part-time. What's his job? Flunky. He works in the garden with me. When he isn't tailing the girl. Leave me out of that part of it. Well... Do I answer that? Yes, but watch what you say. Regan. Regan, I expected to hear from you sooner. What's happened to you? Regan, are you there? Uh, yeah, just got here. What's the matter? Someone with you? 
You're a genius. Well, I just found out about Hendricks. You guessed it. You mean he's there? Go on. Listen, that's not his real name, Regan. He's a Margate. Freehold Quincy Margate, age 46, height 5'11", weight 180. Get to the point. Well, about that prison record, quite correct. It was eight years ago, charge. Narcotics violation. Oh, yes, but be careful, he'll hear you. No, he won't. He just went out the door, fast. I had what I needed. I averaged 50 down Franklin and pulled up in front of the Margate place ten minutes later. It was dark and it looked empty, like a beer can after a picnic. I found an open window and crawled in. It was the gun room. And that meant I didn't have to go much farther. But somebody changed my mind for me when the door suddenly opened and a hunk of orange lightning stabbed in my direction. I ducked and the chair next to me toppled over. I couldn't wait for the next one. Let me go! Drop it! You're hurting my... That's better. Now some lights. Mr. Reek, I thought you were one of them. I'm not. That book Hillary was reading. What? I'm in a hurry, baby. You already know, don't you, Mr. Reek? All right. I didn't see it closely. It had pictures of plants. Like the ones in your backyard? Yes. I didn't know what it meant until... Until Hillary got it, and then you were too scared to talk. Why? Mr. Regan, Hillary didn't poison my aunt's tea. They only said he did so they could kill me and then blame him for it. That way they'd be rid of both of us. Yeah, but Hillary caught on too quick. That's why they killed him, Mr. Regan. Oh, don't let them know I know. It won't matter now, baby. I circled around the house in a hurry. Empty. Then I tried the garden. That's when I saw it. Fifty yards behind the house. A strange light at first. Then something red that began to grow. Then smoke and more smoke. I ran for the back of the garden in the flames. She saw me coming. Stand back, Mr. Regan. Maybe tomorrow, Mrs. Margate. I warn you, Regan. Stand back. You hired me, remember? Take one more step, Mr. Regan, and Morley will kill you. You yeah. figured he'd be around. Put that gun down, Morley. The smoke's getting in your eyes. No, no. Shoot him, Morley. Shoot him. You're too late for that. I drove across the column of smoke and caught his arm as he tried to find me with that gun. I got to him first. I owed him something for what he'd given me in that alley. And I paid him back with it. The old just stood there and glared at me, the fire reflecting in her eyes. It took me ten minutes in my best sport coat to stop the blaze. But the price was cheap. Because where the fire had been was a nice pile of Exhibit A. It looks just like an ordinary plant, but the police call it marijuana. Somebody spotted the smoke and called the fire department. The police were right behind them and loaded the last of the Margates into the wagon. And it was like Gweth said. She was scheduled to turn up poison, and I was supposed to testify that Hillary had done it. Only Hillary caught on too fast, and they gave him a bullet for his trouble. And after I finished up at headquarters, I went to the office and filled the lion in. He was disappointed. And this fellow the police picked up at the depot, this Hendricks, he, he wasn't the culprit we were looking for? He was under the old lady's thumb like the rest of the family. She blackmailed him into growing the stuff. With his record, he couldn't afford to squawk. He couldn't afford to squawk? How do you think I feel? You got a check for a hundred bucks, didn't you? Uh, <clears throat> well, yes, I did. Uh, well, that she is... did pay you, didn't she? Well, you see, Jeffrey, uh, that is, she, she gave me a check when I first went out there for one hundred dollars. You said that. Well, I didn't think anything of it at the time, but... Uh, well, you see, her brother-in-law... You mean... Well, that is, Hendricks did have a prison record for narcotics violation, but, uh... Well, it seems upon examining the records more closely, there was an earlier sentence for, uh... Bad checks. Uh, yes. It seems to run in the family. I don't get paid this week. Uh, go on. Quit me. Kick a man when he's down. Oh, stop it. You know I never withhold payment when I have it. Right now, I don't have it. Maybe next week... If you I... wait two weeks, it'll be Thanksgiving. What's that mean? You can have the end of the turkey I've been getting. Jeffrey, you're not being kind. <coughs> you remember my heart. I'll try. Oh, thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you. Now, here's 25 cents. For what? Go over and pick up your laundry. I forgot to wait for it. <laughs> Jeff Regan, Investigator, is written, written by William Frug and William Fifield, directed by Sterling Tracy, and stars Frank Graham as Regan with Frank Nelson as Anthony J. Lyon. 
Original music is by Dick Arant. Jeff Regan, investigator, is heard each week at the same time over CBS. Bob Stevenson speaking and inviting you to be with us again next Wednesday at 9 for more suspense and mystery and adventure with Jeff Regan, investigator. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Be sure to listen tomorrow night for Ted Mack and the original Amateur Hour, broadcast over most of these ABC stations. The amazing Mr. Malone. Operator. Operator. Get me the office of John J. Malone. The American Broadcasting Company presents The Amazing Mr. Malone, an exciting half hour of mystery created by Craig Rice and starring Gene Raymond. Our locale is the city of Chicago, the time, the present, and the hero of these weekly adventures, The Amazing Mr. Malone. Malone is the name, John J. Malone, attorney and counselor at law. And before we get underway tonight, I'd like to thank all our old clients and welcome the new ones who came by. We'll be here every week at this time, so if you're in the neighborhood, drop in. You're always sure to meet some interesting people. Take Paul Conrad, for example. Mr. Conrad is the stocky gentleman marching down the fourth floor corridor of the Benson building. You can tell from his walk that he's a man with confidence in himself. When he comes to a door marked... Larry Hogan, private investigations. He doesn't hesitate for a second, but barges right in. He has... Mr. Conrad is a boy who knows his way around. Hello, Hogan. Huh? I said hello. Oh. You know, it's a funny thing, Mr. Conrad, but I was just thinking about you. All right. Let me in on the joke. Huh? You said it was a funny thing, and I could stand to laugh these days. Oh, you know what I mean. Hey, uh, why don't you sit down? What's the matter, Hogan? Don't you think I can take it standing up? What have you got for me? Well, it's like I told you on the phone, Mr. Conrad. You know, you can't rush these things. Now, uh, do you take a dame, uh, I mean a lady, like your wife... Now we're getting and... down to cases. Who's the boy Doris has been seeing? Well, we haven't been able to run him down yet, but I expect I'll have something for you by next week. That's what you told me one month and 400 bucks ago. Just what kind of a chump do you take me for, anyway? No, I resent that, Mr. Conrad. Oh, don't get me wrong, Hogan. I don't blame you. I certainly acted like one. What's your man's name? <laughs> Let me go. Come on, Hogan. I'm losing my patience. Uh, well? You think you're smart? Not where my wife is concerned. Otherwise, I'd never let a gun up like you bleed me. Uh, now, who's the boy Doris has been seeing? Didn't you hear me, Hogan? Sherman. Jackie Sherman. Jackie Sherman, huh? Where will I find him? At the Brighton Apartments. That's very kind of you, Mr. Hogan. Now, if you'll be good enough to make out a check for all the dough you've clipped me for, why, I won't trouble you again. Just a second. Hello, Jackie. Doris. What are you doing here? Now, darling, you're not going to be angry with me. I couldn't stay away. Oh, look, Doris. Oh, I don't be mean, Jackie. Honestly, I couldn't help myself. I was sitting home all by my lonesome, and I started to think about you. Next thing I knew, I was in a cab. <laughs> you aren't the craziest dame. Mm-hmm. What am I going to do with you? Well, if you're stumped for an idea, maybe I can give you one. Hmm. Come here, darling. You know, maybe you've got something there. Let's try that again. Yeah, go on, what? Jackie. Don't let me stop you. Paul. Hello, Doris. Why don't you introduce me to your friend? Listen, Conrad. Oh, I... You won't have to bother, darling. Obviously, he knows me. Guess that gives you the advantage. Mm-hmm. You see, Jackie, I didn't find out about you until this afternoon. Really? Uh-huh. 
Doris, suppose you leave us alone for a while so we can get better acquainted. No. Go on, darling. I'll see you later. No, I'm not going. You think I'm afraid of you, Paul? Well, I'm not. I'm glad you found out about it. I'm crazy about Jackie. Crazier than you were about O'Neill or Burton or Wilson? And what was that fellow's name in Springfield? Shut up. I just want to make sure that this is different. Well, it is. I'm impressed. All right, clear out. No. I'm warning you, baby. Uh, uh, I'll call you later, Jackie. Did you hear that, Jackie? She's going to call you later. Look, Conrad, don't try and push me around. It's never been done successfully. There's a first time for everything, isn't there? Why don't you stop playing the outraged husband? You know your wife, your old friend. You're speaking of the woman I love. And she loves you, too. You mustn't forget that. Why are you... Yeah. She's crazy about you, Jackie. I don't know what you got. But it's a cinch you aren't going to have it long. Yes, sir, Wadley. Hey, what happened to you, Mr. Shaman? None of your business. Ah, but look at your face. Did you have an accident? I said none of your business. You know a boy named Daniel Skimor? Yeah. Is he here now? Well, look, Mr. Shaman, like you say, it's none of my business. Like I said. Now, where is he? In the corner booth. Send a bottle over to the table. You. Huh? You're Daniel Seymour? Uh-huh. You mind if I join you? So happens I do. Oh, you don't understand, No, Seymour. you don't understand, mister. I'm in no mood for company. Know what I mean? My name is Jackie Sherman. That doesn't change my mood. I'm a friend of Sonny Wilson. So? So he thought you might be receptive to a business proposition. Ah. Well, if it's business, that's different. Sit down. All right. Yeah? Seymour, how'd you like to make yourself 500 bucks? <laughs> it's a pretty ridiculous question, Jack. Well, all you got to do is take care of someone for me. And what might this someone's name be? Paul Conrad. Oh, is Conrad the boy who roughed... Uh, pardon, I shouldn't even ask... This wouldn't be the same Conrad who owns the Club 59 with Jerome Barney. Does that make a difference? Certainly. Conrad and Barney are big operators, and a kid like myself don't bat in their league. Unless there's a big incentive. Know what I mean? All right, what do you want? Another 500. Fair enough. <laughs> you know, Jackie, I like a guy who don't quibble over a couple of pennies. Let me tell you, fella, you'll be happy with the service. Know what I mean? Hello, Conrad. Uh, what brings you here, Barney? I just thought I'd drop by to see how you and Doris were getting along. Just peachy. Uh, you couldn't expect me to know. You haven't been down at the club in quite a while. I've had other problems in my mind. You got room for another? We're short. What do you mean, we're short? I just finished going over the books with Harold Plant. He tells me there's close to uh, $50,000 that he can't account for. It's what? Well, I didn't mean to upset you, Conrad. Still, I can't blame you. Fifty grand ain't peanuts. What happened to it, Barney? I was hoping you could tell me. Well, let me get this straight. You think... Uh, just a second. Don't go away, Barney. I'll be right back. Take all the time you need, Conrad. I'll be here. Yeah, what the... Please, devil. <laughs> Yeah? Have I the pleasure of addressing the amazing Mr. Malone? Well, don't tell me. It can't be Lieutenant Brooks. Can't it? I know I'm asking the impossible, Lieutenant, but if you had a mind, what would be on it? You know, that layoff did you good. Before your vacation, I didn't think your jokes could get any worse, but you fooled me. You're wasting your time on homicide, Brooks. Have you ever considered radio? You like my delivery? I think it's the greatest thing since the U.S. mail. What's up? Ever hear of Paul Conrad? What about him? Got himself knocked off at 5.30 tonight. What's that got to do with me? Well, silly fools that we are, we're holding his partner for the murder. Jerome Barney? Uh-huh. You're crazy. Oh, I bet you tell that to all the cops. Barney couldn't have killed him. You didn't even know Conrad was dead. You already got to figure out Barney isn't the killer. That's right. That's my boy who said that. Unfortunately. All right, Malone, we haven't been amazed in months. Come on down here and get to work. <laughs> Oh, 
You are listening to the amazing Mr. Malone. Today, more than ever before, Americans must be made to realize that freedom and the rights of the common man are a precious heritage. History has proved that people start to lose their freedom the moment they think it is forever secure. That is why we must all work at keeping our American heritage of freedom. For freedom is everybody's job. Many nations of the world today are standing at the crossroads between free government and dictatorship. But there are those who still aspire to political, economic, and religious freedom, and they look to America as an example. Well, it goes without saying that what Americans do during the troubled months ahead can greatly influence the decision that the war-exhausted peoples will make. To win against the totalitarian idea, Americans must become more aware of their citizenship. As a good citizen, remember your American heritage and work to defend your individual liberties. Do this by taking a more actual part in the affairs of your community and in fulfilling at all times the duties of American citizenship. And now, back to the amazing Mr. Malone. That's life for you. One minute you got it, and the next you haven't, as Mr. Conrad learned to his sorrow. And two hours after the police picked up Jerome Barney for teaching him the lesson, I was down at headquarters where I was greeted by the team that panicked the policeman's ball in 1922, and they were still using the same material. Hey, Sussman, look who's here. Do I have to, Lieutenant? Oh, now, come, Sussman. Let's have a little respect for the gentleman. This is, you should excuse the expression, John J. Malone. Attorney and counselor at law. Oh, that's a great routine you got there, fellas. Do you do a repeat performance for the coast? Where's Barney? Oh, well, Malone, seeing that he's one of your clients, we gave him the best seat in the house. Of course, it doesn't compare with the one he's going to get at Joliet. Whatever happened to all the straight men on the force? Hmm? We traded him to the straight cleaning department. That's enough out of you, Sussman. Only he can make the jokes. Personal jealousy, Hank. Come on, come on, open them up. Malone? How are you, Barney? Fine. How soon can you get me out of here? What's the matter, Mr. Barney? Haven't we made you feel at home? All right, Brooks, knock off already. What have you got on him anyway? Where do you want me to start? At the top of the page. Okay, number one, he was spotted leaving Conrad's apartment right after the murder. Number two, the gun was in his pocket. Why did you do that, Barney? Because my fingerprints are on it. They what? Well, I lost my head and I picked it up when I saw Conrad was dead. Oh, that's a jolly one. Come on, Sidney, fool us both and try to use your head. Where's his motive for killing Conrad? Where's his motive? Yeah. Conrad was tapping the till down at the club. The books were short to the tune of almost 50 grand. Is that right, Barney? Well, sure, but if I killed Conrad, I wasn't going to get my money back. Because you boys had a partnership insurance policy on the lives of each other. You know, I forgot about that. Well, it's a pleasure to remind you. Well, what do you say, Mr. Malone? Hmm. I wish I could think of a smart exit line. Oh, you uh, leaving already, Counselor? Yeah. Why, you haven't been at all amazing. Well, that makes us even because you haven't been at all amusing. I'll see you, girls. <laughs> Hello, Mrs. Conrad. Yes? I, uh, I wonder if you could spare me a few minutes of your valuable time. I'm afraid I'm busy. Oh, you can't be that busy. My name's Hogan. Hogan? Larry Hogan. I'm a detective. Oh, well, won't you come in? Thanks. Hey, it's kind of establishment you got here, Mrs. Conrad. Uh, can I offer you anything? I wouldn't be surprised. Of course, I told Lieutenant Brooks... Oh, uh, I guess there's been a slight misunderstanding. I'm not with the police. But you just said... Yeah, I know. I mean, I was a private detective. Hey, uh, is that bar just for show? Get it... out. Oh, no, 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 no. Let's not be hasty, Mrs. Conrad. I know you're upset about your husband, but uh, then he was plenty upset about you. What's that supposed to mean, Hogan? Just what it sounded like. I was doing a little research for him. Get me? No. Well, uh... A couple of months ago, he dropped by my office and asked me to do some checking on you. Well? Well, if I say so myself, I'm pretty good. Didn't take me long to find out about you and uh, Jackie Sherman. The next time you do something like that, honey, you want to use a little discretion. I think I've heard enough. Good. Now, uh, let's say, suppose I drop around, let's say, every uh, Wednesday morning. What for? Well, to pick up my check. Though, actually, I prefer cash. You're wasting your time, Hogan. I don't intend to be blackmailed. Oh, now, baby, who said it was blackmail? It is buying my services. I don't need them. 
Oh. You're uh, making a serious mistake, Mrs. Conrad. Are you threatening me? Why, I wouldn't dream of it. Still, I got something to sell, and if you don't want to buy, I'll bet I can find myself another customer. <laughs> Yeah? I'd like to talk to John J. Malone, please. You are now. Well, uh, you don't know me, Mr. Malone, but my name is Larry Hogan. Who? Larry Hogan. I'm a private eye. A private eye? <laughs> You've been seeing too many Bogart pictures. I bet you even own a trench coat. Look, Mr. Malone, I call to do you a favor. Why? What do you mean, why? You're representing Jerome Barney and the Conrad killing, ain't you? Well? Well, what would it be worth to your client if I can clear him? What do you want? Well, uh, I'm no pig, you understand. Uh, how does 500 bucks suit you? It suits me fine. Well, the party for you to see is Mrs. Conrad. Her hubby hired me to keep tabs on her. Who was she holding hands with? A boy named Jackie Sherman. Jackie Sherman. Yeah, he lives at the Brighton. Well, thanks a lot, Hogan. I'm forever in your debt. Hey, wait a minute, Malone. What about my dough? Hey, what dough? You promised me five bills. No, I didn't. I said 500 would suit me fine, and it would. I haven't made a penny since I came back from my vacation, so if you'll excuse me, Hogan, i got to get down to cases. Yes? Mrs. Conrad? That's right. You don't know me. And what makes you think I'd like to? I've got references. Uh, what about samples? Well, that can be arranged, too. Well? In public. Uh -huh. In that case, you better come in. Thanks. What did you say your name was? I didn't. But it's Malone. John J. Malone. Offer your drink? You can try. What do you have? Anything you've got. <laughs> You're taking quite a chance. Well, I believe in living dangerously. Uh, that's a reporter for you. Uh, pardon? Well, you are a reporter, aren't you? How could you tell? Uh, well, there's a certain something about all you newspaper men. Does it show? Oh, definitely. Well, I guess there's no fooling you. You know Larry Hogan? No, no. Am I missing something? Well, if you are, I'll make up for it. Here's your drink. Thanks. Mmm. Good? I don't know when I've had better. Now, i uh, tell you what I had in mind, Mrs. Conrad. The name's Dorothy. Well, I didn't want to presume. How would you like to do a personal series on the murder of your husband? Oh, what do you mean, a, a personal series? Oh, what it was like to be married to a big shot. <laughs> I'm afraid I couldn't. Why not? I never learned how to write. Now, maybe if I had someone to collaborate with, I... That's an idea. You'll be willing? No. But maybe Jackie Sherman would. What did you say? Well, let's face it, Lovey, you and Jackie are a natural. He probably knows more about this case than anyone else. How long have you two known each other? Get out. Get out? I haven't even finished my drink. You're going to get out of here. Now, now, Doris, you wouldn't throw a glass at me. Hey, yeah, I guess you would. Get out. Now, don't be angry just because you, you missed. It's hard to hit a moving you. target. It's lucky your husband didn't present that problem. You. <laughs> don't say it. It's been grand, Lover. Let's do it again real soon. <laughs> One, two, one. Hello? Is that you, Jackie? Yeah. Doggy, you got to come over here. You out of your mind, Doris? You don't understand. A newspaper man named John J. Malone was just over here. Who? John J. Malone. He's no newspaper man. He's a lawyer. But he just told He's me... He's representing Barney. Well, that's even worse. What did you tell him? I didn't tell him anything. He knew about us. Oh, how? Hogan must have told him. Jackie, i got to see you. Don't be any stupider than you have to be, Doris. Well, I... I can't go on like this. Look, will you try and get this through your head, baby? We're through. Washed up. Finished. Oh, no, we're not. I say we are. And what about me? Uh, you don't have to worry. According to the World Almanac, there are a million other men in Chicago. How dare you say that? It's the truth, isn't it? All right, Mr. Sherman. I can see you're looking for trouble. Maybe I know just the girl to accommodate you.
Hello, Seymour. Remember me? Well, the bandages look familiar. Squat. I was very surprised to hear you were still in town. Why? <laughs> you expect me to leave, Jackie? I got nothing to hide. I disagree with you. <laughs> Never seen it to fail. Look, Jackie boy, up to this point, my association with you has been very pleasant. You know why? Because you didn't tell me how to run my business. Know what I mean? Well, don't you think with Conrad dead that you... Conrad? Have... Never heard of him. Oh, now, look, Seymour, you... All right, look. I'm willing to pay you 500 more to get out of town. <laughs> well, if you're going to put it on that basis, Jackie boy, I'd be an ingrate to refuse. Know what I mean? I don't. You... What? That's what I hate about this place. They never keep out the riffraff. What are you doing here, Malone? You probably won't believe this, Seymour. Probably not. I had no idea you were here. I was following your friend. Imagine my surprise. Beat it, Malone. Say, what's the trouble with me today? Nobody seems to want me around. Maybe you ought to start reading the ads. That's a thought. And I got one, too. What do you suppose Lieutenant Brooks is going to say when I tell him that Mrs. Conrad's boyfriend has been consorting with a hired killer? Is that what you think I am, Malone? Uh-huh. Well, you're wrong. I never harmed a soul in my life. But you keep talking like that, and I might surprise myself. Know what I mean? Well, what are you stalling for, Sussman? King me. King you? Wait a minute, Lieutenant. How'd that checker get there? It was in that box all along. Honey, I didn't see it. Are you implying that I would cheat? No, he wouldn't do that, Sussman. He's just dishonest. Well, if it isn't the amazing Mr. Malone. What do you hear from Perry Mason? Why don't you give up, Brooks? I don't think you boys will ever replace the Keystone cops. What did you find out? Find out about what? Conrad's murder. Oh, oh, haven't you heard, Mr. Malone? We've got the killer under lock and key. It's a fellow named Jerome Barney who, by an odd coincidence, happens to be your client. You mean you haven't done any more work on the case? Well, it seemed like such a waste of effort with you on the job. Shall we get back to our game, Sussman? Listen, you comics, you know darn well that Barney didn't kill Conrad. Well, enlighten us, Counselor. Where did we make our mistake? Mrs. Conrad was holding hands with a boy named Jackie Sherman. Do tell. Twenty minutes ago, Mr. Sherman met with a fellow named Daniel Seymour. And you know what Dan Seymour does for a living. Yeah, I my suspicions. Well, what deduction do you Hawkshaws draw from that? Now, you listen to me, Malone. As strange as it may seem, we occasionally get an idea once in a while. Yeah. Now, it's your theory that Seymour gunned Conrad on behalf of Jackie Sherman. Yes. Well, there's only one thing wrong with that. When Conrad was killed, Mr. Seymour was being questioned by the police 15 miles away. He was? So I guess you'll have to find yourself another suspect. It's your move, Mr. Malone. <laughs> You are listening to The Amazing Mr. Malone. The United States Forestry Service has declared a state of emergency. Drought conditions across the nation have increased the danger of forest fires. Recently, 17 forest fire fighters lost their lives. Due to these unprecedented drought conditions, destructive forest fires are causing widespread damage in the West, the Rocky Mountains, New York, and in New England. The danger of similar disastrous fires elsewhere is rapidly increasing. The only obvious reason that 90% of forest fires are started is carelessness on the part of the average American. All persons entering wooded or forest areas, or even driving through in automobiles, are urged to exercise extreme care when smoking or using fire. Learn by heart these simple rules. Crush out cigars, cigarette, and pipe ashes. Break matches in two after using. Drown all campfires, then stir and drown again. And find out the law before starting any fire outdoors. Remember, nine out of ten forest fires are caused by people. You can help prevent them. And now, back to the amazing Mr. Malone. Professor Einstein had as much trouble with his theory as I had with mine. Here I had it worked out so beautifully that Dan Seymour had killed Conrad at the behest of Jackie Sherman, and according to Lieutenant Brooks, there was only one slight flaw. It never happened that way. Uh, same alone. Huh? Your mouth's still open. 
Now, listen, Lieutenant, are you sure that Seymour couldn't have killed Conrad? Positive. How do you know? Because at the time of the murder, we were having a little tater tate I got a phone call yesterday afternoon that Mr. Seymour had secured himself an assignment and a little interview might be in order. Who was your tipster? My friend didn't care to leave his name. But the point the is... The point is that at the very moment Conrad got himself gunned, I was looking into Seymour's beautiful brown eyes. Well, how about Mrs. Conrad? Yeah, hey, how about her? I mean, why couldn't she have killed her husband? No reason, except she didn't. At 5.30, she was having cocktails in Evanston. Any further nominations? Hogan. Who? Did you ever hear of a private detective named Larry Hogan? Yeah, several times. Well, he was the one who gave me Mrs. Conrad and Jackie Sherman. Well, that was sweet of him. Maybe Hogan killed Conrad. Oh, Malone, don't you think you're reaching a little? Well, why not? Where's his motive? He did some work for Conrad. By you, that's a motive? Suppose Conrad refused to pay him. Suppose they had a... Wait a minute, Lieutenant. I think I see it all now. You do? Yeah. Put your head on. We got work to do. Hello, Jackie. Doris, I thought I told you on the oh, phone... Oh, sweetheart, that... you know you didn't mean that. You couldn't possibly... Couldn't I? No. You're crazy about me and I'm crazy about you. You're crazy, period. You're wasting your time, Jackie. You can't make me angry. I know how much you care. But look what you did for me. What did I do for you, Doris? You know. Yeah, but we don't. What? So suppose what? you enlighten us, Mrs. Conrad. How did you get in here? Oh, I suppose we should have knocked, Brooks. Yeah, but they probably wouldn't have paid any attention. All right, Malone, what do you want? The party who killed Paul Conrad. I thought you were a lawyer. Yeah, that's a common mistake. Actually, Jackie, I'm very bad in the courtroom, so I find it much easier if we never go to trial. <laughs> All right, Lieutenant. Like they say in the police manual... Do your duty. All right. And Mrs. Conrad, by the power invested in me... Oh, I no, know. Lieutenant, not her. Him. What does that mean? You killed Conrad. Are you nuts? Now, there's no reason to be sore, Jackie. You went to a great deal of trouble to work out this plot. I'm just seeing to it that you get the proper billing. <laughs> Say, Malone. Huh? If it's not asking too much, would you mind drawing me a diagram? Oh, I thought the doctor told you to lay off those stupid pills. Well, Malone, we can't all be as smart as you. After all, to find all the answers, I'd be doing guest shots on gangbusters. Well, it had to be Jackie Sherman. It had to be. Now, why? It couldn't be anyone else. Where was his motive? Don't tell me he was in love with Doris. Of course not. But you saw the shellacking Conrad gave him. Well, Jackie wasn't the kind to take it laying uh, down. Uh, that still doesn't prove anything. Well, where do you think your tip came from to pick up Seymour? Jackie? Whom else? Well, that makes a lot of sense. Sure it does. Jackie knew his name was bound to pop up in this case. He was the most obvious suspect. So he hires a killer and then tips us off about it? Exactly. Oh, that's Miss Sugar. Ah, it's not crazy at all. Jackie had a great knowledge of psychology. He banked on us figuring the way we did. It didn't seem possible that having hired a gunman, he'd do the job himself, which is just what he did. Why do you think I had no trouble following him to Seymour? He led me there deliberately. Then I can't get over it. Did you realize how, how unusual this case was? You mean I didn't wind up with a beautiful blonde? No, no, I've seen that happen before. Oh, what then? Well, I've been running around with you, man and boy, almost three years. And this is the first time I can remember where you didn't get your head parted in the middle with a lethal weapon. Say, that's right. Yeah, let's just hope it doesn't establish a dangerous precedent. Good night, Malone. <laughs> Ever hear the story of the gangster who was haunted by ambition? He was going to be public enemy number one if it killed him. You gotta give the boy credit, he made us. I'll tell you all about it next week, so why not pick me up in my office at the same time? I'll be waiting for you. Good night. Jane Raymond was starred as John J. Malone. Our program was written by Gene Wang and directed by William P. Rousseau. Music by Basil Adler. The Amazing Mr. Malone is produced by Bernard L. Schubert. The events and characters depicted in this story were entirely fictional. Any resemblance to actual places of people living or dead is entirely coincidental. 
This is George Fenneman inviting you to be with us next week. The amazing Mr. Malone has come to you from Hollywood. Now, a listening reminder. Listen now for the premiere of The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The American Broadcasting Company presents Pat Novak for Hire. Sure, I'm Pat Novak for Hire. That's what the sign out in front of my office says, Pat Novak for hire. It's about the only way to make a living down on the waterfront in San Francisco. Because if you ever tried to practice the Ten Commandments down here, they'd steal nine of them and frame you with the other. So I rent boats and do whatever else comes in handy to make a buck change pockets. Sometimes the hustle pays off. Sometimes you get lunch instead. Last week it was neither of these. I hung around my place at Pier 19 day after day and nothing turned up at all. Just when I began to wonder if people had forgotten how to phone, a babe gives me a jingle. She sounds nervous and talks about trouble, asking me to come up and hold her hand. I end up at a joint on the marina slant of Webster Street. It was probably important stuff once in the way of gold-plated living. Now it's just a tired wooden boarding house with about 30 people filling up space designed for a dozen. The paint was peeling off the walls. The garden had been on its own so long it was beginning to look like a jungle. When I rang the doorbell, I'd have given even odds a zombie would open it. I was nearly right at that. It was Hellman, a detective from City Homicide with a disposition made up of equal parts of hating people and confusion. Right then, though, he wasn't himself. His fat face was wrapped in smiles. He looked like a cat who'd learned to open the icebox. Sorry, Novak, we don't want any fish today. You're being glad. Somebody must have broken their neck. You're wrong. Again, and as usual. Somebody had some sort of bad luck. As bad as you can get. Dead, huh? You're too late this time, Novak. The killer's already in the bag. And you got the drawstring. I'm not complaining. Now scamper off somewhere and find another sucker. Put the brush away, Hellman. If you got the killer, it's even money. It turns out to be four other people. I don't know. The department managed before you dragged into town. We stumbled, but we got by. You can say that about a wine bomb. I can make it fit you. Stumble on out of here, Novak. Yeah, yeah. But first, who done it? The landlady. She evicted a guy named Burke, the hardware. He didn't live here. He rented a room for some kind of an office. He was a freelance bookkeeper. She said he made too much noise working his machines at night. Did she confess? It's open and shut, Novak. No room for your chisel. Well, if she confessed, maybe you can pin it on her. What do you mean, pin it on her? The way you work, you couldn't prove Warren's governor. That's not my department, but keep on being smart and see if I can prove you'll fit in one of our cells down in Kearney Street. Don't strain your head, Hellman. I don't want any part of anything you're near, including this place. I'll buy that, too, and I'll breeze out of here. When the press shows up, don't worry about giving him your best profile. Either way, you'll look like a sack of potatoes. <laughs> Either way, you'll look like a sack of potatoes. Gee, that's good, Novak. Before you tell Hellman that, you better go somewhere and grow a little. Look, Novak, how'd you like a tip on a horse? I got a hot one in the fifth of Del Mar tomorrow. I got a tip for you. Get out of my hair before I have to comb you out. Gee, Novak, that's no way to talk. I could be your friend. The guy was small, even for a midget. Since the rooming house was so full of interesting people, I decided I didn't want to go away after all. So I went back up the steps. It was just going to try my luck when the door opens from inside. The guy with a welcome is either middle-aged or he's done a lot of careful living. His face is as smooth and as neat as a barrel full of apples. You notice it because he acts like he forgot his face when he went into his act. The rest of them is as mysterious as an attic in a B-horror picture. I didn't need any puzzles right then, so I started to brush him off. Especially when I noticed the suit. It was so ragged it looked like he was made up to put the bum on the town. But then I decided to play it for the last. How would you like to make some heavy money in a hurry? I quit buying oil wells. I'm not fooling, would you? Who are you? Name's Jack Lansom. I'm Burke's assistant, who used to be. Yeah, he looks like quick, easy money. 
For an undertaker. For you, too. Sure. Why not? And how? Burke has some papers in his home safe that I don't want poured over by any flatfoot snooper. They're my papers. Burke just kept them there for me. I want you to get them. I don't see any splints on your legs. I can walk, but I can't leave. Hellman's going to question all the tenants. So what do I do? Go to this address. It's on Knob Hill. Here are the keys. It's a wall safe, not a combination. Just two locks you have to open at the same time. The papers are in a sealed envelope marked Lansom Private. Get it and bring it here. I don't know. When a guy dies, the feds move in. They'll want to list his stuff for taxes. These aren't financial papers. They're just some private letters and things. I don't like flirting with the FBI. How would you like to flirt with 1,000 bucks? If the stuff's worth that much, it must be hot. I need those papers. Do you get them for me or do I phone somebody else? I could change my mind. Here's $100. There's 900 more when the stuff's in my hands. You had me fooled there. You don't dress to fit this kind of dough. So I save my money. Are you going or not? Give me the keys. Lots of luck, Novak. Hey, hey, Novak, wait a minute. About that horse. Go I... get a glass of water and drown yourself. Oh. It looked like a cinch. I flagged the cab up to the place on Knob Hill. It turned out to be one of those society page joints, all glass, brick, and snobby storming. Getting up to Burke's floor was as easy as walking up six flights of back stairs. The hall was empty and the key fitted. It was all so easy I began to get nervous. And you would too if you walked in on her that way. She was a toy-sized brunette with a perfect kind of face that could mean anything from nice people to quick death. She was smooth and beautiful. I you could say that about a whirlpool. If my breaking in bothered her, you'd never guess it from looking. Oh, hello. Toss your hat on a chair. I've been working the wrong districts. I'm glad you're here. Why, for instance? Hmm, girl gets lonely in a place like this. A uh, Berkey's out, and I don't know when he'll get back. You forgot something there. Folks call me Blanche. What's your name, friend? Pat Novak. Uh, do you go with the lease? I'm, uh, in and out. Berkey doesn't like me to tell it, though, but everybody knows it, so, uh, what kind of a secret's that? Didn't I surprise you when I walked in like that? Mm-mm. Berkey has a lot of friends. They come and go. I'm used to it. For a bookkeeper, Berkey does all right. He's uh, good at figures, don't you think? If he had my account, I'd be nervous. Hmm, don't you know? He just came into a lot of money. I'll bet that's a comfort to his clients. Oh, to me, too. Have a cigarette. There's some in the box there on the coffee table. Hmm. These are cigars. Oh? Oh, yeah, well, uh, I have some in my purse. Never mind. I'll settle for a drink. Okay. Well, let be. What do you got? Mm, that's kind of hard to say offhand. Uh, let's look in the kitchen and see. Mm-hmm. Hmm, it ought to be up here. But it isn't. I knew a girl that way once. <laughs> Berkey must have moved the bottles. Uh, look around. Uh, try those cabinets. Oh, I'll get there. Hey, wait a minute. Take it easy. What's the matter? Jumpy? Good evening, Miss... Is Mr. Novak in? Yeah, I'm in. You and your horse are both out. But Mr. Novak, it's a good horse. You always come and cry? Yeah, that's Pinky. He's been on my tail all night. Aren't you curious about why I'm here? Hmm. You must be a friend of Burke's. Would it matter? What do you mean? When you get tired of playing with those doors, let's admit you don't know where Burke keeps his booze. I... You don't know where he keeps his cigarettes. You don't know anything about the place because this is the first time you've been here. You're acting like a detective. Put it down, I'm just curious. And you can still fill in my question. Why not say I, uh, wandered into the wrong apartment? You don't seem anxious to get out. Maybe I like the company here. Come on in the living room. He probably has the liquor in there. That isn't what you were after. Why don't we settle for my being lonely? The town's full of lonely babes. None of them look like you. I know a cure. Do you? Let me guess. Well, I guess when you can be sure. Like this. Now I know. Fill me in on the rest of your visit. Huh. I'm busy. Or, uh, I could be. All right, let's close the post office. Did you get the papers? I could sulk. Men don't usually treat me that way. They'd live longer if they did. Look, baby. I'm not swinging any bats until I know who's pitching. Do you give with where you fit in, or do I have to bend it out of you? <laughs> you know, I think I get like you. 
A dame gets tired of men she can twist around her fingers. Yeah, sure. I'm fascinating. Give. Don't flex your muscles. I'll tell you. Denver Red sent me. You're sure it wasn't Pittsburgh Pete or Chicago Clark? Uh Uh-uh. He's real. If you aren't too particular about what you call a man. He owns a nightclub called the Knife and Fork out on Geary Street. Mm, Then what? Mm, He sent me to get some papers Burke has hidden around the place. A small envelope. Did you find it? Sure. Here it is. You want it? You give up easy. I don't have to do this sort of thing to get along. I told Red that. What else are you going to tell him? I'll tell him you took the papers away from me. Why, you got a better idea. Put on your flaps, sister. What if I didn't go back to him? What if I went with you? Uh-uh. I don't like your recommendations. Don't worry. I won't pretend I wouldn't drop you as soon as I found a better man. What do you want? Eternity? I haven't got time for that. All right, sucker. So, I'll go back to Red. He tears telephone books in half and things like that, so uh, watch him. I'll try to manage. Ah, here's the booze. Let's drink to something or other. Why not? You sure you won't change your mind about anything? Why don't you leave me your phone number? I got a better idea. Sucker. She timed it, but nice. I hardly started to get my hand up before she hit me with a bottle. The room began to spin, and I tried to stand up, but my knees gave way. I could hear her footsteps a long distance away, running, and the door closed. I shook my head, and some of the cobwebs went away, but not enough for me to get started. By the time they did, I knew it was too late. I looked around, and the package of papers was gone. Yeah, the more I thought of how easily I'd been done in by that dame, the matter I got... And I remembered no one was supposed to know about the papers except Lansom. Decided I'd better check on the play. I got on the phone and talked my way through a flock of bars until I ran down an alcoholic friend of mine named Jocko Madigan. He's an old-timer around San Francisco who knows more about the town than the city planning commission. He sounded good over the phone, which must have meant they were watering his drinks. Hutchie, my boy, how are you? Curious. I'm sitting in on a racket that's beginning to develop too many curves. You sound like you're in a Girl Scout camp. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, you nasty, immoral and Put down the horn for a minute. I want you to do me a favor. If I had a daughter and you were even in the neighborhood, I'd lock her in the cellar. I can't imagine what those Boy Scout leaders are thinking about. Well, they were Girl Scouts a minute ago. What did they do, pull a switch? Anyway, Boy Scouts don't camp, they hike. Look, I just got sapped by a dame who's told some papers. Uh, they, uh, up Mount Tam- Tamil Pius, they hike. That's Her name's Blanche. She's tied in with a guy named Denver Wren. He runs the Knife and Fork Club out on Geary. Oh, those poor kids. And that mountain's almost straight up, too. She man. just left here. She ought to be heading for Denver Red's place. What are the papers? I know you don't own them. You, you can't read. They have some stuff in them that'll put the heat on a guy named Jack Lansom. He likes it cool. A thousand dollars worth. Oh, uh, speaking of money, there's a friend of yours here. Hello, Patsy. This is Pinky. Imagine me talking to you on the telephone. Imagine I've gone deaf. Hey, Jocko, if you can hear this, pull that punk off the line. Okay, he's gone. He said he had a horse for you. Look, dummy up to that guy. He's been floating around all night. And I'd be floating, too, if you'd be nice to him. I'll grab a cab and go out to the Knife and Fork Club. When Blanche shows up, see if you can find out what she does with the papers. Are you buying the drinks and the cab fare? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are you going to do? I'm going back and see Lansom. This was supposed to be a closed deal, and will you hurry? The dame will be there and gone. Don't worry about me. You couldn't keep me away from the place. I'm growing wind. Yeah? Why the sudden lather? Well, if you're buying the drinks, there's no use my scrimping. I'm suddenly developing an awful longing for some good, well-aged scotch. So long, lover. <laughs> I ducked out of the place and started along the street looking for a cab. It was growing foggy and I couldn't see very well. In fact, I could see so little I didn't notice the car drive up. But I could hear the driver all right. All right, Bob, inside the car. You must not like arguments. Don't think it won't shoot either. Get in. You're Patsy Novak, ain't you? You can say Patsy twice. Don't sulk. I'm doing you a favor. Yeah, thanks for the ride. I'm Reynolds. Gong Reynolds. Ever hear of me? Yeah. You sell pipe dreams. 
If you know that much, you know that shoveling the snow ain't no job for a preacher. So you're tough. Then what? And you give me Burke's little envelope. What is this, a mass meeting? You pass it over, or do we have to go out in the country and get it twisted out of you? You're wrong twice. I haven't got it. You must think I'm fooling. Someone beat me to it. Who, Murphy? Murphy. Yeah, the bookie. Did he get it? A dame. She said she was working for Denver Red. Out of the knife and fork? Yeah, that sounds all right. Hey, what's up? The... You don't know? Uh-uh. I was hired to pick it up. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I believe that. Take it or leave it, but let me out of here. Don't get nervous. Wait till we hit a quiet street. I'm broad-minded. Let me off anywhere. I said a quiet street. Before you go, I'm going to search you. How do I know you ain't lying? I'm beginning to wonder myself. (laughs) Reynolds was a nice guy for an opium peddler. No bumps, no scars. Even dropped me near a car line. Pretty soon I began to breathe regularly again and headed back to the place on Webster Street. The house was dark except for a light in one of the upstairs windows. Just as I was leaning on the bell, I hear someone coming up the steps behind me. I wish you'd stay put, Mr. Novak. Now about that horse. He's a beautiful animal. Affectionate. Look, I'm tired of this shadow act. What's your pitch? Straight over the plate, Novak. I'm doing you a favor. Someday I may need one from you. I'm far-sighted. Well, I'm near-sighted. Come here. Hey, hey, hey. Light up and be somebody. What's your ragged? Oh, put me down, Novak. I, I got connections. You, you, you can't scare me. Yeah, I can try. Going in for kidnapping midgets, Novak? Put him down and come on in. I don't want to draw a crowd. Make this the last time I see you, Pinky, or I'll fix it so you wish you had. Who was that? I don't know. I'm beginning to get curious. Forget it. You got the envelope? No. Don't sound so cheerful. Why not? Somebody changed my mind. Too much competition. Keep it understandable. What do you mean? Every tough monkey in town is after those papers, and Denver Red has the inside track. Who else? Tell me about the others. Why didn't you tell me? I didn't know about them. Uh, I know how you feel. I didn't know a lot of things either, but I'm beginning to learn. Start talking. Burke used to keep books for a lot of guys around town. That's where he really got his money, covering up the racket profits from the revenue boys. Don't stop there. That's all I know. That's not enough. All right, all right. I don't know... But I can guess. Burke must have photostats of some of the records and use them to blackmail the gangsters. So it's a free-for-all with me in the middle. I didn't know about it. Honest, I didn't. You didn't know, but I get slapped, sapped, and held up. Good for me. You say Denver Red got the papers? And he can have them. I'm bowing out. Your hundred dollars is nothing, don't you see? Get the papers and we'll both be rich. Richer than anyone in town. No dice. You want them, you get them. I'll give you... I'll give you five thousand dollars. How much down? Here's the rest of the thousand I promised you. Is that fair? Fair enough. We're going to be rich, you hear? Rich. Yeah. The richest men in the cemetery. Lansom must have thought I was the biggest sucker in the city. I was through with the papers as soon as I discovered how hot they were. I could have told him, but when I saw how anxious he was, I figured I might as well use his shakes to get the rest of the thousand dollars. I headed out to the knife and fork, but my only plan was to get Jocko off the hook. After that, I wanted a lot of time in the country until things cooled off. The joint was out near Golden Gate Park, one of those community center places where you get everything that'll go in a stomach, including bicarbonate. The brunette doll was nowhere in sight, but I saw Jocko over at the bar wrestling with a double-sized highball, eased over beside him. Well, if it isn't the Boy Scout, Patsy Novak. That stuff's beginning to eat into your head, Jocko. Don't you worry. My lobes are functioning smooth as ice in a glass. What can I do for you uh, after you pay the bill? Did the Dame Blanche show up here? Yeah, about a half hour ago. What kept you? She's pretty. Uh, So's a tiger. Where is he? She and your friend Denver Red went upstairs. He has an apartment up there. Now, that's the way to live. If he bored a hole in the floor and ran a pipe down to the bar... Did you see the papers? No, and do you know a guy named Reynolds, Gong Reynolds? We've met. He was in here. He looked around and ducked out. Did he go upstairs? I don't know. You're running in big company. Reynolds and Denver Red are two of the most powerful gangsters in town. If they've got anything to do with this, you better cash in your chips and get out of the game. Yeah, don't worry. I'm all washed up with this. I heard something else, too. This guy, Lanson, is no country boy, either. Measure him for me. The grapevine has it. He used to be a member of Murder Incorporated, the Brooklyn outfit. He got out before they grew into big-time operators. Three of a kind. What do you know about Murphy? 
Don't tell me Murphy's in on this. Murphy's got the horse wires sewed up. He sewed it up with bullets. Let's get out of here. Yeah, I will in a minute. How do you get to Denver Red Shack? The entrance is outside, but what do you care? Let's get out of here. In a minute. Patsy, they're hotter than summer in Panama. Leave them alone. I'd kind of like to see that envelope. Try the post office. It's full of envelopes. Yeah, not this one. You coming with me? No, Patsy. If you've lost your mind, you've lost it alone. I'm beginning to wonder about that. Well, so long, lover. I worked out of the place without causing any fuss. Eased into the apartment entrance. The place was quiet. It was so quiet you could hear me breathing as I worked my way up the stairs. There was a carpet in the halls, but even then I was careful. I listened at the door, and there wasn't a sound inside. After a while, I tried the knob. The door opened. With the fog outside, you could barely make out anything in the place. Something told me to back out and forget it. There was something I wanted to know. I held my breath and listened. All I could hear was the jukebox faintly from the cafe below. And I felt for the light switch. Don't move. You're covered. What are you waiting for, Helman? The payoff? You, baby. Keep your hands up. Where's the gun? I ate it. I guess it wasn't much good at that. You didn't have any bullets left. You counted them? I counted the bullets in the body. Six bullets, one load. Who got it? Or do I have to guess? Denver Red and his dame. Name's Blanche. Know her? Yeah, I know her. She used to row stroke oar in my lifeboat. She looks the type. Do you want to tell me about it, or do we go downtown first? I didn't kill him, Helen. Who made those holes in him? Termites? If they did, you better keep your hat on. They might get hungry again. You got all the brains, Novak. You better shake them up. You're going to need them. You ought to get a refund on that crystal ball, Helen. That's not a bad idea. Or maybe I can swap it for a television set. I'd like to see you on those San Quentin broadcasts. You saw me come in, you fathead. You can't pin this one on me. It's pin, Novak, but good. In fact, it's a hat pin. Try making sense. Try making this not fit your head. This is my hat. Now all you got to do is get rid of the five people who saw you wearing it earlier this evening at the boarding house. And you're clear. We were halfway down to the Hall of Justice before I could talk Hellman into giving me another chance. Murphy was really the one who sensed it. I picked him up by phone at one of his bookie joints with Hellman listening in on an extension. Yeah, it was short and sweet. Novak? Yeah, I've heard the name. What's itching you? This may not be my business, but I got a good reason for wanting to know. Spread it out, Novak. I got work to do. Did you get a phone call tonight about an envelope with some photostatic copies of a bunch of records? What's it to you, Novak? Uh, you did then. Yeah, some nut, I guess. Didn't give his name. Town's full of them these days. He wouldn't be a nut if Burke had something on you. Hey, what is this? Burke's got nothing on me. I pay my taxes. What is this, Novak? Some new form of shakedown? Yeah, Murphy. But you're not up the tree. Thanks a lot. Yeah, it could fit. I get a chance to prove it? I can't let you go, Novak. But what if I should bend over for a minute to pick up this pencil and the door open and all? Try it and see, Helmer. Just once. <laughs> After that, I began to figure my bad luck had run out for the day. I jumped a cab and went down to the waterfront, but not to my pier. There was a guy at Pier 23 who was a friend of mine. He had a gun and a rowboat, and I borrowed both of them. I pushed off without being too careful, because between the wind and the cross chop, nobody was going to be hearing anything. Even with everything on my side, it was a long, hard row. When I hit the bottom of the ladder at the end of Pier 19, I had to sit in the boat to let my heart slow down. It was blacker the inside of Hellman's dress shoes. I took my time edging down the pier. I was just about to slide into my boathouse when I tripped the booby trap. I did a Brody, and somewhere along the line, I lost my gun, which put me even up with Lawson. He turned on the lights. Novak, you have to sneak up in your own office. You ought to pay the rent regular. I see the gags. You fix up this welcome? I was all alone and didn't like the idea of being caught from behind. Uh, what would you do about a frontal attack? I've got this gun. But since it's only you, I don't have to worry. I wouldn't say that. I think you've got all kinds of worries. Everybody has got something. And you've got Reynolds. Where is he? Take it easy. I just saw him earlier tonight and he mentioned your name. Let's keep that for the society column. I'll take the envelope. 
I didn't get it for the simple reason that there isn't any envelope. That fall on the head make it soft? You told me you saw it. Nothing important. Just some regular business letters. Nothing to stand up in court. I still don't understand this. You don't make sense. And I don't make dough either. I don't have the envelope. Or do you want to search me? I'm not getting that close to you. You've gone off on some tangent that I don't understand. So we'll just sit and wait till you get ready. Or until Reynolds gets here. That's supposed to scare me? Look at it this way. You don't mind if I talk? I can listen. No, you sit there. With your back to the door. That's right. Now I'll just warm the place up by closing the door. Now, you were saying? Suppose that the envelope was a phony. After I am on my way, you call up all the big-time hoods in town and tip them off. Now tell me why. The boys start pouring out of the woodwork to give me the business. The ones who chase me are the boys on Burke's list. Then you could pick up where he left off. I'm not boring you, am I? Not at all. Go on. Everything was as cozy as an upper berth until Denver Red gets his girl into Burke's place before I make it. You're everything but consistent. Now you'll be trying to tag me with the stiffs down at the knife and fork. Thanks for the cue. You knew that if Denver Red spotted the envelope for a phony, the news would be all over town and your racket would be kaput, so you killed him. Nice figuring. You should have been a bookkeeper, too. You even told me to come down here so you could kill me if that planted hat didn't frame for the cops. I hate to disappoint you. So, since you know everything else, you might as well know the caliber of this gun. See? I've looked into things like that before. Everything has to end sometimes, so... Don't touch that phone. I ordered that call, just in case. I said don't touch it. You'll be hearing worse bells than that if you don't let me answer it. Okay, but watch your language. Novak speaking. For a minute I thought you was out. You're the hardest man to get hold of. But I guess it's because you're a busy guy. Well, say something. That's right, Reynolds. Huh? This is Pinky, Mr. Novak, remember? Pinky Punk. What a name. That's up to you, Reynolds. What's he saying? You want to talk to him? You still am, Mr. Novak? I'm Mr. Novak. Give me that phone. Now, look, Reynolds. I'm not taking any talk off you. You'll pay up or else... You dropped something, Mr. Novak? Yeah. How about that horse? You want to get out of him? I think I can toss a sawbuck into his feed bag. Oh, gee, Mr. Novak, you'll never regret it. Okay, Pinky. Who's the goat? Pinky, I said, what's his name? Gee, Mr. Novak. <laughs> what do you know? I forgot. <laughs> Pinky might have forgotten, but Lansom's memory was good. I handcuffed him to the chair and told him Reynolds would be down in a half an hour. Then gave him Hellman's phone number. He confessed to everything after sitting alone in my office for a while. I know how he felt. When the feds got the news, they moved in with a fine tooth comb, but they never did turn up anything. Nobody ever did. I'm pretty sure of that. But now and then I get the idea maybe I'm wrong. So I start nosing around for those papers. I never find the things. I usually find Reynolds instead. He's beginning to get gray. Who killed the bookkeeper? That was a landlady. Yeah. Hellman got her a room, too. Heard on tonight's presentation were Ben Morris as Novak, John Galbraith as Inspector Hellman, Jack Lewis as Jocko, and Mary Milford as Blanche, with Herb Ellis, Jerry Zinneman, Kurt Martell, and Dick Ellers. Special music by Otto Clare. Listen again next week at this same time when over most of these stations, the American Broadcasting Company presents Pat Novak for Hire. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. W. Fitch Company presents Dick Powell as Private Detective Richard Rogue. In Rogue's Gallery.
Fogg speaking. Well, tonight we meet a sort of an unusual girl. Her name is Muriel, and she's quite a personality. The name of the story is Murder with Muriel. But before we get into our story, here's Jim Doyle, the man from the Fitch Company. Are you looking for a smooth shave, men? Then try Fitch's No Brush Shaving Cream. It'll give you the kind of shave you want because 40 years of experience have gone into the making of this product. Fitch's No Brush contains a special skin conditioner ingredient that takes the work out of shaving. You won't have to struggle and scrape against stubborn whiskers because the skin conditioner prepares your face beforehand. It holds the whiskers up so your razor can zip them down closely and quickly. Even against the grain of a tough beard, your razor will glide swiftly, never nicking or scraping. Pitches No Brush is a boon to sensitive faces because it lubricates gently, keeping that tender skin from being irritated. After this quick, easy shave, your skin will feel cool and refreshed, wonderfully smooth. And if you prefer a lather cream, try Fitch's Brush Cream. It forms a rich, abundant lather when applied with a brush. This lather stays moist all during the shave. Fitch's Brush Cream also contains the special skin conditioner for sensitive faces. Fitch's Brush and Fitch's No Brush Shaving Cream are available in handy 25 and 50 cent sizes. For a shave you like, switch to Fitch. Thank you, Jim. Now I'd like to tell my story. Okay, here's Dick Powell as Private Detective Richard Rogue in another personally conducted tour through... Rogue's Gallery. I was sitting at my junior executive type desk one day a few months ago, trying to get a studious gander at the racing form for the next day. I had planned to attend and contribute a quick 48 bucks outside to the improvement of the breed of thoroughbreds racing at the track. 48 bucks, that's uh, six across the board, eight races, six eights. That's right, uh, 48. Well, anyway, I was working on a case for an insurance company... And they had assigned a big company detective with his brains at his feet to help me. His real job was to watch me. And he did. His girl was mad at him, and he spent all his time writing torchy poetry to her. I didn't mind that. But the big goon read it to me. That made it personal. Hey, listen to this one, will you, Rogi? Oh, no, I'm busy. Can't you see, Joe? <laughs> this will put her in her place. Listen. Gee, Cupid stupid. His dart in my heart I trusted. Now, my heart's busted. He sent me an Aphrodite, who's awful flighty. Don't trust Cupid. He's stupid. <laughs> That's a deli, ain't it? I- I'm going to send it to Rose special delivery. Mm. That ought to bring her right back to you with a club in her hand. Why don't you give the dame up, Joe? Oh, you don't understand, Rogie. I love her. Oh. I'm looking for Richard Rogue. Yeah? What do you want? I've got a message for you. I want to talk to you. Uh, privately. Okay, okay. Come on in here. Look, I'm a busy guy today. What do you want? What's your name? I'm Joe Layton. Have you had a letter from Duke Dickerson? No. Nope. You know him, don't you? Well enough to lend him money. That answer your question? Well, he needs some dough. Tough. He still owes me. He's got some stashed in a tin box out in the valley. He wants it. He wants us to get it for him. Go on. He's planted the dough out in the valley. Yeah? Get to the point. Well, uh, he's mailed half of a map to me and the other half to you. A map showing just where the dough is buried. We're to go get it together. I get the 2500 he owes me, and you get the 100 he owes you, plus 1000 for the job. And Duke gets the rest. Okay. Mm-hmm. Sure, sure. I'll take a drive out into the valley for 1,100 skins any time. But I haven't got the map yet. Well, he mailed it day before yesterday. It should be here. Well, it isn't. Drop around about noon tomorrow. Maybe it'll come in the morning mail. The Duke needs the dough pretty bad. He's got himself in a bit of a jam in Kansas City. We'll get that dough tomorrow, huh? There's something about money I like. I think maybe it's the feeling of power it gives me when the rent is paid. 
Anyway, this, uh, this spook shoved off, and I went back into the outer office where Joe Black was poisoned, penning some more poetry. The phone rang, and I thought twice before I answered it. It was almost six o'clock, and I had plans for that evening. But I finally gave in to its yammering. Rogue Detectives, Richard Rogue speaking. Hello, Mr. Rogue. I must see you right away. Hmm, sorry. It's a matter of life and death, Mr. Rogue. I'm afraid. What's the matter? What's your name? Muriel Scott. Please, come to the Rialto Theater. I can't be seen talking to you. I'm in the aisle seat, center aisle, three rows down from the rear of the theater, on the right-hand side of the center aisle. The seat next to mine is vacant. Please meet me there as soon as possible. Please, hurry. Okay, wait there. Who was that, Rogie? Oh, now, look, Blackie, it was private business. Why don't you run along home now and get some rest? Oh, no, the boss told me to stick with you, and that's what I'm going to do. You're tricky, you know. We don't trust you. Oh, look, I... Oh, hello. What are you doing here, Urban? Just dropped in to ask you a few questions, Rogue. Good evening, Lieutenant Urban. Hello, Blackie. Go wait in the hall. I want to talk with Rogue. Yes, sir. Oh, now, what's on your mind? You know a guy by the name of Layton? Joe Layton? Hmm. That name sounds familiar. Why? He just left here, didn't he? Well, he's been here. What's that to you? What do you want to see you about? Well, I don't see how that could possibly affect you, old man. He came to see me on private business. That's all the talking I'm going to do. How'd you know he was here, anyway? I just took a card off him. He had your name and address on it. What did he want to see you about, Rogue? He didn't mention your name. How come you'd be shaking Joe Layton down? Is he pinched? No, no, he isn't in any trouble with the police, Rogie. I picked him up about a block from here a while ago. He'd been robbed and murdered. Well, this was a fine time for Joe Layton to get dead. Just when he meant 1100 bucks to me. I went down to the morgue with Urban to look at the body. What I really went for was a quick look through his personal effects. There was no sign of half a map. That's all I wanted to know. Urban put me on the fire for a while, trying to get me to tell him all I knew about Layton, but I didn't crack, and I left about 10.30 to drive back to my office. My shadow Blackie was right behind me. When I walked into the office, the phone was ringing. Rogue Detectives, Richard Rogue speaking. Mr. Rogue, you didn't come to the theater. Oh, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, Muriel. Something else came up that demanded my immediate attention. But I must see you right away. It's a matter of life or death. Uh, But I can't. There's, There's a $500 fee waiting here for you for just a few minutes' work. Please, Mr. Rogue. Huh? Oh, where are you? I'm at the Shady Glade Motel out in the valley. You know where it is? Oh, sure, sure. I've passed it a thousand times. Will you come right out? Please. Cabin number four. Uh... You say there's $500 waiting there for me? You got it there? Yes. Please hurry. I'm frightened to death. Well, I just had 1,100 skin shot out from under me. And I decided I couldn't afford to be too temperamental about a sure 500. So I ran down the stairs to my car and took off for the Shady Glade Motel... And the lady with the seductive voice. It was a long drive from my office, and I spent my time trying to figure out how I was going to get in touch with Duke Dickinson and deal myself back in on that buried treasure deal. I couldn't tell whether Blackie had managed to tail me on this trip or not. There was so much traffic on the pass. Well, uh, anyway, I pulled up at the Shady Glade and knocked at the door of cabin number four. You're Mr. Rogue? Yeah. Come in. Well, uh, get it off your chest, lady. Please, sit down. Okay, but uh, I'm in a kind of a hurry. Let's make this as brief as possible. All right. Would you care for a drink? Well, I'd love one. But look, you were tearing your hair out a half hour ago. I got here as soon as I could by breaking a few speed laws. Now, before we get social, what's the deal? I'm in trouble, Mr. Rogue. I'll take it from here, Muriel. Huh? Oh, oh a reception committee with artillery, huh? Well, how about giving me a quick rundown on what's the deal? What do you want from me? You know a man by the name of Joe Layton? Yeah, I knew him. And I know what happened to him. You wouldn't want it to happen to you, would you? I don't insist on it. Get out of here, Muriel. I'll stay. Get into the other room. Go on. All right, Chef. 
All right, now, Rogue. Let's get down to business. You had company today, didn't you? Leighton was up to see you. That's right. Everybody seems to know that. What do you mean? Well, the cops came to see me later. Took me down for a little questioning. You see, they knew Leighton called on me, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When you shook him down for that map, you should have taken that card with my name and address off of him. And he can't think of everything. I want your half of that map, Rogue. I don't have it. Don't lie to me, Rogue. Just give me your half of the map. I don't have it. But even if I did, name me a reason why I should give it to you. Where is it? I don't have it. That's all I know. I'll give you $5,000 for it, Rogue. Huh? <laughs> why should I sell it to you? I had to kill a man for half that map. I don't want to have to kill you unless it's absolutely necessary, Rogue. Believe me, I hope it won't come to that. Now, look, pretty boy. I don't have the letter, and killing me or keeping me here won't make you much of a score. Where is the letter? Why should I tell you? Ah, let's face it, chum. There's is it no... in your office? I haven't received it yet. It'll probably be in the morning's mail tomorrow. This is not getting anybody someplace. I'll do the worrying about that. Yeah? Well, while you're worrying, take a look behind you. You got company. Oh, no, no. I'm surprised that you try to run that old bluff like that on me. <laughs> you think it's a bluff? Hey, Blackie. Drop that gun, mister. I couldn't miss you from here. You better drop it, pretty boy. My friend Joe Black is a very nervous type. Yeah. Drop it. Okay. Now, well, that's a nice guy. Look, Blackie, I'll hold a gun on this citizen. There's a girl in the bedroom. Go get her. All right, Rogie. What are you going to do with me, Rogue? I haven't made any plans yet. You'll be taken care of. Don't worry. Why don't we keep this to ourselves, Rogue? There's play. Hey, Rogue, there's no dame in here. What? The window's open and she's gone. I, I heard a car pull away just as I came in here. Oh, that's fine. That's great. Well, well, it isn't my fault, Rogie. I, I did what you told me to and... You, you got away, huh? That's right. She got away. But we've still got the main attraction. That's you. Look, Rogue, there's no reason why we can't make a deal. I'm perfectly willing to cut you in for half the money. <laughs> How big of you. You have to watch those generous impulses, Shep. Next thing you know, you'll be giving away the sleeves out of your vest. Hey, Blackie. Uh, yeah? You just declared yourself in on five bills, okay? Sure. What do I do? Shake him down. I want half of a hand-drawn map. There's no point in us working against each other, Rogue. Shut up. Yeah. I'll get it for you. Keep your hands away from your pockets. Yeah, just keep them up in the air, and I won't have to break your thick skull. Uh, toss me his wallet, Blackie. Uh, Quit squirming, you. Uh, yeah. uh, there you are, Rogie. And a nice wallet it is, too. Uh, uh, maybe you'll let me have it, huh, Rogie? Uh, after you've taken a map out, of course. <laughs> oh, that's what I love about you, Blackie. You have such big ideas. Ah, well, quite a bit of dough here. And the driver's license. Glad to see that you're a law-abiding citizen, Chef. Oh, now, here it is. A little piece of paper worth 25 grand. Now, look, Rogue. Suppose I work with you. Just cut me in for five grand. A little late for that, Shep. Blackie. Yeah? I'm afraid our friend Shep might be a burden. Uh, you'd better put him to sleep for a while. Uh, you mean like this? Oh. You're so enthusiastic, Blackie. Now let's get him tied up and slip him under a bed until we need him again, shall we? Of course. Uh, hey, uh, hadn't we better call in the cops, Rogie? Well, I didn't want the cops in on this deal yet. They get so inquisitive about murderers. I knew that Shep was as safe as a royal flush against three deuces. So I left him there all tied up like a bow tie. I gave Blackie the slip and went to my apartment to get a little sleep. I opened the door and walked in... into a surprise party. Hello, Rogie. Where you been? What are you doing in my apartment, Urban? Waiting for you to get home. You got a warrant? Oh, now, Rogie, are we going to get technical? What do you want? You decided to tell me what you know about the killing of uh, Joe Layton? No. You might be making a mistake, Rogue. You know, sometimes you need a guy like me. What are you working on? I don't report to you, Urban. Go away. I've known you for a long time, Rogie. You're declaring yourself in on Layton's murder. I don't think you did it, but uh, I think you know more than you're talking. Now, look, I've got a stake in this case. If I crack it, I'll let you know in time to get your picture in the papers. Will you settle for that? You're on the level, aren't you, Rogie? Well, you know I am. 
I've worked with you this way before, haven't I? Have I ever given you a bump pitch? No. Good night, Lieutenant. Good night, Richard. If you have any ideas of slipping me a double cross, Rogie, forget it. I've got a cell waiting for you, and I'm not above framing you. Remember that. I knew Urban wasn't kidding. And I had an impulse to call him back and tell him about the murder I had put away for him in that motel. But I thought better of it. As the door closed behind Urban, I heard another door open behind me. Hello, Mr. Rogue. Muriel. Why, honey, this is... Put up your hands. I'm going to get that map if I have to kill you. We'll return to our story in just a moment. But first, I'd like to tell you that glamorous women the country over are using Fitch's saponified shampoo for greater hair beauty. Here's what lovely Bess Meyerson, recently awarded the title of Miss America of 1945, told us in an interview. A long time ago, I discovered that part of being beautiful was being clean. So I keep my hair clean by shampooing it as often as I feel it needs it. I use Fitch's saponified shampoo because it does not dry my hair or make it difficult to manage, no matter how often I shampoo it. Yes, beautiful women everywhere use Fitch's saponified shampoo. It does not dry the hair because it's made from mild vegetable and coconut oils. Even in hard water, it gives lots of rich, fragrant lather. It cleanses efficiently and gently. And here's a feature all women will cheer. Fitch's saponified shampoo contains its own patented rinsing agent. This rinsing agent works with the plain rinse water to make your hair sparkling clean. No particles are left to dim the luster and highlights of the hair. Best of all, you won't need to bother with a special after-rinse. Give your hair a treat. Use Fitch's saponified shampoo. You can get a professional application at your beauty or barber shop, or ask for an economical bottle at your drug counter. Richard Rogue is involved in an affair concerning $25,000 in buried treasure. There's a girl in the affair named Muriel Scott, and right this minute, the lovely Muriel is an uninvited guest in Rogue's apartment, where she's holding Rogue at the end of a 45 automatic. I love girls, especially girls with Muriel's gifts. She had the kind of a figure that you'd like to add to your income tax. And a little baby face that made me want to hold her on my lap and tell her a story. But that gun changed everything. It ruined the intimate romantic atmosphere that I would have preferred. Take your revolver out of the holster and drop it. Come on, I know how to use this gun. Okay, okay. Now back away from it. You know, uh, I have a strange feeling that you've lived through this before. I have. Keep backing. Okay. Mm. Now what? Sit down. Thanks. How'd you get in here? Through the window, the one in the fire escape. <coughs> now, what time is the first mail delivery at your office in the morning? Oh, it's about 9.30. I heard you tell Shep that the map would be there in that mail. I'm expecting it. Good. I'll get it then. What did you do with Shep? Well, he's okay. Is he in jail? No, he isn't. I want my hands on that dough before I yell for the cops. Uh-huh. I want my hands on that dough, too, and I'm going to get them there. Are you, uh, comfortable? Yeah, don't worry about me. Look, baby, I I want some coffee. How about you? Just stay where you are. Oh, but look, beautiful, it's only 11.30. It's 10 hours before the mail arrives. I can stay awake 10 hours at $2,500 an hour. Easy. Mm -hmm. Ah, It's too bad you're so hard to get along with. You're a very beautiful dame, you know it? Yeah, I know it. Just keep your seat, Mr. Rogue. I don't know whether you're going to like coffee the way I make it or not, Muriel. It'll be all right. Are you sure you don't want me to hold the gun while you make the coffee? Go ahead, make the coffee and stop talking. Uh, okay, okay, beautiful. Yeah, but you'd better, better listen to my proposition. Ah, we could do a lot together with 25 grand. Ever been to Rio? More toast? Thanks, Richie. You know, you make pretty good coffee. And you make pretty good toast, Angel. Lots of butter. 
And you know that costs points? We won't need them in Rio, will we? No. <laughs> ah, we're going to make beautiful music together, baby. You know it? How did you ever get mixed up in a deal like this, anyway? Oh, he came through Pittsburgh. Mm, I know the town well. He spent a lot of money on me, and I thought I was living. Ah, you're too nice a girl to go around pointing guns at people. What did you do with that cannon, anyway? I left it on the kitchen table. Oh. <laughs> you comfortable? Uh-huh. A few more hours and we can go pick up that money, huh, baby? Yeah. Twenty-five grand. You know something, honey? What? I can just barely remember Shep. That's nine o'clock, honey. Let's get going, shall we? Oh, uh-huh. we'll just about make it, huh? Yeah. Hmm? Well, I hope that map's in the morning mail, don't you? Well, it will be, don't worry. Come on, I'll help you with your coat. Mm-hmm. Hey, where'd you get it? It's a nice mink. Shep stole it for me. He was a petty larceny guy, wasn't he? Ah, let's not think about him, Angel. Come on. We we're on our way to the office in that letter. And Rio? Could be. here. Now, you stay in the car. I don't know whether there'll be any cops up there or not. And if I'm not back in five minutes, shove off. And I'll meet you in the lobby of the Hotel Bellevue in an hour. Oh? You're not going to take me to the office with you? No. Then leave me the half of the map you took from ship. I want to know you're coming back. Oh, sure. Sure, baby. Yeah, here you are. Now, are you happy? Yes. I'm happy. Hurry, though, will you? I'll be back in a minute, beautiful. If I'm not, remember what I told you to do, huh? I'll be in the lobby of the Bellevue if you aren't back in five minutes, right? If that letter was in my office, I had this case whipped like Simon Legree had Uncle Tom. Then my wishbone was in my throat as I rode up to my office. The elevator had always seemed slow, but this morning it seemed to be going backwards. With just a few more breaks now, I'd be back at home, home base like the third fleet. I walked into the office, and there sat my shadow, Joe Black. I pitched him some fast double talk about ditching him last night, ran through the mail, found the letter from Duke Dickinson with a map. While I was jumping up and down and clapping my hands, I told Blackie what I wanted him to do. And then Muriel and I took off for the treasure hunt with a spade. Are you sure this is the right path? Sure. I've got the map right here, haven't I? Look, uh, look up ahead. There's the big rock he's got on. See? Uh-huh. And uh, there's the tree. Look, Roby. Oh, the gun. You put it back. Do you have any plans about taking this money yourself? Oh, will you cut it out? Put that I rock back in I just want you to know I've still got it and I can oh. use it. Oh, but look, baby. Remember me. Oh, I suppose I'm a chump. I'll put the gun away. Just for you. You big, handsome cutthroat. <laughs> Well, I paced off the location of that hidden treasure, just like it said on the map. Feeling a little like Captain John Silver as I did it. And then I exposed my poor, aching back to the unaccustomed labor of making a hole in the ground with a spade. I will never be a fan of digging. I like my spades five at a time. Preferably running from the ace down to the ten with a lot of dough in the middle of the table instead of in the middle of the pasture. But I dug. Are you sure you're digging in the right place? Sure. Decided in on that tree and that big rock. And if that petty licensee crook of a Duke Dickerson thinks this is funny, I'll personally hit. Hey. Hey, hey, pay dirt. Hear it? Yes. Hurry, Rogie. Dig it out. Well, you want this shovel? I'm digging as fast as I can. There it is. I see the top of it. Be there. Be there. 25,000. Well, baby, there it is. 25 grand. You want to count it? Let me have it, Rogie. Here, baby, you, you take care of it for a while, huh? Put it in your bag and let's get back to town and celebrate, beautiful. All right. Just hold that pose. Both of you, hold it. Hey, hey, what is this? Shut up. Give me your bag, lady. 
Come on, lady. I don't want to have to shoot any holes in that pretty dress you're wearing. Come on, give me that bag. No, I won't. <laughs> Next time I slap you with this rod. Now, give me that bag. Get your hands away from that coat there, mister. Thanks. Now, march. You look familiar to me, tough stuff. Yeah? Maybe I'd better put you away, huh? Hmm. Duke Dickinson must have sent out a bullet into all his friends. Shut up. Lay down on your faces, both of you. Now. <laughs> Shut up, lady. I just shot a couple of holes in your tires, that's all. Now, just take it easy and don't move until I'm out of here. Thanks for the dough. <laughs> Come out in the office, baby. Now, buck up and stop crying. I don't suppose you're going to pay any attention to me now that the money's gone. You'll probably forget me as soon as you can. Oh, baby. Oh, hi, Urban. Hello, Rogue. Who's this? A cop. What's he doing here? He's here after you, baby. Oh, oh Richard. He wouldn't turn me into the... Hate to interrupt, but... Uh... What's the score, Rogue? Uh, this little girl helped to kill Joe Layton. The guy who worked with her is under the bed at cabin number four at the Shady Glade Motel. How could you do this to me? After all the things you said and... and... It's... Well, it's... It's uh, not easy. But you see, baby, I don't approve of murder. Especially not in this neighborhood. Gives a block a bad name. Oh, no. No, Richard. Better take her away, Urban, no. before I take her away from you. <laughs> She's a beautiful oh, girl, isn't she? Richard. Oh, Richard. Richard. Well, that's the story. Of course, you recognize my old friend Joe Black as a hold-up man. You see, I figured that when Muriel and Shep went on trial, I would have less explaining to do if they thought some stranger had finally come up with the 25 grand. I gave Joe his 500 like I said I would. He beefed a little, but he took it. And then I took the hundred Duke owed me and a thousand for the job that was agreed on. And then I took the 2,500 that Joe Layton was supposed to get and sent it to Muriel's mother. Layton didn't have any use for it in the morgue. And I sent the rest to Duke in Kansas City. Made a nice score altogether, but oh, I still wake up in the middle of the night when I dream of Rio and Muriel. And that trip we were going to take. The money spent... But the dreams linger on. They're wonderful. This is Dick Powell again, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you noticed that I didn't get hit on the head in tonight's story. It was nice for a change. I hope you like the yarn. Ray Buffum wrote it. Lee Stevens composed and conducted the music. And D. Engelbach produced and directed. I want to remind you to make a date with us the next Thursday night. We're going to get mixed up in a... Strange affair about a photograph. We call it photo finish. Be on hand for the developing, will you? Thanks for listening and good night, all. Now, here's Jim Doyle. Don't forget to tune in again next Thursday, same time, same station, when you'll again hear Dick Powell as Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Remember, if dandruff is your problem, ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo. Removes dandruff the first time it is used. Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo is the only shampoo whose guarantee to remove dandruff is backed by one of the world's largest insurance companies. This statement can be made by no other shampoo. Ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo at your drug counter, barber, or beauty shop. Fitch is spelled F-I-T-C-H. Hello? Yes, this is the Falcon speaking. Oh, Lois. I'm glad you called. You'll have to include me out tonight, Angel. I've sort of got a date with a blonde. What do I mean, sort of? Well, I'm not sure of her. You see, this gal likes to leave her man hanging. The Adventures of the Falcon, starring Les Damon. You met the Falcon first in his best-selling novels. Then you saw him in his thrilling motion picture series. Now join him on the air when the Falcon solves... 
The case of the double exposure. It is early Sunday evening in New York, and a black chauffeur-driven sedan tears along one of the more deserted roads of the Bronx. In the back seat, a gentleman relaxes. His name is James Arcaro. Mr. Arcaro is a man who knows his way around, but at the moment he has begun to have his doubts. Say, Ralph, wasn't that Marshal of Parkway? I guess it was, Mr. Arcaro. Well, what are we doing here? I told you I wanted to go to Eileen Chambers' place. I must have misunderstood you. Wait a minute. You're not Ralph? No. Where is he? Let's just say he was indisposed, so he sent me in his place. Stop the car. Anything you say, Mr. Arcaro. What do you think you're doing? I'm going to open the door for you. What for? I'm not getting out. I got 500 bucks and a gun that says you're wrong. What's the idea? Ah, uh, you know. You're just trying to make conversation. All right, Arcaro, out of the car. Okay. Uh, tell me something, pal. Sure, but stay where you are and keep your hands at your side. C- can I smoke? Yeah, but never mind reaching in your coat pocket. You can have one of mine. Here. You spare a light? Why not? Happy now? (sighs) Yeah. I just wanted to get a look at you. I don't think it's going to do you much good, Mr. Akero. You never can tell. Your name's Ford, ain't it? Well, I'm flattered. I didn't think a big shot like you would know a peasant like me. Who are you working for? None of your business. You're one of Marvin Draper's boys, aren't you? Who? Marvin Draper. Ah, oh, come on, Ford. Admit it. What do you got to lose? You all through with that cigarette? Were you the boy who took care of my partner, too? I don't know what you're talking about. Eddie Hutton. They tell me six months ago he took a dive in the Hudson River. Forgot to come up. Now, how could that happen? Maybe because he was wearing a cement bathing suit. I wouldn't know, Mr. Akira. That's out of my line. Now, let's get this over with. Okay, Ford. But but I'd like to ask you uh, one other favor. What? Well, uh, maybe you hear I, I'm kind of proud of this face. So I, I wouldn't like you to mess it up. Uh, how about uh, giving it to me in the back of the head, huh? Oh, that's a reasonable request. I don't see why I can't accommodate you. Turn around. You ready? Wait a minute, Ford. Uh, can you uh, work a little closer? Why not? How's this? I, I can't see. I'm practically on top of you now. That's all I wanted to know. Let go, I said, let go. Go be nice to people. Who's there? Open up, Ford. It's the police. Ah, oh, sure. Just a second. Well, if it ain't Sergeant Corbett. Darned if it ain't. It's on your mind, Sergeant. Where were you at 9 o'clock tonight? Right here. Now, oh, that's interesting. Why do you suppose Jimmy Arcaro told us you were with him? What? You're a pretty careless fella. Next time you leave a man for dead, you better take a saliva test. What are you talking about? He was found by a prowl car 20 minutes after you left. You're lying. I pumped... Go on, Ford. What were you going to say? You pumped two slugs in him? Sure. But he didn't die instantly. He was obliging enough to stick around for that prowl car and give him your name before he kicked off. Who are you trying to kid? Don't believe me, huh? And how would I know that our car will put up a battle before you killed him? You're crazy. And you're careless. You should wear overalls when you're working. What's that spot doing on your pants? Huh? Where? Right near the cuff. Don't tell me it's lipstick. Come on, get wise to yourself, Ford. You're through. Your only chance is to play ball with us. No. I'm telling you, yes. Did Marv Draper put you up to this? Come on, Ford. Don't be a patsy. Why should Draper get away while you burn? Draper had nothing to do with it. Then who hired you? I don't know. You don't know. Now help me, Sergeant. It's the truth. When I got home last night, there was an envelope under my door with five bills in it and a note. What kind of a note? Said if I knocked off her care, it would be another 500 a night. Was there? No. Where's the original note? I tore it up. You're lying. Why should I? Listen, you punk. I want the truth. Who hired you to kill Jimmy or Carol? I tell you, I don't know. Well, until I find out, I'm going to make it so hot for you that when you sit in that seat at Sing Sing, you'll think you're squatting on an icebox. Now, let's go. Yes? I'm looking for Mike Waring. 
Who? Well, you know, the one they call the Falcon. Well, what's your name, Angel? Eileen Chambers. Uh, are you wearing? Yes, I'm afraid so. Come in. Uh, take off your coat. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Pardon? Uh, I was just thinking out loud. You wouldn't care for a drink? No. You sure? Positive. Uh, you sound like a girl who knows her own mind. I do. Yeah, I was afraid of that. Well, what can I do for you, Eileen? Eileen? Uh, an efficiency expert once told me that by calling women by their first name, during a year I might save as much as... Uh... Three seconds. Well, well, there's no telling. He thought it might be as much as five. <laughs> What's in your mind, Eileen? Uh, take a look at this. Certified copy of last will and testament of James Arcaro. Where'd you get this? From Mr. Arcaro's attorney. You benefit under the will? Read the last paragraph. Everything else I own, I leave to my good friend and partner, Eddie Hutton. However, in the event of Eddie Hutton's death before mine, then I desire my estate to go to my protege, Eileen Chambers. Mm, not bad. You like it? I'm crazy about it. How much did a carol leave? What's your guess? Oh, around a million. It's closer to two. Well, that's really worth shooting for, isn't it? Just what is that supposed to mean? Oh, when Joey Ford bumped Arcaro, he really did you a favor. I don't like that kind of talk, Mr. Waring. Mr. Arcaro was a very dear friend of mine. Mm -hmm. Were you related? No, we had no family. He was interested in my voice. Oh, I see. He thought I had the making of a great singer. Well, it just goes to prove you can't judge by appearances. Now, I never would have taken Jimmy for a patron of the arts, but... Uh... Oh, well, that's beside the point. How do I come into this? Well, when I spoke to Arcaro's lawyer this morning, he showed a very strange reluctance to pay off. And you can't blame him, Eileen. Who can't? I think he's got something up his sleeve, and I want to find out what it is. Seems pretty obvious. Ford hasn't told the cops who he was working for. It was Marvin Draper. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, suppose it was you. What? Well, let's face it, Angel. Arcaro's lawyer must have thought of that possibility, and so will the police. Under Arcaro's will, you come into quite a bundle. Well, that was just an accident. Eddie Hutton would have gotten it all if he hadn't died before Jimmy. Mm -hmm, but he did, Eileen. And we mustn't forget it. According to the grapevine, Eddie Hutton died in October, about two months after this will was drawn. So you see where that places you. But that's just a temporary delay, isn't it? Once Ford confesses who hired him to kill our Caro, I should have no trouble. None at all, Eileen. Unless, of course, he names you. Hey, mister. Mister? Who, me? Yeah. Did you happen to have a match with you? Uh, I think so. Yeah. Thanks. It's all right. Keep the whole pack. If you want to keep your health, you'll behave yourself. What is this? Just walk around the corner. I got a car waiting. Why bother? I can get a cab. Don't be cute. You've read enough books to know why I'm keeping this hand in my pocket. Oh, yes. Forgive the oversight. I'll start walking. Look, friend, I don't want to be difficult, but you got the wrong boy. You're Mike Waring, the Falcon, aren't you? Yeah. Well, then don't worry about any mistakes. My brother wants to talk to you. Your brother? Yeah. He's waiting for you in the car. Here he is, Eddie. Nice going, Alex. Get in, Waring. Yeah, sure, I'll be glad to. All right, Alex, let's go. Right. Any place in particular you want Alex to drop you, Waring? Yeah, police headquarters would be fine. Well, I'm afraid that's a little out of our way. All right, now, look, what's this all about? Don't tell me you don't recognize me. No, I can't say I do. Ah, such is fame. To think only six months ago, my picture was all over the front pages. Hey, wait a second. Yes? You're Jimmy Arcaro's partner, Eddie Hutton. You hear that, Alex? Yeah. Give the man a cigar. But I thought... I was at the bottom of the Hudson River. <laughs> You can't believe anything you read these days, can you? I heard Marvin Draper took care of you. Well, he was thinking of it, so I thought I'd better disappear. Uh, what made you come back? I got a wire from Alex this morning telling me that Arcaro was dead and you were working for Eileen Chambers. My, my, how news travels. Uh, if you got a fee out of her, you ought to return it. Why? Because you can't earn it. Under the terms of Jimmy's will, all his money goes to me. Uh, Miss Chambers won't get a dime now. So, um, she'd better start saving her money. And now, back 
to the adventures of the Falcon. An hour has passed since Mike had his little interview with Eddie and Alex Hutton. And now as we find him, he is relaying the information to his client. Four, one, seven, seven. <clears throat> Hello, is that you, Eileen? Who is this? Mike Waring. Well, this is a surprise. I didn't think I'd hear from you for quite a while. Well, I told you I was a fast worker. <clears throat> I've got bad news for you, Angel. Bad news? As you know, that two million bucks you were counting on? Well, don't. I don't understand you. Eddie Hutton is alive. <laughs> oh, so you're a comic, too. I'm not kidding. I saw him not more than an hour ago. All right, I give up. What's the gag? No gag. Don't talk like a fool, Mike. Eddie Hutton's at the bottom of the Hudson River. Oh, not by a long shot. I'm sorry, Eileen. Still, it was awfully nice knowing you. Uh, maybe we can get together on something else. Hmm. Listen, Waring, you won't get away with this double cross. Now, you're wrong, Angel. I don't believe in threats. Yeah, well, but before it... you make one, uh, hold the phone, huh? There's someone at my door. <laughs> Speak of the devil. I want to talk to you, Waring. There's no point in playing a repeat engagement, Hutton. I've already convinced you're alive. I was just telling Eileen. Is... is she here? No, I'm talking to her on the phone. Well, tell her. Tell her... Hey, what's the matter with you? Uh... Hutton. Hutton! Hello, so, Eileen, you still there? Yes, I'm not through with you. Oh, I'll say you're not. Forget what I told you about Eddie Hutton. But you said he wasn't dead. That was 20 seconds ago. Now he's gone and done it. Yeah? Marvin Draper. That's right. Who are you? Mike Waring. Well, come in. Thank you. Well, this is a pleasure, Mr. Waring. I've heard a great deal about you. I've heard a lot about you, Draper. Well, believe me, sir, I've done nothing to deserve it. Mm -hmm. You're just a little boy from down south, came up to see the big city, huh? You're mocking me, Mr. Waring. You don't like that? No. So, if that's all you came here for... Uh, not quite. I... I thought we could talk a little business. I'm a private detective. Well, then you're wasting your time. I don't need one. You never know. Now, don't tell me that fellow who killed Arcaro confessed he was hired by me. No, but remember a man named Eddie Hutton? Mm, vaguely. Well, I wouldn't be surprised if the police want to talk to you about his murder. Well, they're a little late, aren't they? Yeah, well, they couldn't help themselves. His body just turned up an hour ago. Where? At my place. That's very amusing. I don't think so. You mean you can't see the comic possibilities in a man returning from the bottom of the Hudson? He wasn't at the bottom. He was in hiding. Oh, well, then the police did me a great injustice when they queried me about his disappearance. You think I ought to sue them for the embarrassment they caused me? No, I'd wait, Draper, because they're bound to cause you a lot more. They couldn't prosecute you then because they had no corpus delicti. What do you think they'll say when I tell them there's one in my apartment? Well, I'm not a gambling man, sir. But um, I wouldn't mind risking a few bob wagering. I know what they'll tell you. Yeah, what? That you're crazy, Mr. Waring. <laughs> Now, you just see if they don't. Help me, Mike. You must be out of your mind to think I'd swallow a yarn like that. I tell you, Sergeant, Eddie Hutton's body is in my apartment. How about Judge Crater? He there, too? All right, all right. Be smart. But when your boys get back... What boys? Well, didn't you send a detail to my place after I called you? Are you kidding? Listen, Corbett, I'm not clowning. No, I don't think you are. What's your angle, Mike? Angle? You must have one. You working for Draper? Would I come here if I were? I represent a girl named Eileen Chambers. Who's she? Uh, Jimmy Carroll left her some dough in his will. Is that so? Oh, now look, Corbett, she didn't kill him. You said she collected under his will. Well, that doesn't mean anything. Has Ford talked yet? Now, I'm beginning to think that story of his about the 500 bucks in the envelope is true. But you do believe Draper was behind that? Yeah. Okay, then this is your one chance to nail him. How? Through the murder of Eddie Hutton. You're going to start that again? Listen, Sergeant. Suppose Hutton was seen around town today. So? So this was a perfect spot for Draper to act. Somehow he poisoned him. Poisoned? Well, that's the only thing I could figure out. It wasn't a mark on the body. Ah, that makes a lot of sense. A man sits down with a guy he knows wants to kill him and lets himself be poisoned, just like that. All right, all right. Maybe he wasn't poisoned. I'm no doctor. 
Draper could have killed him a hundred different ways. Look, why don't we go over to my place and you can see for yourself. Okay, Mike, I'll go along with the gag. All I ask is one thing. I got no sense of humor, so be sure and tell me when to laugh. What's the matter, Mike? Having trouble? No, I got it now. Uh, wait till I turn on the lights, huh? Where's Hutton? You're blind. He's right there, but... Hey, he's gone. Is this where I start to giggle? I give you my word, Sergeant. He was right on the floor there. Very funny. I haven't laughed so hard. Oh, don't be a sap. You think I'd bring you up here on a wild goose chase? No, that's what bothers me. What do you mean? You're not the kind of a boy who goes in for practical jokes. You must have had a reason for this, and when I find out what it is... Wait a minute. What for? Did you bring that copy of Eddie Hutton's fingerprints with you? Yeah. But when Hutton keeled over, his hand hit the top of my desk. So what? So he wasn't wearing gloves at the time. Where's your fingerprint kit? Get me a glass of water. You need water to run the test? No, I'm thirsty. Oh, you... Well, hurry it up, will you? How you doing? Be through in a second. But if you don't find a copy of Hutton's prints on that desk, I'll eat it. Okay, Mike, start eating. This desk is absolutely clean. Hearty appetite, pal. A short while ago, Mike was dumbfounded when, after promising Sergeant Corbett the body of Eddie Hutton, he discovered he couldn't deliver, for the body was gone without a trace. And understandably enough, the good sergeant sees very little humor in the situation. Now, let me tell you something, Mike. You're not going to get away with this. If you think you can pull a stunt like this and make me the stooge... Oh, you're out of your mind, Sergeant. Oh, that's good. That's good, coming from you. I tell you, Eddie Hutton's body was here. Draper must have removed it. If you had sent a squad when I called Don't you... give me that. Oh, you're talking like a child. Why would I dream up a story like that about Hutton? I told you how his brother Alex hijacked me this afternoon. Well, for your information, Alex Hutton is in Florida. He's what? Yeah, he was picked up there a couple of days ago for making book. Before they let him go, they wired us if we wanted him for anything. So, if you've got anything else to say... Shut up. Who do you think you're talking to? I'm sorry, Corbett. I didn't mean it that way. You see what I see? Where? On the carpet, under the sofa. That pocket comb? Yes, that's not mine. Someone must have kicked it there. Where's your fingerprint outfit? Listen, Mike. Well, what have you got to lose? All right. Now, don't touch it. You got enough powder? Yeah. <sighs> well? Can't you be quiet for a minute? <sighs> well, what do you know? There's a right thumb and forefinger on here. Look at this copy. They both belong to Eddie Hutton. Well, what did I tell you? I take it all back. Where's your telephone? Come in. Hello, Waring. Oh, so he was in Florida, huh? Say, what goes on here? You're just the boy I want to see, Alex. Sergeant, meet Alex Hutton. Is he the one? Yeah, he's the one. I want to talk to you, Alex. Well, that makes us even, because I want to talk to you. Where's my brother? Eddie? Who did you think I meant? He's not here. I can see that for myself, but where is he? He left my place two hours ago and said he was coming here. Well? Well, he hasn't been back since. That's well, easy to understand, Alex. He's dead. I don't like those kind of jokes, Waring. It's the truth, Alex. I'm asking you for the last time. Where's my brother? I told you he's dead. You just won't be serious, will you? Mike! All right, you better put away the rod, Alex. This man's a sergeant with the New York police. Yeah, and I got a badge, too. If I asked like... you a question, Waring. And I answered it to the best of my ability. Eddie's dead, and you better reconcile yourself to it. Who killed him? I don't know. Maybe Marvin Draper. Yeah. Or maybe it was your client, Eileen Chambers. Why should she? I suppose you forgot all about Jimmy Arcaro's will. Now, with Eddie out of the way, she's going to be sitting pretty. Yeah, you've got a point there. Well, I'm going to let you in on a little secret, friend. Eileen isn't going to live to spend a dime of that money. You better watch your step, Alex. They can burn you for this. Shall I tell you something, Waring? If I can get Eileen, it'll be worth it. I'll be seeing your friends. <laughs> Well, well, if it isn't Alex Hutton. You're surprised, Eileen? Not particularly. Come in. 
Now, let me have your coat. No, no thanks, baby. I don't think I'll be staying very long. That's where you're wrong, Alex. Uh, what's the idea of the gun? I'm just beating you to the draw. Are you crazy? Well, wasn't that what you came here for? Of course not. Well, then why do you suppose Mike Waring made up the story? Mike Waring? That's right. You talked to him? Uh Uh-huh. How? (laughs) For a smart boy, Alex, you made an awful boner. Didn't you ever hear of the telephone? Great invention. He didn't call Oh, yes, he did. He should be here any minute. Oh, there, that's probably him now. Uh, Come in. Hi, Eileen. Hello, Mike. Who is your friend? Uh, Oh, that's right. You haven't met, have you? Eileen, this is Sergeant Corbett. Glad to know you, Miss Chambers. Thanks, Isn't she a great gal, Sergeant? Look how she's in command of the situation. Just like the Marines in Korea. Aren't you proud of me? Oh, Angel, what a question. You're all in this together. You better be careful with those accusations, Alex. Let me have the cannon, Eileen. What for? Well, that's an awfully big gun for a little girl like you to carry. Oh, I don't mind. Don't think I'm swallowing this routine, because I'm not. You're all partners. Where's our motive? Two million bucks that Jimmy Arcaro left my brother. Sure. You hired Ford to kill Jimmy, and then one of you poisoned Eddie. You're wrong, Alec. Yeah, well, then where is he? Where he's been for the past six months at the bottom of the Hudson. What are you babbling about? That guy who died over at my place was a plant you dug up for the occasion. Are you nuts, Mike? Next you'll be saying he hired Ford to kill Jimmy Arcaro, too. Why, Sergeant, how did you guess? You took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> Admit it, Eileen. Isn't this cozy? I still don't see why we couldn't have brought your friend along. My friend? Mm Mm-hmm. Sergeant Corbett. I think he's cute. Oh, really, Eileen? You disappoint me. Well, if I told you some of the things I know about Corbett... I'd much rather you told me about Alex Hutton. Oh, believe me, he's a much nicer guy. Even though he did hire Ford to kill Jimmy Acaro. Why? Well, so that Acaro's will would go into effect. You see, under its terms, if Eddie Hutton was alive at the time, he'd come into everything. That's why Alex showed up with his brother's double. Well, why did he kill him later? Well, the man had performed his purpose. All Alex wanted to establish was that his brother lived longer than the cow. In that way, your interest would be wiped out and everything would then go to Eddie Hutton. Well, how did that affect Alex? Well, if Eddie Hutton survived a cow, the money would go to Eddie's next of kin. Not to me? Nope. So, naturally, Alex tried to convince us that his brother had lived longer than the cow. Once he had me convinced, he removed the body. Why? Well... He couldn't afford to let it be found again, because then it would be easy to prove the man was a phony. But with my story that I had talked to Eddie Hutton today, plus the fingerprints on the pocket comb he planted in my apartment, Alex had all he needed to substantiate his case. Well, what was his mistake? Oh, well, he made several. For one thing, he knew that the man who died in my place was a victim of poisoning. Well, how could he know that when he'd never seen the body? Then his hokey threat about killing you was a boner, too. Don't you think he meant it? No, of course not. He did that for effect. He wanted to show us he was all broken up over his brother's death and that he felt you were responsible. (laughs) You don't really believe he forgot we could telephone ahead and warn you. He wanted us to stop him. Now, Alex wasn't taking any chances of getting in trouble with two million bucks in sight. Which now belongs to me? Which now belongs to you. Now, does that take care of all your questions? All but one. Just ask it, Angel. What time is it? Uh, Ten o'clock. Why? I don't want to be late for my appointment with uh, Sergeant Corbett. Oh, 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 oh. you don't mean that. Uh Uh-huh. He's waiting for me at the Belvedere. Well, what's he got that I haven't got? Me. And two million dollars. Good night, Mike. R-I-N-S-O, Soapy Rich Rinso presents Boston Blackie, starring Chester Morris. Hello? Is Mr. Manleather there? Why, no, I'm sorry, he's not. This is his secretary, Miss Rochelle. Can I help you? Yes, you can deliver a message for me. I've been trying to reach him all day. This is John Partridge, president of the Morton National Bank. Mr. Partridge? But, well, Arthur Borden is president of the Morton Bank, isn't he? Not since yesterday, he's not. 
Give this message to Mr. Manletter, please. Tell him that his notes to the bank were due and payable on Monday of this week, and we must have our money. But, Mr. Partridge, we, we showed our books to Mr. Borden only last week, and he agreed to extend the notes until our accounts receivable came in. Our business is in fine shape, Mr. Partridge. Our books prove it. Please tell Mr. Manletter that we'll accept our money in the morning, Miss Rochelle. But it's $100,000. We can't possibly raise that money overnight. I'm sorry. That's Mr. Manletter's problem. Goodbye. $100,000. Hello, Jean. Mr. Manletter, the bank just called. There's a new president and they... And they want to foreclose on my notes. How did you know? I read this letter. I got it at the house this morning. Here, read it. If you want to know how to prevent the bank from foreclosing on your note, have your friend Boston Blackie visit a house at 50 Hunter Street at 7 o'clock this evening. Signed a friend. Mr. Manletter, what does that mean? I don't know. I can't see any connection between the bank and Blackie. But I do know I won't ask him to go to Hunter Street. Well, can we raise $100,000 for the notes overnight? Uh, I don't think so, but I'll try. Only there isn't much hope. Then you must call your friend Blackie. No, it can only mean trouble for Blackie. I don't know how or why, but it must be trouble for him if I'm being forced to ask him to go there. But Blackie thrives on trouble, Mr. Manletter, and it'll save your business. No, I won't call Blackie. I'm going out to try to raise the money. You'll hear from me later. All right, sir. Alice... Will you call a number for me, please? Get me Boston Blackie. Get me Boston Blackie. Four words that the weak use to call their champion. You know, some expressions seem so natural and right, we use them all the time without even thinking, like ruby red and sky blue and so on. Well, what I get a particular kick out of is the fact that we've added a new one to the nation's vocabulary. Yes, I hear tell that nowadays you ladies say rinse white when you want to talk about really white clothes. Of course, there's a mighty good reason why rinse gets your clothes so white. rinse soapy rich suds won't take no for an answer from dirt. They pitch right in in your tub or washer and go to town. Yes, rinse gets out more dirt. And that's why you ladies are able to turn out those beautiful Rinso White, Rinso Bright washes. So next wash day, whistle for the kind of wash you're proud to hang on your line. Like this. And remember, it stands for Rinso White. Now, meet Chester Morris as Boston Blackie. Uh, tell me, Blackie, which one of these girls do you like best? So, come on, take a look at their pictures. Come on, will you? <laughs> All right, Shorty. I'll judge your personal beauty contest for you. Now, this blonde here... Yeah. Hold it, Shorty. I'll get the phone. Hello? Blackie? Yes. Blackie, this is Jean. I had to call you. Mr. Manletter's in terrible trouble. Hey, come on, will you, Blackie? Come on, get off that phone. I gotta know about this redhead. Lay off, Shorty. Uh, what is it, Jean? What's the matter with Arthur? The bank called an hour ago. I've been trying since then to reach you. They're going to take over the business if Arthur doesn't redeem his notes for $100,000 by tomorrow morning. Well, they, they, they can't do that, Jean. Yes, they can. The notes are overdue. Hey, boss, what about this brunette? Now, come on, come on, will you? Quiet. Uh, not you, Jean. Uh, look, honey, I haven't anywhere near 100000 and I wouldn't know where to go to get it by tomorrow morning. I didn't expect you would, Blackie, but Mr. Manletter received a message saying that if you come to 50 Hunter Street at, 12, at 7 o'clock tonight, the notes will be renewed. If I go to 50 Hunter Street, well, what does that mean? I don't know, Blackie. But if I show up, they'll renew? That's what the note says. Mr. Manletter knew you'd be in some kind of danger if you went, and he wouldn't ask you. Oh, don't worry, chick. You'll hear from me. Bye. So you finally got done. Now, come on, help me. Look at it. See, I got 50 pictures here. Pick out the one I should pin up on my I wall. I can't huh? do anything about your pin-up problem now, Shorty. Oh. I've got something at 50 Hunter Street that I've got to pin down. <laughs> Hey, what is this? Sounds like a record. Hey, you behind that desk. You in the mask. What is this? Come on, talk. First of all, Boston Blackie, don't try anything foolish. There's one of my men behind you with a gun. Now that you've turned around to see, <laughs> let me tell you that you are listening to this recording which I made 
because I don't want you to know what my voice sounds like in person. A record, huh? Well, personally, I prefer Harry James. Blackie, I want you to listen carefully to what follows. Have you anything to say? Sure I have. I hope you'll... Okay, boss. Take the record off. He's out cold. I uh, hope I didn't hit him too hard, boss. There's no sense killing him. The law is going to do that for us very soon. Gee, Blanky, where you been? I've been having pups. Well, I hope they look like their mother. Well, I'm back, Shorty, only I'm not the same guy. You should have had your head examined for going down to that Hunter Street joint. Yes, I, I had it cracked. That's worse. Take a look at this, Shorty. A bullet hole? Yeah. In your coat pocket. Who'd you shoot, Blackie? I didn't shoot anybody, Shorty. Somebody slugged me, and when I woke up, my gun was gone, and this hole was in my pocket. I must have been out for hours. It's, uh, it's almost 11 o'clock. I called Jean, and she told me the bank renewed man letters notes the minute I showed up at the Hunter Street place. Somebody sure took an awful crack at you, hey, Blackie? Yeah, it's more than that, Shorty. Only how much more and exactly what, I don't know. Uh, get my robe, will you please? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure, boss. Uh, give me your coat and I'll hang it over this here chair. Well, here it is. Blanky, uh, what do you make of this business this afternoon? Uh, I don't make it. It's got me stumped. Yeah, me too. Well, here's your robe. Thanks. I think I'll lie down and relax for half an hour. Uh, would you mind fixing me some coffee, oh, Shorty? sure, sure. Have it free in just a minute, boss. Thanks. Hello, Blanky. Glad to see me? Well, Inspector Faraday, of course I'm glad to see you. <laughs> Which goes to prove how easy I am to please. <laughs> Very funny. Well, Blackie, I think you overdid it this afternoon. Well, my head sure feels like I did. That isn't what I mean. Did you ever hear of a private detective named Fred Viswell? That crooked Jamis? Yeah. Oh, sure, I've heard of him. And he's heard of me, too, Faraday. I got the guy's license suspended when he tried to blackmail me. A uh, old couple of friends of mine, you know, last year. That's the guy. He didn't like you, Blackie. You know, I'd feel a whole lot worse if you said Rita Hayworth didn't like me. You didn't like him either. I hate rats, Faraday. Come on, what's all this about? Nothing, only Viswell was found shot to death an hour ago. What? I'm taking you in for his murder, Blackie. Now, let's get going. Now, look, Faraday, you've done ridiculous things every day of your life. <laughs> but right now, you're borrowing from next week. What makes you think I bumped off Viswell? I don't think it, I know it. We've got your gun and it's got your fingerprints on it. Oh. We found it near Viswell's body. And if I'm not mistaken, isn't that a bullet hole in the pocket of this coat of yours on the chair? You fired from your pocket. Well, maybe I burned the hole with a cigarette. Uh, no cigarette ever burned a hole like that. Now, come on, let's get going, Blackie. Get dressed and hurry up. Take off that robe, put a coat on. You're coming with me. Come on, take that robe off. All right, all right. Pretty robe, isn't it? Too bad you won't be allowed to wear it in jail. You like this robe, Inspector? Mm -hmm. Well, here, take a good look at Lovely. it. Lovely. Take a good look at it. Right over your head. <laughs> Shorty, Shorty. Yeah, yeah, I'm right here, boss. I was waiting for a signal from him before I counted. Well, help me tie him up, Shorty. We'll use the cord from the rope. Now, quiet, Inspector, quiet. Don't you know it's impolite to talk with your mouth full? Uh, you'll be tied up like a chicken in just a little minute now. Uh, well, I know what the score is now, Shorty. Somebody's fixed it to look like I knocked off Fred Viswell. Yeah, I heard. Ain't a very pretty picture, is it, boss? I'm not worried about the picture, Shorty. I'm worried about the frame. <laughs> Who's there? Let me in, Jean. Hurry. It's Blackie. Blackie? Oh, thanks. Hi. I'm sorry about coming to your apartment at this hour, Jean, but I couldn't reach you on the telephone. Well, they closed the downstairs switchboard at midnight. Oh. What is it, Blackie? What's wrong? I need information, Jean. I need all you know or can remember. There's some connection between a private detective named Fred Viswell and somebody at the Morton National Bank. Now... Who was it that spoke to you on the telephone? The new president. Oh. His name is John Partridge. Well, that's the man I'm going to see. Faraday's on my trail again, Jean, and I've got to clear myself. Oh, you'll never be able to get into the bank to see Partridge, especially if Faraday has a dragnet out for you. As soon as you show up, they'll throw you in jail. Oh, don't worry. I'll figure out a way to get in to see him. But if I don't get anywhere with Partridge, I'm a dead duck. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Potter. Good morning. Oh, I left you a mail on your desk, Mr. Potter. Thank you. I'll be in my office if anyone wants me. Now don't open your mouth, Partridge, or this gun will shut it permanently. Why? What? What do you want? Aren't you one of the special police that protects the bank? Oh, well, don't let this uniform fool you. I wore it just to get in here. And keep away from your desk. You know, I'm allergic to the sudden pushing of buttons. 
Ah, that's better. Now, do you know who I am? No. I'm Boston Blackie. That doesn't mean a thing to me. Oh, no, I think it does. You called Arthur Manletter's office and told him the bank wouldn't renew his notes. But he received a letter saying that if I were to go to 50 Hunter Street, the bank would renew. Maybe you know what you're talking about, but I don't. You've got to be the man behind a pretty shrewd frame-up, Partridge. Unless you're acting on somebody's instructions. Now, which is it? Do you know that if I raised my voice, you'd be shot dead by the bank guards before you could go through the front door? Well, I'd have company, Partridge. Believe me, you. Inspector Faraday thinks I killed a man. They don't hang you twice for double killing. Why was I framed for the murder of Fred Visual? I don't know any Fred Visual, and I don't know anything about any telephone call that was supposed to be made by me to Arthur Manletter. No, you don't, huh? How about the renewal of Manletter's note? There never was any question about renewing Manletter's note. His credit is excellent. The note was renewed by me personally at 10 o'clock yesterday morning with a notary attesting to the time. And that was certainly long before my alleged phone call. Oh, you played it cozy, huh? You knew Manletter would call me, so you bluffed him. How long are you going to make me stand here? Can't you see there's nothing I know that can help you? Why don't you go? I will. I've got another stop to make. But the minute I leave this office, you'll call for help, of course. Of course. Oh, but you're not going to. You know, the only way you can do any calling, Partridge, is to talk in your sleep. Mr. Borden? Yes? I'm sorry to disturb you at your home. My name is Boston Blackie. How do you do, Mr. Blackie? I, uh, I came up here to see you, Mr. Borden, uh, about your bank. You mean about what used to be my bank? I'm sorry. Uh, who decided to replace you as president? The board of directors. Oh, well, and was it done suddenly? Yes, very. Uh-huh, and uh, where did John Partridge come from? I don't know. He had been on our board of directors only a short while. Oh. I'm an old man, Blackie. The loss of my bank was a blow to me. Everything came so suddenly, I haven't gotten used to not being there anymore. Will you forgive me if I'd rather not talk about it? Oh, I understand, Mr. Borden. I, I'm going to try to get your bank back for you, but I need some help. Now, here's an address where I can be reached. Oh, you must have some loyal employee at the bank you can depend on, and would you call him and get him to find out something about Partridge? And if you get any information, send me a message. And uh, send that ring you're wearing with it so I know it's from you. I'll send you a message if I get it. But with just a paper clip on it, I haven't been able to get this ring off in years. The paper clip will identify my messenger if I hear anything. Good. Give me a little help. I'll turn a murder over to Inspector Faraday, get rid of the charge against myself, and give you a bank right in your side pocket. <laughs> We've got to stay down here at my waterfront hideout during the day, Shorty. Every cop in town is on our tail. And Faraday's sworn he won't sleep till he brings me in. It's okay with me, Blackie. Uh, and go ahead, it's your deal. You got me, let me see, you got me 60 to 17 and two boxes. Go ahead, <laughs> it's your deal. <laughs> you know one thing about gin rummy, it sure passes the time away. Yeah, it passes my dough away, too. <laughs> okay, you two, hoist him. Come on, Patsy. Yeah, yeah, I'm coming. Now, look, Blackie. Stand up and don't try no, no, nothing foolish. I, I know all about you and your trucks. Well, I wasn't exactly going to ask you to pick a card. Who are you? A guy who ain't going to be outsmarted by you. Oh? Tie the little guy up, Patsy. Yeah, yeah, I'll tie him up. Good, too. Don't talk. Tie. Why, I'm tying him. He ain't going to go nowhere for a while. Okay. Suppose we start moving, Blackie. You ready, Patsy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm ready, Mug. Well, of course, don't anybody ask me. You're ready, Blackie. But you don't know for what. Now, start moving. Oh, this is a ride, huh? Okay. One way? Oh, I wouldn't say that, Blackie. We're coming back, Patsy and me. But we got orders to get you. Orders to get me, huh? Dealing in the Blackie market? You'll strain an arm reaching for jokes like that, Blackie. I thought that was rather clever, isn't it? But you might as well know something. Yeah? We ain't taking you on any gang ride. We're turning you over to the cops. Yeah, I'll bet. A couple of hoods like you wouldn't go within two miles of headquarters. I guarantee Faraday's got charges hanging over both of you guys. Maybe. Only he'll be so glad to see you, he won't be able to think straight. All right, let's get moving, Blackie. And remember, I'm the guy that's got the gun on you. Okay, Mug. But take my word for it, someday you're going to beg me to forget that. (laughs) 
Blackie, there's something natural about the way you look behind bars. Yeah. They look good on you. Oh, thanks. You've got no idea how nice it is to see you sitting so sweetly in that cell. Now, Faraday, listen, I didn't knock off Fizzwell. No kidding. Oh, of course not. And you didn't throw your bathrobe over my head and tie me up either, did you, Blackie? Well, yes, I did do that, mm-hmm. Faraday. You know I did. <laughs> but I did it to help you. Oh, this is going to be good. Now, tell me how. Well, somebody knocked off Fred Viswell. Uh-huh. Your job is to catch murderers, Faraday. I, I had to be free to help you, see? Blackie, you should have been a lawyer. Thanks. Only you're overlooking a slight something. Your gun. Your pretty little gun. With your fingerprints on it. And a slug from it in Viswell's head and a bullet hole in your coat pocket. Nobody else killed Viswell, Blackie. You've got no alibi. You hated the guy and your gun did the job. Looks like kind of a perfect job to me. This is a frame-up, Faraday. Now, you've got to do something you've never done before. Oh, what? Use your head. Look, you're in jail, Blackie, and you tell me to use my head. Don't you think this is a spot where you should use your... Well, it seems as though Inspector Faraday is about to realize a lifelong ambition and has finally found a charge against Boston Blackie that will stick. However, that remains to be seen, of course. You know, you ladies really have it all over the men, folks, when it comes to being sensible about clothes. Come summertime, for instance, you know that one of the tricks of keeping cool is to look cool. And what could look cooler, crisper, and prettier than those bright cotton washables you wear? It's important, though, to remember to keep them bright and crisp. And that's where our soapy rich Rinso comes in. No point in working your head off in summertime, boiling and scrubbing clothes. And you don't have to with Rinso. A short soaking in Rinso suds, often as little as ten minutes, is enough. Then a few quick finger rubs on extra soiled places, and your clothes are ready to rinse. And believe you me, you'll be mighty proud of how your wash looks, too. Your lovely colored washable cottons will stay fresh and bright, week after week, wash after wash. And your white clothes... Well, it goes without saying, they'll be... <whistles> yes, Rinso White. So get Rinso next wash day for a Rinso White, Rinso Bright wash. <laughs> and now back to Boston Blackie, starring Chester Morris. Blackie is in jail. Inspector Faraday knows that it was Blackie's gun that killed Fred Viswell, and Blackie can't clear himself while he's in prison. Into the cell block where Blackie is being kept walks a young lady. The policeman at the end of the corridor said I could come in and talk to all the other policemen in the whole jail, and you're the other policeman, so I thought I'd come over and talk to you. All right, miss. But about what? About the ball, of course. Everybody knows about the ball. What ball? The ball we're giving. But I'm selling tickets only to policemen. Well, now I've heard everything. Selling tickets to policemen for a civilian's ball. How much are they? A dollar. But the policeman at the end of the corridor said that if I came up... uh... Here's a dollar and keep the ticket. Uh-huh. And the next policeman is right down past this row of cells. Go bother him, will you, please? Yes. And uh, don't tell me that bag you're carrying is full of tickets. There aren't that many policemen. Oh, you're so silly. Of course not. I always carry a bag. It makes me look as if I'm always about ready to go someplace. Well, right? uh, you can go right now. I'll unlock the door. You can walk down the corridor till you find another cop at the end of it. Uh, his name's Murphy. Isn't every policeman? Oh, I don't know. All right, go. Go on, miss. Right down the corridor. Don't mind them mugs in the cells. Blackie. Jean, what are you doing here? This isn't visiting day. Blackie, listen. I've got to keep walking when the guard looks this way. Oh, oh, don't be silly. Come in. The door's open. The cell door's open? Sure. Try it. It is. Blackie, how did you do that? Close the door. You know, I could open the cell door all right, Jean. That was a cinch. But I haven't figured out yet how to get past the guards at both ends of the guard. Well, stop figuring it, Blackie. Here, look at this bag I brought. It's an outfit that matches the one I'm wearing, only it's a couple of sizes larger. Put it on, quick. What, and leave you in the cell? Oh, nothing doing, honey. Oh, I'll go out the door. I came in, Blackie, and you go out the other one. Only hurry. The guard might get curious. Okay. Well, it won't take me a second. Now, first roll my trousers up, mm-hmm. and then on with the dress. <laughs> oh, oh, you brought a wig, too, huh? Mm-hmm. You think of everything. Can, uh, can I get into these shoes? Sure, you can. And hurry, Blackie. Yeah. Don't forget your hat. Say, it's a cute one. <laughs> all right, zip me up, will you? And I'm all set. <laughs> there. Oh. Now, just walk out, Blackie, and tell the cop at the end of the corridor. His name's Murphy. Tell him you ran out of tickets. Uh, can you talk like a girl? Who, me? Of course I oh, can. Oh, you better not talk. Bye, Blackie, <laughs> and luck. Meet me back in my apartment. Oh, thanks, Jean. You're wonderful. Mm, see you later, Blackie. You look awful cute in that outfit. Watch out for the wolves. Oh, not me. For once, I want to be on the receiving end of a...
This is the house, Shorty. 50 Hunter Street. I don't know what I'd expect to find here, but let's go in. Why, boss? Well, maybe I can pick up something inside that'll give me a clue to that masked man. Uh, you see any lights? No. Nope, there ain't any lights. Okay, now don't hit your flashlight till we close the street door. Oh, what kind of a lock is this? I don't know. But if you're working on it, it's an easy lock. I'll guarantee that. No, Shorty, it's an open lock. Come on in. Shh, quiet. Hit your flash, Shorty. Right. Yeah, this is the room where I got conked. The masked guy sat right over there facing me with his hands folded on that table, and he... Shorty. What? Well, what happened? I know now who the masked guy was, Shorty. Yeah? I'm going to straighten out this whole mess. Wait till I look up a number in this phone book. Let's see. Yeah, who are you calling, Blackie? I'm calling the murderer of Fred Viswell. Wait a minute. Yeah. Yeah, here it is. Well, now let's hope I sound like the mug. Hey, boss, this is a mug. Come right down to Hunter Street House. I got Blackie here. He's Hoyt. Oh, you want to talk to him? Okay. Talk to the boss, Blackie, or you get it again. Here, take the phone. So you're the boss, huh? Well, <laughs> what am I supposed to do? Applaud? Hey, give me that phone, Blackie. Okay, boss. Yeah. Yeah, that sure is Blackie, huh? Well, oh, you'll be right down? It worked, ain't Good. It? Yeah. What a swell. Okay, Shorty, now you beat it. I'm staying right here and I'm handling this alone. But I have a job for you when you get outside. Okay, boss. It may decide who dies for the murder of Fred Viswell. And just between us, I'd rather it wasn't me. <laughs> Mug, are you in here? Mug, turn on the light. It's dark. I can't see you. Turn on the light. Here's a light, Mr. Borden. Right in your face. Boston Blackie. That's right, Boston Blackie. <laughs> you had a very nice frame-up all fixed for me, but I think you're going down to explain it all to Inspector Faraday now. Do you? Well, I don't. So the phone call to me was a gag, eh? I might have known it was one of your tricks, Blackie, but I didn't. No harm done, though. I'll just leave. Oh, just like that, eh? Mm-hmm. And don't think you can threaten me, Blackie. As long as I'm alive, I'm a potential alibi for you. Only you and I know you didn't kill Fred Bearswell and that I did. And you've got to let me live in the hope that someday I'll confess. Mm, yes, yes, I guess maybe I do. Oh, you're a pretty smart man, Borden. You'd have to be to have me in this kind of a jam. What did Viswell ever do to you? You thought he could outsmart me, the fool? Some private investors had him checking the books at the bank. Found that I'd taken quite a bit of money that didn't belong to me. And he thought he'd try a bit of blackmail. He didn't get very far. Pretty thorough, aren't you? I think so. How did you know I was the masked man, Blackie? Well, two ways, Borden. Yes? One was the fact that I gave you the address of my waterfront hideout, and later your hoods paid me a visit down there. You were the only one that had that address. The other was that ring you're wearing. Uh, you know, the one you told me you couldn't take off. When I came in tonight, I remembered the masked man was wearing that ring. You know, putting John Partridge in your place as president of the bank sounds like a wonderfully smart idea. It was. I was tired of working, and I can throw Partridge in jail any time I like for a little embezzlement job he did. So he must do as I say. And now, Boston Blackie, let's go visit Inspector Faraday. Well, no, Mr. Borden. I, I don't think I care to see the inspector tonight. No? Perhaps this gun will make you change your mind. I happen to know that Faraday has your gun. You're still under suspicion of murder, you know. And if you try to escape, Blackie, I'll think nothing of killing you in cold blood. You know, I believe you would, Borden. All right. All right, I'll go with you. I guess I'd rather be a live prisoner than a dead suspect. <laughs> Here's Inspector Faraday's office, Blackie. Walk right in. Go on. Okay, if you say so, Borden. <laughs> Hello, Inspector. Say, look, don't you ever sleep? Hello, Blackie. I've been expecting you. You're a little late. Would you mind telling this gentleman in back of me to get rid of his gun, please, Inspector? He doesn't realize that it's impolite to point. His name is Arthur Borden. Okay, Mr. Borden, I'll take that gun. Certainly. Here you are. Well, looks like I've got a first-rate murder suspect right here in this room. <laughs> it certainly does, Inspector. <laughs> like to lock him up? In just a minute. In fact, I might as well do it very legal and proper. Arthur Borden, you're under arrest for the murder of Fred Viswell. What? Me? Why, I... David, I wish it was Blackie. Only it isn't. 
We've got your confession in your own voice, right on a dictograph record. A dictograph planted in my Hunter Street house? Right. That's impossible. Nobody could have put a dictograph in there. You tell him, Blackie. You figured this thing out. Well, before you came into the Hunter Street house tonight, Mr. Borden, I dialed the inspector's private number on the telephone and left the receiver off the hook, you see. I had Shorty call him before and tell him to expect his private telephone to ring. All the while you were telling me how perfectly you would frame me, the inspector was listening on this end. Yeah, not only listening, but having the whole thing taken down on a record. <laughs> uh, say, inspector, I did you a favor, didn't I, by turning up Viswell's murderer? You did yourself a bigger favor, but what's on your mind? Well, I'll tell you, inspector. Shorty told me you have Jean Rochelle booked here. You said it, Blackie. She helped you escape from jail. Well, maybe she did, but uh, if she did, I brought you in a murderer, so you certainly owe her a favor, too, right? Well, maybe. What do you expect me to do, let her go? Sure. You've held her long enough. Now it's my turn. You've heard about making mountains out of molehills, but here's how to make mountains of dishes go right down to nothing in a hurry. You put some rinseau in your dishpan, and up go the suds. Plenty of thick suds from surprisingly little rinseau. And down goes that stack of dishes in practically no time. Yes, dishwashing is a mighty easy, simple job with Rinso helping out. China, silver, glassware, they're all shining brightly in a jiffy with Rinso's soapy rich suds on the job. Why, even your pots and pans come clean easily when Rinso gets to work. Use Rinso, too, for all the soap and water jobs around the house. It's swell. <laughs> Now a glimpse at next week's adventure of Boston Blackie. All right, Monahan, give me a little more juice in that light. No, no, don't do that. I can't stand it. That's better. Now, listen, Shorty, you say you don't remember what happened. I, I don't. I keep telling you I don't. All right, maybe you don't remember. You were slug. Now, we don't want to know anything except one thing. Now, think hard, Shorty. Who was the last person you saw or talked to before you were slug? Now, that's all we want to know. I'm thinking, Inspector Honest. I'm dizzy trying to think. I don't know. I just don't know. Hey, wait a minute. Oh, yeah, I remember now. The last person I talked to before I got conked was, uh... Well, was Boston Blackie. Be sure to listen in at this same time next week for another exciting adventure with Boston Blackie, starring Chester Morris with Richard Lane as Inspector Faraday. You can see Chester Morris as Boston Blackie at your favorite movie theater. Boston Blackie's latest Columbia picture is One Mysterious Night, soon to be released. Original music for the program was by Charles Cornell. This is Harlow Wilcox speaking for the makers of Rinso and wishing you all a very pleasant good night. Warm weather's ahead, and that means greater danger from perspiration. Protect yourself. Use Life Boy in your daily bath. You know, of seven leading brands, Life Boy gives you the most soap for your money. And its rich, purifying Life Boy lather agrees with your skin. And don't forget, Life Boy is the only soap especially made to stop. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Partially transcribed. The National Broadcasting Company presents Earl Stanley Gardner's A Life in Your Hand. What was she wearing? Was the door open? Where was the weapon? Listen while we place A Life in Your Hands. You never know when you step from the safety of your home when you may witness a violent death and be called upon to testify as to what you saw and heard. Murder is a dark enigma that strikes fear into the heart of man. Strange, baffling, mysterious. But the darkest crime one man can invent, another man can unravel. Such a man is Jonathan Kegg, created by Earl Stanley Gardner, the world's most popular writer of mysteries, creator of Perry Mason, and many other outstanding characters. 
Here's your key, Mr. Keg. Room 102. Thanks, Jim. I can always count on you to remember my room number. I guess so. It isn't often we have famous people staying at this hotel. How come you stay in a little town like this when you could go to someplace important? Well, when I'm on a vacation, Jim, I like to take it easy. Fly in the sun, swim, eat good meals, and relax. Most of all, I like to avoid crowds. I bet you like to get away from crime, too, don't you? Yes, Jim, but I've found much to my dismay that no matter where you go, crime is not far away. You never know when or where violence will strike, or when you'll suddenly become a witness to a crime and be called upon to testify as to what you saw and heard. Even now, somewhere nearby, there may be a crime in the making. Dr. Matthews' office. No, the doctor is out. May I help you? Yes, we have office hours tonight. Oh, you'd like your eyes examined? Mm, yes, we can take you at seven. Your name, please. Mrs. Sellinger? Thank you for calling, Mrs. Sellinger. We'll see you tonight. Bye. What are you doing here? Dr. Matthews isn't in. I know. That's why I came. Why don't you leave me alone? How many times have I told you I don't want you around? My dear Miss O'Connor, being the owner of this building gives me every right to be here. Don't you dare come near me. I just want to talk to you. I wouldn't think of touching a hair of your innocent head. Don't forget, I know all about your pretty past. Take your hands off me. Uh, Don't pull that toy act on me. You let me go. Bite me. I'll teach you. Liz! Crane, get away from her. Well, Sir Galahad the dentist to the rescue. We're just having a little fun. This is the first time she's objected. You ought to be killed. Those are harsh words. Liz, are you all right? Yes, Paul. Please get him out of here. Crane, you get out of here. Temper, temper. Your fair damsel isn't hurt. And she's not so fair. Get out! It's hardly the way to talk to a man you owe 15000 You get your money, I'm you... I'm sure I will. The next payment is due Tuesday. Either you pay or out goes your precious equipment. I don't know why Takers I... can't be choosers. <laughs> I haven't had so much fun in years. Ah, oh, the illustrious Dr. Matthews. What do you want here, Crane? Maybe your rent. I paid it. Yesterday. David, he's been bothering Liz. I have to get back to my office. I left a patient in the chair. Are you out of your mind, Crane? I'm just a bit taken with your assistant. Get out of here. Look, I'm the one who does the evicting around here, and I don't take a lot of guff from tenants. What did you come here for? Just to bother Miss O'Connor? This is a professional call. I want my eyes examined. Why don't you go to someone else? Because you're the best. I'll be here at seven. We have an appointment for seven. You'll take me first. You'll always consider me first. All right. Come at seven. I'll put drops in your eyes. By the time they take effect, maybe the other examination will be finished. Count the minutes, Miss O'Connor, until you see me again. How long has he been bothering you? Months. I haven't said anything. He could ruin me. He knows all about Paul and me. If it got back to Paul's wife, he'd lose his practice. It's none of my business, but you're playing with fire. No, it's none of your business. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Matthews. On edge, I guess. Oh, one of your earrings is on the floor. Oh. Here. Thanks. Good heavens, Liz. Was he so rough that he knocked an earring off? No, I always take one off when I answer the phone. These dangle kind get in my way. What are we going to do, Doctor? I mean about Crane. I don't know. But something has to be done. I'm home, Helen. And only an hour late for dinner. Who's the girl this time? Does my being late always have to involve a woman? Being you, it always does. Your dinner's cold. And so are you, my dear. A walking refrigerator. If you divorce me, Henry, you wouldn't have to put up with it. For the hundredth time. Oh, you obviously detest me. My utter dislike for you is surpassed only by my utter delight in tormenting you. Once and for all, no. I can't take much more of you. I'm about at the end of my rope. I'll give you a little more. Maybe you'll hang yourself. <laughs> you're the most despicable man I've ever But you married me. For your money. Now you're paying for it. 
It all comes out, Helen. You always have to pay for what you get. Someday you're going to get something you haven't counted on. Look, I'm going over to Dr. Matthews at 7 o'clock to have my eyes examined. It shouldn't take longer than an hour. I'll expect you to pick me up. Why? Can't you drive? He's going to put drops in my eyes. I won't be able to see. In that case, no. You be there. As long as I have money, you'll do what I say. Good evening, Mrs. Bellinger. Uh, good evening. The doctor will be right with you. Oh, isn't he here yet? Oh, he's in the treatment room. I've never had an examination before. He won't put anything in my eyes, will he? Yes. Will it hurt? Will I be able to see? Oh, there's nothing to become alarmed about. The drops are merely to dilate your pupils so the doctor can better test your eyes. Oh, your sight may be hazy for a while, but you don't have anything... Mrs. Salinger, will you come in, please? Oh, thank you, doctor. Now, if you'll sit in this chair... Yes. Now, lean back. Please look up at the ceiling, Mrs. Salinger. That's it. There. <laughs> cold, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Now, look up. There. Uh, All uh, finished. Just close your eyes. Mm. It will only be a few minutes. Mm. I'll be back. Thank you, Doctor. Paul, are you working tonight? I want to be right across the hall if you need me. No telling what that fool crane might try. He won't try anything tonight. I know. How can you be so sure? He wouldn't dare while I'm in the office. But you have another patient. That means you'll be in the other room most of the time. Don't worry. I'm putting drops in his eyes. He's so far-sighted, he'll be practically blind. He won't even be able to find Liz. Oh, as uh, long as I'm over here, could I borrow a hypo of sodium pentothal? I've got a wisdom extraction coming in tonight. Certainly. I'll get it for you. Thanks. Here you are, Paul. Thanks, David. Liz, as soon as I get the drops in Crane's eyes, you can go home. Yes, Dr. Matthews. Good evening, I hope I haven't kept you waiting. I'll be across the hall, Liz. Ah, I see you're here to protect your, uh, uh, interests. You try one more trick like this afternoon and I'll beat you to a pulp. No, you won't. Because I dispossess you of your equipment and your office space so fast you'd be selling pencils in the street. I'm not afraid of you, Dr. Moore, because I have you right where I want you. Under my thumb. Uh, you <laughs> go to blazes. <laughs> the age-old battle of love versus career. <laughs> Shall we proceed, Dr. Matthews? I'm ashamed to even treat you. Careful, your ethics are showing. Ethics should never show. Isn't that right, Miss O'Connor? I don't know what you're talking about. You've never let them color your life. I... Don't <laughs> protest, please. I've followed your career, or rather your past, very revealing. I'm sure Mrs. Paul Moore would find it fascinating. Either you shut up and let me start the examination, or... Or what, Doctor? If someone doesn't kill you someday, it will be a miracle. Blow the other way, please. You must have had onions for dinner. Come on, Crane. Into the side room. Sit here. Now, look up. Oh. Uh, the other eye. Look up. Hey, that's cold. Sit here till I get back. Mrs. Salinger, you may open your eyes. Just lean your head back on the headrest. There. Let me take a look. I want to be sure the drops have taken effect. Mm hmm. Just sit here a while longer and look into those lenses. It's a refractor. I want you to get used to it. Now, please excuse me. Oh, of course, Doctor. Liz, you can go home now. Where are you going? Down to buy some gum. I have enough change. I'm ready to leave. Uh, don't forget to turn the sterilizer off. I won't. Good night. Good night. See you in the morning. Thanks for staying down. Matthews? Matthews, how long do I have to sit here with my eyes closed? Matthews, answer me. What's that bubbling noise? Matthews, where are you? I, I know it's you. Answer me. Where 
Good everyone. Dr. Matthews? Henry? Oh, there you are. Henry, how soon will you be finished? I've got to go over to... Henry? Oh! Henry! Oh. Liz! What, what is it? What's Liz? Oh, oh Mrs. Crane. It's Henry. He's been stabbed! <laughs> I have my key, please, Jim. Oh, oh, Mr. Kegg. Sorry, I was reading about the murder. Yes, it was a terrible thing. Mr. Kegg, I know Dr. Matthews didn't do it. I know. What makes you so sure, Jim? I go to him for glasses. He's been swell to me. Never charged me the full price because he knows I can't afford it. Mr. Kegg, he couldn't have killed Henry Crane. It seems like an open and shut case. Dr. Matthews had the motive, the opportunity, the weapon, and a flimsy excuse. Practically everybody in town had a motive for killing Crane. Nobody liked him. Oh, Mr. Kegg, you're so good at being a lawyer. Well, I don't mean exactly a lawyer. Uh, make, uh, amicus curiae? Yeah. Well, what does it mean? Well, amicus curiae, literally translated, means friend of the court. An amicus curiae works neither for the prosecution nor the defense, only in search of the truth. I cross-examine witnesses. Why aren't there more like you? <laughs> well, you see, you don't get paid for it, Jim. I'm fortunate enough that I can do this kind of work gratis. For free. Well, if you don't get paid for your work, then I can't very well ask you to... Jim, my work is done purely in the interest of justice. I'll tell you what. I'll review the facts of the case and see what can be done for your doctor friend. Quiet. Quiet, please. Your Honor... There are certain weaknesses in the evidence against Dr. Matthews. In view of his fine reputation as a doctor, I should like to enter the case as amicus curiae. Your reputation as an expert in cross-examination is well known, Mr. Kegg. We are fortunate to have you with us. You may proceed. I should like to recall Mrs. Henry Crane to the stand. Mrs. Crane, will you tell the court again precisely what occurred when you went to Dr. Matthews' office on the night of the murder? Well, I, I came in the front door of the office. Is there more than one entrance to Dr. Matthews' office? I don't know. Most doctors' offices have a rear entrance, don't they? It depends on the layout of the building. I went into the waiting room. There was no one at the reception desk where Miss O'Connor usually sits, so I called to see if there was anyone in the office. No answer. I went through the little reception room and into the hallway that leads to, well, to the treatment room. There was Henry sitting in a chair with his eyes closed. Did you notice whether the door to the, uh... Other treatment room was closed. I didn't notice that. Oh, yes, yes, it was open. Yes, it was, but it, it was very dark inside. Well, uh, Henry had his eyes closed, as I was saying. I, I started to talk to him, and then I saw the blood on his shirt front. I screamed, he's been stabbed, and Dr. Matthews and Dr. Moore came running in. How did you know your husband had been stabbed? Why, because he was bleeding down the front of his shirt. Couldn't the blood have come from another type of wound? Anyone knows the difference between a knife wound and a wound which makes a large hole at the point of entrance. You're a registered nurse, aren't you, Mrs. Crane? Before I was married, I was a trained nurse. Then you know how to administer a hypodermic. Yes. Did you know that your husband had been given a hypodermic of sodium pentothal before he was stabbed with a scalpel? I heard the coroner's report. What do you know about sodium pentothal, Mrs. Crane? It's an anesthetic that acts very quickly. You and your husband weren't getting along, were you? I don't see how my personal life has any bearing on this case against Dr. Matthews. It may have a bearing, Mrs. Crane. Look at it this way. You entered the office and found no one there but your husband with drops in his eyes, practically blind. You're a trained nurse, so you go back to the treatment room, fill a hypo with sodium pentothal, take a scalpel, inject the anesthetic, stab your husband, wipe the scalpel and hypo syringe clean, put them in the sterilizer and scream that your husband has been killed. Ridiculous! I didn't kill Henry. I may have hated him, but I didn't kill him. I'm not saying you did, Mrs. Crane. I'm just saying you could have. And I'm showing you that your personal life could have quite a bearing in such a case. That will be all, thank you. Now, wait just a minute. I'm not going to sit here and... Is there something more you would like to tell us? I, I didn't have time to kill him. Did it enter your mind? I didn't say that. Henry was dead when I got there. Thank you. That will be all. Dr. Paul Moore, please. Dr. Moore, you have testified that Henry Crane threatened to dispossess you of your expensive equipment in your office space. That's right. 
Everyone had some reason to dislike Crane. He made it his business. Do you keep office hours every night? Only when needed. Your office is right across the hall from Dr. Matthews? Yes. Did you hear anything unusual at the time of the murder? No. No, I can't say I did. I heard Dr. Matthews and Liz, uh, Miss O'Connor, leave. And then a little while later, I heard Mrs. Crane's screams. Did they leave together? Liz left by the elevator, and then right after, Dr. Matthews went down the stairs. How do you know? I was watching. Sort of peeking out your door? Well, I... When you knew the two had left, you knew Crane was alone. I knew Mrs. Selinger was in the treatment room. I'd been over earlier to b- borrow something. Anyone who knew Mrs. Selinger was there and planned to kill Crane would have made sure it was a soundless murder. Probably. Do you have an assistant when you work at night? I work alone. That rather limits you to fillings and cleanings and such, doesn't it? Yes, I don't usually do extractions. Yet Miss O'Connor testified earlier that you had borrowed a hypodermic of sodium pentothal from Dr. Matthews for an extraction that night. I meant it for the morning. Couldn't you have borrowed it in the morning? I suppose so, but as long as I was there, You just stated that you went to Dr. Matthews' office to borrow something. Wasn't the something the anesthetic? I didn't mean that. What did you mean? I don't know. That'll be all for now, Dr. Moore. I would like to recall Miss O'Connor to the stand. In your earlier testimony, Miss O'Connor, you stated that Henry Crane had made advances. He was unbearable. He seemed to enjoy frightening me. I see. Where did you go when you left the office? Home. I was quite tired. I'd had a hectic day. Do you live alone? Yes, I live in an apartment. Did anyone see you come home? I doubt it. I went right up and went to bed. No one saw you? Now think. Dr. Matthew saw me leave. And anyway, why should there have to be anyone's word besides mine? When I leave the office every day, I don't think of establishing an alibi for something Very that true. I... Mr. Connor, how long have you worked for Dr. Matthews? Four years. Do you get along as employer and employee? Dr. Matthews is one of the finest men I've ever known. He hated Crane. We all did. But I feel sure he didn't kill him. Miss O'Connor, do you realize that if Dr. Matthews didn't kill Crane, the murderer made every attempt to make it look like he did? That's true. But... But I... That'll be all, thank you. Will Dr. Matthews please take the stand? Dr. Matthews, you state that you left the office to buy chewing gum. Yes. I had onions for dinner and didn't want to offend my patient. (laughs) Is it customary to leave a patient in the treatment room? After administering drops, I had my patients sit with their eyes closed for a while. That night, neither of the patient's pupils had dilated enough, so... I left them for a while longer in the dark room. I see. Where did you go for the chewing gum? There's a little old man who runs a candy stand on the floor below. Did the man recognize you? He wasn't there. I waited a few minutes. Then I heard Mrs. Crane scream and ran back upstairs. Did anyone see you? I'm afraid not. Dr. Matthews, why didn't you kill Crane? Well, I... I I thought of it, but I... I knew I couldn't. I couldn't jeopardize my family, my profession. I... I never dreamed the insignificant act of buying chewing gum could be so important. Thank you, Dr. Matthews. Your Honor, there are many obvious aspects to this case, but I have found in my experience that with every murder there is a sound pattern, a sequence of sounds or absence of sounds that when placed in proper order must spell the truth. I ask the court to adjourn until tomorrow, at which time I shall recall a completely disinterested witness. Permission is granted. Court is adjourned until tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. Jonathan Kegg is about to call another witness. It could be you. If it were, could you remember what you have heard? It would be vital that you do, for you would hold a life in your hands. To build our strength against possible aggression we must equip our armed forces with the weapons of war. And at the same time, in order to defeat inflation, we must produce adequate supplies of civilian goods. There's only one way to meet this double challenge, and that's by turning out more goods and services for every hour we work. Remember, the better we produce, the stronger we grow. Mrs. Salinger, who was in the other treatment room when Henry Crane was murdered, has been recalled. Court has convened. Jonathan Kegg commences his cross-examination. 
Mrs. Selinger, I understand from a review of the records that you have already been called in this case. Uh, yes, Mr. Kegg, but I couldn't be of any help. What makes you so sure? Well, as you know, the, the pupils of my eyes had been dilated, and I was in a dark room sitting behind a big machine. I couldn't possibly see anything. Well, frankly, Mr. Selinger, I'm not interested in anything you could or could not have seen. Now, will you please tell the court exactly what you heard when Henry Crane died? Well, uh, I heard talking out in the reception room. Whom did you hear? Oh, uh, Miss O'Connor and, and Dr. Matthews and Dr. Moore. Uh, they were talking about Crane. I, I couldn't hear much. And then Crane came in. Did you know Mr. Crane? By then, I'd heard about him. Uh, go on, please. I heard Dr. Moore threatened to beat up on Crane. And, and Dr. Matthews said, uh, real loud, if someone doesn't kill you, it'll be a miracle. <laughs> order! Order in the court! Then what happened? Uh, then uh, Dr. Matthews took Crane back to the other treatment room and, and put drops in his eyes. Yes. And then? Well, uh, then he, uh, the doctor, uh, came into the side room and, and put a big kind of machine up to my eyes. Your Honor, I have brought an actual refractor into court. With your permission, I would like to exhibit it. You may proceed. Will you roll it over here, please? Is this what you mean by a machine? Uh, yes, that's it. Mrs. Selinger, what did you hear next? Well, the doctor excused himself, and, and I heard coins jingling in his hand. How did you know they were coins? What? Why, I heard them. But you couldn't see them. Well, no, I couldn't, but I know they were. I heard Dr. Matthews tell Miss O'Connor he was going to buy some chewing gum. And then? Well, Miss O'Connor said she was ready to leave. I heard her high heels clicking. It, it, it was real quiet. And then I heard a, a bubbling sound. Crane called out to ask what the noise was. I started to tell him that the doctor was out, but then I, I heard the jingling of coins, so I guess the doctor must have come back. Did you hear footsteps? N no, none. Had you heard Dr. Matthews' footsteps before? No, he, he was wearing rubber-soled shoes. What did you hear after that? Well, I heard this jingling some more, and, and the bubbling, and, and then a, a metal click. The jingle was real faint then. I see. Was this jingling sound constant? It was in, uh, oh, spurts, uh, uh, like the coins were in his pocket when he walked. Then the sound pattern went like this. A bubbling sound in the background, a sporadic jingle, loud, then faint, then loud, then faint, then a metallic click, and then the jingle became louder, then faded. There was silence except for bubbling. Yes, yes, th that's right. Your Honor, I would like to place the refractor up to Mrs. Selinger's eyes. I have asked each of the people involved to wear exactly what they wore on that night. With your permission, I would like each to walk by Mrs. Selinger. Also, I have brought a sterilizer, which is now boiling. Now, Mrs. Selinger, I'll bring the refractor up to your eyes. There. Now, first, I would like you to come forward. Would you please remove your shoes and walk past the witness? This is ridiculous. Thank you. You may sit down. And now, you, please. Quiet, please. There must be absolute quiet. My Phi Beta Kappa key hitting my keychain. Is that the sound you heard, Mrs. Ellinger? Mm, no, it wasn't. That'll be all, Dr. Moore. Uh, here, please. Here's some change. Will you put it in your pocket, please? And I'll just walk past Mrs. Sellinger. Now, think carefully, Mrs. Ellinger. Was that the sound you heard? Uh, well, uh, I'd like to hear it again. Of course. But first, I'd like another person to walk by. Will you please take off your shoes? Yes, Mr. Keg. Before you start, what were you wearing on the night of the murder? I had on this file suit. High heels? I always wear heels. And jewelry? Of course. I don't see what difference my appearance makes. I ask you to wear exactly what you wore that night. I am. Jewelry, too? Well, I didn't think you meant down to the exact jewelry. That night, were you wearing the earrings I saw you take off just now? I believe you put them in your purse. Oh, yes. They were hurting my ears. Will you put them on, please? Now I must ask for a complete silence in the courtroom. All right. You will be first, and you will follow.
Uh, that's it. That that last one. I'm sure. The coins. Yes, the coins. That last sound you heard was the jingling of Miss O'Connor's dangling earrings. Oh, no. After appearing to take the elevator downstairs, you, Liz O'Connor, went back into the office, passed Crane and Mrs. Sellinger, filled the hypodermic, took a scalpel, gave Crane an injection, and stabbed him. You then wiped the instruments and put them in a sterilizer. Hence, the metallic click of the lid heard by Mrs. Sellinger. You then left by the back door. Thanks to Mrs. Sellinger's testimony to her keen perception, we now know it was you who came back to the office that night. I knew all along I couldn't get away with it. But I'm not sorry, Mr. Case. I'm not sorry. (laughs) Golly, Mr. Keg, you were wonderful. Uh, How'd you get on the track of Liz O'Connor? Jim, if Matthews weren't guilty, then the jingling sound must have come from some wearing apparel. Miss O'Connor's choice of clothing is quite extreme. I imagined her jewelry was just as extreme. The testimony of Mrs. Sellinger, the innocent bystander, again proved that with such cooperation, the truth will out. Yeah, I guess you'll be checking out now, huh? Yeah, I hate to see you go. Guess your vacation was kind of ruined. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. But my stay wasn't ruined. Well, I hope I see you again soon. Goodbye, Jim. Bye, Mr. Keg. And thanks. <laughs> Life in Your Hands is created by Earl Stanley Gardner, with script by Marty Everts, directed by John Cowan. Jonathan Kegg is played by Carlton Cadell, with musical effects by Adele Scott, conducted by Whitey Berquist. Engineering by Bill Knight. This has been a partially transcribed Bell production. And this is George Stone, extending a cordial invitation for each of you to be with us again next week. This is NBC, the national broadcast. After all, if your husband is chasing a murderer, well, it it doesn't look very nice for him to have his face smeared with lipstick, now does it? Especially if it's another woman's lipstick. The National Broadcasting Company presents The Adventures of the Abbots. Starring Claudia Morgan and Les Damon as Pat and Jean Abbott, the nationally popular characters of detective fiction created by Francis Crane. Pat and Jean are brought to you each week at this time by NBC, inviting you to join them for another recorded adventure in romance and crime. And here is Jean Abbott to set the stage for tonight's puzzle in murder, a story entitled The Rickshaw Red Lipstick. <laughs> Very much against Pat's wishes, I went down to the San Francisco waterfront with him. Even though we live in the town, he usually forbids my going there. We went to a dilly of a place. It was a rough and tumble bar and cabaret for longshoremen. We'd gone there to look for an old friend of Pat's, Frank Stenson, a retired sea captain who owned the property. You see Mr. Svensson anywhere, Pat? No. I can't understand what's become of him, Gene. Last week when he phoned me, he sounded very worried. Tell the lady's fortune. Would the lady want to know the secrets that lie in the card? Uh, no, thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, Gene, darling, in case you haven't heard, fortune telling is a lot of malarkey. Oh, but that's where you're wrong, sir. If my dame will try, you shall see how accurate my predictions are. It is only one dollar. Uh, it's a fake, Jean. The whole thing is a fake. But, sir... Now, look, never mind the fortune. Just tell me something. Is Frank Swenson around? Swenson? Yes, he owns the property here. I am sorry. I've never heard of him. <gasps> oh, my darn. Very interesting. Ilona sees you have a fascinating palm. Now, if madame would what like... What do you see, Ilona? I see many handsome men. Oh, well, you do? Of course, uh, they are dim in the past. Uh, maybe you'd better skip the past, Kelowna. Uh, I should say not. Let's hear about it. I didn't know you had a lot of men in your past, dear. 
Oh, there's one in particular. A uh, continental type. Oh, there is? Oh, he was very important in your past, madame. Well, uh, <laughs> uh, just skip it, will you? A lot of this fortune-telling is uh, malarkey. Oh, it is, isn't it? Well, I'll have you know that uh, these fortune tellers are very accurate sometimes. Now, go ahead, Elona. Madame was dancing with this man, oh, some years ago. Uh, Elona, uh, maybe you'd better tell my fortune from the cards, hmm? Mm. Never mind the past? Oh, not on your life. A continental type, huh? With oil in his hair, maybe? And a little mustache? Pat, I did know a few men before I met you. But what of it? Aha! <laughs> uh-huh. This line in the palm, the love line... It turns towards this man in your past. You saw him many times, and then that one night... That will do, Alona. Thank you. That's all. The end. Cut. No, 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 no. Go on, Alona. Take a real good look at her hand, and then tell me. Uh, yes, uh, Mr... Uh... Uh, Abbott. Pat Abbott. Abbott. This is my wife, Jean. Now, tell me... Uh... Uh, yes, sir. What happened that one night with that broken-down Romeo? He was not broken down, and he was not a Romeo. Oh, well, that night, uh, the pawn tells me... That they... Thank you. Thank you, Alona. That's fine. I'm so sorry you finished. <laughs> Pay her, Pat. Oh. Pat, please. Okay, okay. Here you are, Alona. <gasps> Five dollars? Yes, it was worth it. Oh, you are so sweet. For that, Elon, I kissed you. Uh, hey, uh, mm, mm, thank uh, you, thank you. Much as gracias. Yeah, but I have suddenly uh, developed a violent dislike for that woman. Oh, well, why? I think she was very interesting. The palm is so fascinating. Wipe that lipstick off your face and stop grinning. <laughs> yeah, she couldn't help kissing me, Jean. I affect oh. women that way. I... Hey, look at my handkerchief. What color is that lipstick she has? Oh, it's a new shade, Pat. It, it, it has purple in it. That's why it looks so funny. Mm-hmm. It's called Rickshaw Red. Mm, it makes me seasick. Pat! Pat, there's a fight over at the bar. Well, sit tight, dear. Be prepared to duck. One of them's awfully young, Pat, isn't he? Looks like he's about 19. Well, he shouldn't start anything with that big fellow who's talking to me. He'll get his jaw broken. Don't worry, Gene. That kid can handle himself. Well, he doesn't look that way to me. The boy oh. here. Oh. Keep behind this table, Gene. Pat, the big fellow will kill that young boy. Pat, they have guns. Stop them. No, it's too late. Keep down, Gene. Pat. Pat, the boy killed him. He, he shot the big fellow. Oh, no, he didn't. The kid had a gun, all right, but... If you look at that big lug's body lying there in the sawdust, you'll see he didn't die of bullets. There's a knife in his back, Gene. While they were making fireworks with the guns, somebody in this place tossed a knife into that big boy on the floor. The boy, Pat, is coming over here. Please, please, help me. I, I gotta get out of here. Huh? They'll hold me for the cops. Look, I didn't kill him. Someone threw a knife. That's what killed him. I just aimed for his arm. You've got to believe me. All right, all right. Come on. <laughs> While this crowd's running around, maybe we can duck out the back door. It's this way. Please. Please help me. Stay with me. Someone's got to listen to me. Down at Pier 7, we've got to stop that boat. What boat? What's wrong? I'll tell you on the way. We can stop them if you're game. Game? Yes. You see, they're liable to kill anyone who steps on board. The young boy stood there in the smoky barroom with the crowd milling around. Blood was streaming from his mouth where the big fellow smashed him with his fist. He, he was hysterical. Pat grabbed him with one arm and me with the other. Then he practically carried us out of there past the dead body lying in the sawdust through the back door and into a cobblestone alley. As we ran toward the docks, the boy calmed down. Pier 7 is this way, Mr. Abbott. You know my name. I don't know yours. It's Lee. Lee Reynolds. Hurry, we haven't much time. All right. And what boat are you taking us? What's this all about? The boat's the Anna Marie. I signed up to sail with her last week. She leaves tonight. She's commissioned to carry food to Europe. Registered for a special United Nations cargo. All right, go on. Listen. If we're going on board, your wife better wait here. On this ship... They play for keeps. He's right, Gene. Well, if you make me stay here on dock, I'll only follow you once you've gone. 
Sorry, Lee. She's the stubborn type. Keep talking. Well, the boat's across the street here, and you... Oh, look out for that truck! Yeah. Pat, look out! Pat! Oh. Pat, are you all right? Yeah. yeah. It was awfully close, though. Oh, these dark streets. I'm surprised they don't have more accidents. That wasn't an accident. Huh? Somebody wants to keep us off that boat. What's on that ship? Well, I don't know exactly. That's why I haven't told the police. It'd take too long to convince them. By that time, they'd sail. But there's something in that hold. There must be something in the hold of that baby. Something very hot. From the minute I got on board, Mr. Abbott, everybody acted kind of screwy. The captain, the steward, everybody. And they won't let me go near the hold. By the way, who's the big fellow you got into the brawl with? He was in the crew. I told him that I knew it was a phony cargo of some kind. I threatened to talk. I'm no crook. Well, he blew his top. But I didn't kill him. My shots went wild. Whoever threw that knife killed him. All right, all right. Where'd you get the gun? In a hock shop in Chinatown. I knew I'd need one just as soon as I got mixed up in this deal. Well, you better give it to me. You'll get into more trouble with it. No. Hmm? I want to keep it. All right, Lee, you can keep it. Now, there's the ship. It's supposed to be loaded with food packages for European relief. Well, they haven't got steam up yet. We have some time anyway. All right, what's the setup, Lee? Want to sneak down into the hold? No, no, that won't work. They have it watched. I found that out. I think it'd be smarter to go right in and talk to the captain. Look, Mr. Abbott, you're a private detective. You might get an angle. And it'd fool them, too. Walking in right to the captain's quarters. <laughs> they won't suspect us. Well, that makes sense. Here's the gangway. Oh, what'll you tell the captain, Lee? Well, I... I'll say you're friends of mine. Visiting. I wish you'd go home, Mrs. Abbott. I don't think this is going to be a very pleasant visit. I wish you'd be quiet, Mr. Abbott. I wouldn't go home now for anything in the world. There are the captain's quarters. Come in. Excuse me, Captain. What is it, Lee? This is Mr. and Mrs. Abbott, friends of mine. I, I, I invited them on board for a visit. I thought I made it clear to you that we don't allow any visitors. Oh, Captain, I, I've heard a skipper is usually very proud of his boat. You've a wonderful ship here. Never mind the charm, Mrs. Abbott. I'd appreciate it if you and your husband would get off the boat. You have a cargo of food for Europe, they tell me, Captain. Do they? Yes, Lee was telling me how glad he was to be on an assignment like this. You talk too much, Lee. You talk about everything but yourself. Did he tell you he's a jailbird? Uh, no, he didn't. Well, you should be more careful of the friends you select, Mr. Abbott. Now, if you leave... I told you I won't stand for no visitors. Or shall I have the crew escort you off? Okay, Captain. Coming, Jean. Lee. Oh, uh, thanks for your hospitality, Captain. Get off this ship! The deck's this way. You want to sneak into the hole now, Mr. Abbott? Uh, no, not now, Lee. I have another problem on my mind. I'm going back to that bar. To the bar, Pat? Yes, I want to know what became of Spencer. Who's he? A friend of mine. He owned the property where the bar is. Well, what's that got to do with this boat? Plenty. They're working some kind of a racket on this ship. They need a headquarters, a spot near the water. And Svensson, who owned that bar just a block or so from here, has disappeared. Now, that's interesting. I'm going back there and play hide-and-seek. Now, you wait here, Lee. But... You come with me, Jean. But the ship, it'll sail. And if we could get down into the hole and find out what they've got there, we might be able to stop them. Well, we'll have to take that chance. Now, you stay on board, Lee. When I come back, I'll stand in the dark and whistle. Like this. You got it? Right. And I'll whistle the same thing back to you. That means it's okay to come on board. Good luck, Mr. Abbott. Bye, Lee. Careful, Jean. Watch the gangway going down. Uh -huh. Pat. Hmm? Do you trust Lee? Why do you say that? Well, he insisted on keeping his gun. And the captain said he was a jailbird. Might mean something, yes. How about the captain himself? Oh, we can't do anything until we find Svensson, darling. He'll clear this up, if he's alive. We 
we sneaked back through the dark streets. This time, Pat was doubly careful for trucks or any other fake accident. Then, in the bar... A waiter came over to us. All right, what do you have? Just a beer, thanks. Uh, nothing for me. Okay, one beer. Uh, just a minute, chum. Mm-hmm. Seen Frank Svensson around? I never heard of him. I'm anxious to know where Svensson is. It'll be worth a lot to me. Uh-uh. Sorry, bud. Might be worth ten bucks. No dice, pal. Twenty? Look, I got a bad memory. It takes plenty to get it working. All right, how's fifty? Uh, where is he? Right here. Now, where's Svensson? Yeah, that I don't know. But I can tell you this. I went walking with Swenson the other night. Down by 23rd and Canal. It was very dark and somebody walloped me over the head. Yeah. I didn't see who it was. I went out cold. When I come to, Swenson was gone. I ain't seen him since. And the uh, new head waiter here told me to stop asking about him if I didn't want to get my head handed to me. Oh, well, thanks. Now, look, I'm uh, telling you this because I like the guy, you understand? It ain't the door, no. I'm the sentimental type. Yeah, sure. Yeah, there's one more question. Yeah? Where's the telephone? Yeah, by the front door. To the left, you see it? Okay. Well, who are you going to call, Pat? The harbor police. What? I want to invite them to go fishing. Oh, Pat, stop clowning. I'm serious, Gene. I want them to come fishing with me for a corpse. In just a moment, act two of tonight's mystery, The Rickshaw Red Lipstick. What do you know about your government? What, for example, do you know about the work of the Interstate Commerce Commission? Some 75 years ago, there were approximately 150 different time zones in our country, each of which was set up regionally. In order to erase such confusion, the Interstate Commerce Commission was established. It divided the country into four standard time zones, so that railroads, planes, buses, and the mail could run on a uniform schedule. The Interstate Commerce Commission also makes rules and regulations for all forms of interstate transportation. It makes certain that railroads, truck lines, barges, and boats are operated safely, charge reasonable rates, and give dependable service. Yes, when it comes to the regulation of national time and the protection of national travel, the Interstate Commerce Commission is always at the service of the American people. That's how your government works. And now for Act Two of The Adventures of the Abbots, the rickshaw red lipstick. At Pat's request, the harbor police met him at 23rd and Canal with dredging equipment. Their spotlights searched the water while Pat and I stood on a police boat, idling at the wharf, watching. I hope my hunch was right. It's got to be right. They haven't found a thing, Pat. Well, they will, Gene. Just be patient. Well, that does it. There he is. That... That... That, that body in the net? That's Benson, Gene. Not very presentable, is he? Oh, it's horrible. After dead body's been in the water for some time, it's not a pretty picture. Say, boys, could you put him down over here? I don't want to break up your routine. I just want to get a quick look at him. Oh. You take a look, Pat. I've seen enough. It's all right, darling. Turn around. Don't look. Now, thanks, boys. That's okay. I just want to give my old friend Spencer the once over. Well, looks like he got the usual treatment. Somebody broke his neck. And put big rocks in his pockets and tossed them into the drink. Well, this is interesting, these papers. Tell me what you found, Pat. Oh, uh, there are letters here, Gene, unsigned. Telling Spencer he'd better sell his property or else. At least that's about all I can read. They're soaked. Now, come on, I've got another phone call to make. Who is it this time? Will you stop talking in riddles? I'm going to call the license bureau. I want to know who owns that bar now. Who took it over from Spencer? 
sure it's hot here, isn't it? Take my handkerchief, darling, and wipe your brow. No, thanks. I've got my own. Ah, that's better. Oh. Yes, Jean, I'm going to phone and ask who owns the bar. Got any theories about who it is? Lee or the captain? I think I know who it is, Jean. Thanks to the fact that it's very warm tonight. As usual, my strong, silent husband wouldn't tell me another thing. I begged, I wheedled, I threatened. But it didn't do any good. He wouldn't tell me why the warm weather gave him a tip about who was behind all this. The bureau told him the name of the owner of the bar over the telephone. Of course, he wouldn't tell me that either. He was in one of his reticent moods. Then we stole back to the dock, to Pier 7. It was pitch black. The boat was silhouetted against an enormous yellow moon. The ship seemed deserted. Pat stood on the dock and gave the signal he'd agreed upon with Lee. Well, here goes, Jean. I hope Lee is all right. I'm going on board. Well, if you think you're going alone, chum, you... Easy. Let's get up this gangway. see anything. No, not much. Moon is bright, but it's awfully dark here. Look, the number three hole door is open. I'm going to jump in. You stay here and tell me if you hear anyone coming. All right, but be careful, Pat. I will. Here goes. What's in there, Pat? Boxes. Food. Marked by the UN Relief Board. They all look like... Wait, I gotta light a match. I can see better. They're all boxes. Wait a minute, I'll open one. What's inside? Hey. Hurry, Pat, tell me. Tell me. This box had a red mark on the outside. Some of the others didn't. You know what's in the box? Darling, what? For goodness sake, stop stalling. But what's in that one? Fountain pens and lipstick. You get it, Jean? They're smuggling stuff into Europe, hidden under the food. Fountain pens, lipsticks. American cigarettes in this one. We have half the boxes in this hold are loaded this way. They could make a fortune in Europe. Do you know what this stuff is worth over there? They've got those color code marks on about every third box. The new customs wouldn't inspect every single one. Especially if they had a UN stamp on them. Which they probably faked. Come on, Pat. We'll get the harbor police of all the rackets. No, don't go, Jean. Well, why not? Because if we yell now, we'll never find out who is back of this. But, Pat, you can't just... Shh. Huh? Someone's coming. Can you see who it is? Uh, it's the captain. Good. I'm coming back on deck. Okay. Now duck behind this barrel with me. Well, what are you going to do? Take a shot at the captain. I borrowed this 38 from the harbor police. Pat, are you crazy? You're going to shoot the captain in cold blood? Just, just like that? You'll see. Squat down here with me and don't make a sound. What the devil? Here. Who's there? Who's there? He's gone, Pat. To the other end of the deck. It's fine. Now the next step. You missed, Pat. I'm ashamed of you. You wanted to wing him, didn't you? No, no, I wanted to miss. Can you see what he's doing now? Uh, just his silhouette. He's, he's gone into his cabin, I think. And well, that's just where I'm going. Captain and I are going to have a little chat, Jean, about murder. Good evening, Captain. Well, Abbott, what are you doing here? I thought I told you... You were a bit rude during our last visit, Captain, but I don't think you should die for it. Me? Die? Yes, we learned a lot about you, Captain, but you don't know much about me. I'm a private detective. 
As I came up the gangplank just now, I heard a pistol shot. Shall I tell you what it was? What do you know, Abbott? I know all about the little smuggling deal that's going on. I know that whoever the head of the ring is just took a shot at you. Ah, you're out of your mind. A member of your crew was killed tonight in a bar near this dock. Frank Svensson was killed, too, because he wouldn't sell the property where the bar is located. The head of this outfit, Captain, tossed a knife into that seaman and also did away with Svensson. Now you're next. Go on. You're next because the boss has decided to take all the dough and leave you out. Does that sound like I'm out of my mind? If it does, take a look at the sleeve of your coat where the bullet grazed it. They won't miss next time, Captain. We know a lot of odd stories, don't we? Now, you've got a chance to get off easy. Maybe turn state's evidence. Maybe get out of the rap for murder. You're in it now, Captain. You had knowledge of the crimes. You're an accomplice. How do I know you're on the level yourself? Don't you worry about me. Just take my advice. Get to the boss and straighten yourself out. If you don't get to the boss very fast, you're a dead duck. I told you the fireworks were just beginning, didn't I? All right. You wait here. I'll settle this, so help me, I'll settle it. If that dirty crook is trying to get rid of me, I'll... I'll... Where's he going, Pat? He's going to speak to the boss. My little trick worked. Oh? Come on, Jean, let's follow him. He's going up to the bridge, see? The boss must be up there. Easy now. Let him go up alone. In a second, you'll see who's been running this setup. Let him go up the stairs. That's it. Now, we wait here and listen. Well, if I stand on tiptoe, I can see who he's talking to. Well, go ahead, then. It's a loan of the fortune teller. Right, Pat. But but how did you know? Shh. I'll tell you later. Just listen to them. Yes, you tried to bump me off just now, didn't you? You're standing here giving me the applesauce about how everything is great. Then when I walk away from me, you start taking pot shots at me, you rock. I did not shoot at you. Now shut up and get this boat out of here. They are waiting for the stuff in Lisbon. This boat ain't gone anywhere. Not yet, it ain't. I'm no sucker. You think I'm going to turn my back again and give you another chance to get me out of the way? You got a habit of knocking people off, Alona. You threw Swenson into the river, didn't you? I got rid of Swenson because he was in my way. I like things to go smoothly, Captain. But since you have decided to shoot your mouth off, I am sorry... Put down that knife! Don't throw that knife! Oh! My arm! Sorry, I had to use this 38 to stop you, Alona. Oh, good. I wasn't sure how good you were with a knife. You missed Lee at the bar tonight and killed that crewman by mistake. I wouldn't have minded especially if you'd hit the captain here, but uh, you might have missed again and hit me or my wife. You know, Jean, I believe. Oh, don't bother introducing us, Pat. Uh, we've Mr. met... Mr. Rabbit, Mr. Rabbit! Yes, well, you can oh. relax now, Lee. You seem to have cleared things up a bit. Where were you? Well, I... I got frightened waiting out there on deck. I, I went to look for you. I see. Now, let's go, Alona. You too, Captain. All right. Oh, Alona, uh, I wanted to thank you. Thank me? For what? For telling my wife's fortune. But tell me about that second-hand Charles Boyer she was in love with. He was not second-hand, and he was not like Charles Boyer. He took me driving a few times, and then one night... We... <clears throat> oh, it's awfully hot tonight, isn't it? Pat, darling. Mm. Before you go to sleep, tell me something. Right. Well, when they found Svensson's body in the river, you said you knew who was the head of the ring. You said you knew it because it was warm tonight. <laughs> what did you mean? Well, it was warm, and I was perspiring, and you offered me your handkerchief. But I used mine instead, remember? And when I did, I saw lipstick on it. Rickshaw red lipstick. From the time Alona kissed me after I gave her that $5 tip. Now, that rang the bell. The lipsticks placed... And the cases on the ship were rickshaw red. And who was the only person in the whole picture we'd forgotten about? Alona. Of course, I wasn't sure, but then I called headquarters and asked for the name of the new owner of Svensson's Bar, and, well, that confirmed it. So, you see, lipstick does have great value. Well, Alona should have worn the kiss-proof kind, like mine. Oh, is your lipstick kiss-proof? Mm-hmm. Really kiss-proof? <laughs> Doesn't any of it come off when you kiss me? It's guaranteed. Hmm. Jean, darling. Yes, Pat. Let's try it and see. Hmm. Oh, there. 
convinced now? No, no, that isn't scientific. Any scientist will tell you the test isn't valid unless it's tried at least a hundred times. Oh, oh, but that would take all night. <laughs> would, wouldn't it? National Broadcasting Company has presented The Adventures of the Abbots, starring Claudia Morgan and Les Damon as those nationally popular personalities of detective fiction, Pat and Jean Abbott, created by Francis Crane. The cast included Everett Sloan, Lottie Stavisky, and Bob Hastings. The Adventures of the Abbots was written by Howard Merrill, original music composed and conducted by Dewey Bergman, produced by Ted Lloyd and Bernard L. Schubert, directed and recorded by Harry Frazee. Next week, same time, same station, another exciting adventure in crime with Pat and Jean in The Adventures of the Abbots. This is Wayne Howell speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Something in the air? Mmm, you bet. Excitement. Because four exciting new shows go on the air tonight, starting right now. ABC brings out its first Monday night surprise package, labeled Dashiell Hammett's Fat Man. The Fat Man is the stalwart detective whose huge size doesn't slow up his progress a bit when it comes to sleuthing. And speaking of detectives, you'll want to meet hard-talking Ross Dolan, played by William Gargan. His business is crime. In his words, I deal in crime, and he follows in half an hour. And then the dean of music makers, Paul Whiteman, and his new show, Forever Tops, the top tunes that will live forever. Paul Whiteman plays them on Forever Tops. And did you know that your top stage and screen laugh favorites, Jimmy and Lucille Gleason, have opened a diner? What a diner. You see, that's what we meant when we said excitement in and on the air tonight and every Monday night on ABC. Right now... Let's take a trip into adventure with Dashiell Hammett's Fat Man. Wait, 247. Fortune, danger. Who is it? The Fat Man. American Broadcasting Company brings you Dashiell Hammett's latest and most fascinating character, The Fat Man. The hard-boiled, hard-hitting adventures of a criminologist who tips the scale at 247 pounds. Tonight's adventure, The 19th Pearl. And now, here is The Fat Man. One of the worst things about being fat is feeling thin. That extra load you carry around is something you never think about till you bump into a full-length mirror 
or drop a penny into a drugstore scale, even then you don't feel fat. The only time you really feel it is when you run into a beautiful woman. That's when the old collar kind of chokes you and your hands look big and your legs are hard to cross. That's when you're glad you've got a busy job like mine. Solving crimes. This one began in Grand Central Station, right near the information center. My mother was going away for a weekend. I was there to put her on the train. You don't have to wait around till the gates open, son. I've gotten on trains before. It's all right, Ma. It's a free night for me anyway. Want some peanuts? <laughs> for heaven's sake, no. I do. Be right back. Bag peanuts, Jenny. All right. Better make it two. Here you are. Okay. Oh. Sorry, sister. I didn't mean to bump into you. It's all right. I uh, I wasn't looking where... Please. Will you do me a favor? Hmm? It's terribly important. Here. Hold this bag for me. Oh, quick, he's coming. Who? Uh, don't let him see me. You mustn't know I'm here. Well, why not? What have you done? Nothing. I... Stand in front of me, will you? Uh, quick. Put your arms around me as if you were kissing me goodbye. Say, what kind of a game is this? Please, cover my face and kiss me. Okay, sister. How's this? Hold it. Oh. How long? Oh, no. No, don't stop. Just keep your arms around me. As long as you say, baby. You know, I've heard about things like this, but I never figured it would happen to a guy like me. All right. That's enough. I wish I thought so. We ought to do this more often. I'll have to run now. He's gone. Maybe you'll be back. Oh, no. No. I mustn't miss the train. Thanks ever so much for helping me. Hey, wait a minute. Aren't you going to tell no, me? No, there isn't time. But I don't even know. Okay, sister. Two ships that pass in the night. Well, that was a fond farewell. Who was it, dear? I don't know. What? Never saw her before in my life. Is that why you were kissing her? Uh, don't make a romance out of it, Ma. <laughs> she just borrowed me for a quick hug, and that's all there was to it. Well, I don't know that it's wise to kiss strange women in station, son. Have you still got your watch? I've got more than my watch, Ma. I've still got her bag. <laughs> But how do you know she's on this train, dear? I saw her duck into the car ahead. Well, leave the bag with me. I'll give it to her as soon as we pull out of the station. Are you kidding? Oh! Son, we're going to start in a moment. It's all right. I'll ride up to 125th Street. Just to give her back her bag? That's a good enough reason. Well, be sure you get off at 125th Street. Oh, we're moving. Okay, Ma. I'll take the bag up to her now. I... Hey. What's the matter? That dame's on the platform. I'm getting off. Careful, son. Watch your step. Sure, sure. See you later. Bye. Good evening, beautiful. Oh. oh, you frightened me. I didn't the last time. You want to play some more? I don't think so. Well, don't go away. I still got your bag. Oh. Oh, thank you. What's this all about, kid? Who'd you knock off? I beg your pardon. Well, you must have done something. Otherwise, you wouldn't be running away. Why not? Can't I be running away from danger? There's a man following me. The guy on that train? How did you know he was on it? Simple arithmetic. You got on to give him the slip. He must have followed you. Otherwise, you wouldn't have got off. That's exactly what happened. What else happened? I... I don't know what you mean. Come on, kid. Tell me the truth or I won't help you. I don't know that I want you to help me. Okay, sister. I'll walk right out of the picture. Uh, no. Uh, no, wait. Changed your mind? No. A man who's been following me changed it. Huh? He's standing right over there on the platform. <laughs> You'll be safe here, Miss Evans. Mm. Is this your office? Yeah. Step in. Thank you. Sit down. Make yourself at home. Every chair in this place is comfortable. 
Have you sampled them all? Every one. There's one thing I hate, it's sitting on hard wood. Uh, have an apple, Miss Evans? Uh, no thanks. Mmm. Awful good. <sighs> no thanks. Well, tell me now, how long has this guy been following you? About three days. And you don't know who he is? Or what he's after? No. What do you do for a living, Miss Evans? I, um, I'm an actress. On the stage? When I'm working. Maybe I've seen you. Not in New York. I uh, haven't done anything here yet. Mm, rich daddy? No. No daddy at all. Then what keeps you in those gorgeous clothes? I have a private income. My father left me some money. Those beautiful pearls, too? <laughs> oh, uh, these aren't real. Aren't they? Let me see them. Don't you believe me? No. Why not? Because you're not a very good liar. What? Even experienced ones take a deep breath after every lie they tell. But you've been pumping away like an iron lung. How dare you talk to me like that? Get out of here, Miss Evans. I won't take your case. You won't get it, you insufferable man. Keep going, keep going. What? Keep yelling at me. There's someone outside the door. Oh, oh, you overbearing, conceited pig. If I were a man, I'd give you the beating of your life. That's enough. Well, what are you doing out here, mister? Nothing. I was just... Hey, come back here, you. You son of a gun, I'll make it much harder for you when I catch you. You gonna stop, you punk, or do I have to die for you? Uh, oh, you big ape. I'm not as slow as I look. Well, you didn't have to tackle me. I'm sorry, old man. It's my old football training. Can you get up? I don't know. There you are. Now, maybe you'll tell me what you were doing outside my door. I was keeping an eye on Miss Evans. Hmm, that's an interesting pastime. Come on back to the office and tell us why. It's my job. I'm a private detective. Well, well. Who hired you? Mrs. Stanton. Mrs. Jeffrey Stanton. The banker's wife? Yes. She wants a record of every move Miss Evans makes. Why? That's my business. Well, maybe Miss Evans has an interest in it. Miss Evans! Miss Evans, where are you? What's the matter? She's gone. gentleman to see you, Mrs. Stanton. Who is it, Carl? He refused to give me his card, madam. He simply said the fat man is calling. Fat man? What do you suppose he wants? Some information, Mrs. Stanton. Good heavens. What do you mean by coming in here unannounced? But I was announced. I'm the fat man. Well, I've never had the pleasure of meeting you, and I certainly don't intend to do so now. Show him out, Carl. I don't think Carl is man enough, Mrs. Stanton. You'd better let me stay. What do you want? Some information about Miss Evans. I couldn't get a thing out of that clam you had following her. What clam? What are you talking about? Shall I call the police, Mrs. Stanton? No. No, I can manage this call. Very well, madam. Now then, what were you saying, Mr... Uh, I don't believe you mentioned the name. I didn't. People remember me better as the fat man. Oh... Oh, I know who you are now. Mr. Parker told me about you. Parker? The man you very nearly killed in the hall outside your office. He said you fell on him like a ton of bricks. He had no right listening outside my door. Did you really hire him to follow Miss Evans? I did. May I ask why? You shouldn't have to. I thought everybody knew I was anxious to divorce my husband. Miss Evans is just one of the grounds. One? The only one I'll need. You see, Mr. Stanton made the mistake of giving her a necklace. What? Quite an expensive one, in fact. Matched pearls. Oh, I see. You seem disappointed. In Mr. Stanton? No, in Miss Evans. You're not a friend of hers, I hope. Are you sure he gave her that necklace, Mrs. Stanton? Well, I believe it was a gift. I've never inquired. I don't really care to know how these arrangements are worked out. In other words, your husband and Miss Evans... Let's not put it into words, if you don't mind. There'll be enough of that when the case comes up in court. When the case comes up, Mrs. Stanton, you'll have to prove it. And right now, your star witness, Miss Evans, is missing. 
Oh, not really missing. Unless something's happened to her. What? I don't know. Frankly, I don't really care. Park will find her sooner or later. Where? Probably at my husband's apartment. Oh. Doesn't he live here? No. Not regularly. Well, after meeting you, Mrs. Stanton, I can't say I blame him. Mr. Stanton in? Yeah, he's in. O'Hara, what are you doing here, Captain? Come on in. I'm waiting for the medical examiner. Oh. Who's dead? Who do you think? Stanton lived here all alone. He might have had company. He did, a little earlier. There's a knife in his chest. Who put it there? I don't know. The murderer didn't leave his card. Well, let's see the body. He might as well. Where is it? Right over there in the corner. And leave those chocolate-covered almonds alone place hasn't been gone over yet. When did all this happen? I don't know yet. I just got here a few minutes ago. And the body was right where it is now? I'm sure it hasn't moved. Hmm. It's funny, isn't it? What? How a guy gets stabbed in the chest without putting up any kind of a fight. No sign of a struggle around here. So what? Nothing. I just don't like it, that's all. Why not? Because the usual place for a knife is in the back. The chest, you see it coming. You've got a chance to protect yourself. Not if you trust the person that's coming at you. Not if she's your sweetheart or something like that. Then you don't see the knife till it's too late. What makes you think it's his sweetheart? I don't. I don't even know if the man had one. Well, then stop putting a noose around her neck. Whose noose? What are you driving at? Nothing. Nothing. I, I just don't like your theory, O'Hara. Well, it's apparent he was killed by somebody he trusted. If it wasn't his sweetheart, then... Will you stop mentioning his sweetheart? Why? Is she a friend of yours or something? Don't be funny. Well, what are you mad at? What's seating you tonight? Your theories. Stanton could have been sitting in that chair when he was killed. The murderer could have moved the body to throw us off the track. I doubt it. The murderer didn't even have time to cover up the one clue that's going to convict him. What's that? A piece of string in the dead man's hand. You see how Stanton is holding on to it? String? Looks more like a strong silk thread. Probably something he tore from the murderer's clothing just before the knife went into his heart. You don't tear single threads from a person's clothing, O'Hara? Then what is it? I don't know. Let's open his hand and see. Wait a minute. We don't have to open it. I can see something between the fingers. What is it? A pearl. Miss Evans. Miss Evans, if you're in your room, for the love of Mike, open up. Who is it? The fat man. Alone? Yes, open up, will you? Well, what's wrong? Plenty. I've got to talk to you like a Dutch uncle. Oh, wait a minute. You can't come in. Shut up. Uh... You're in trouble, kid. I'm going to find out just how much. Where did you disappear to when I went after that guy that was following you? I uh, ran down the stairs. Why? That's what I want to know. Why? To get away from him, of course. I knew you wouldn't let him follow me. I wish I had. Where did you go? Home. That's a lie. I've been calling up here all night. Well, uh, I stopped off for a bite to eat. Where? At Mr. Stanton's apartment? What? I don't know what you're talking about. Come on, baby. Tell me the truth. I know half of it now. And I want the other half or I'll call in the cops. What have I done that's wrong? Lots of things. Most of them aren't my business. But murder is. Murder? You heard me. Don't stand there looking from one of my eyes to the other. Even a lousy actress can look innocent. She's beautiful enough. Uh, why do you keep saying I'm beautiful? Because you are. And if I weren't a man and a half, I'd take you in my arms and... And what? Never mind. Go ahead. Do it. Are you kidding? Do it. I want you to kiss me, darling. My name isn't darling. You never told me what it was. What can I call you? Nothing. Well, you've got to believe me, darling. You've got to trust me. Why? Because I trust you. Will you uh, kiss me now? Yes. Yeah. Uh, oh. <laughs> 
You're awfully sweet when you want to be. Who gave you that necklace you were wearing? What? Who gave it to you? Why aren't you wearing it now? I just took it off. Where is it? Don't you believe me? Where is it? I want to see it. I've got it. Where? Right here on my dress. Are you satisfied? Not yet. Is this the necklace you were wearing in my office? How many of these trinkets do you think I have? How do I know? There must be more where this came from. Who gave it to you? Mr. Stanton. Why didn't you tell me that before? Because it was none of your business. Well, that's a good answer. Is it my business now? If you want it to be. How do you want it to be, Miss Evans? I want it to be Kathy, not Miss Evans. Okay, Kathy. I'll take your case. Have I got one? You will have. The cops will be swarming all over this place by tomorrow morning. Why? Don't worry. Everything will be all right. You didn't feel that way when you came in. When I came in, I never expected to find this string of pearls. Not in one piece, anyway. You mind if I take them? What for? I thought you trusted me. You still haven't answered my question. I need these pearls to make your alibi stand up, Kathy. Don't forget, I'm working for you, but the police aren't. Sure, these pearls were bought here, Mr. Werner? Quite sure. I matched them for Mr. Stanton myself. Uh, no chance of a duplicate set looking exactly like these. Very unlikely. Pearls are almost as individual as people. That's why they're so hard to match. I see. Uh, this is your clasp, of course. Oh, yes, it was made here. And the string? Oh, the string might be anybody's. There's nothing distinctive about a string. But the pearls are distinctive. Quite. Uh, why did Mr. Stanton rearrange them? You mean they're not in the right order? Oh, the order is correct. But, uh, I only counted 18. What? The big one in the center is missing. Hello. Hello, Kathy. Oh, yes. This is the fat man. Do you want to swing for the murder of Mr. Stanton? No. Then do what I tell you. But I didn't kill him. Then why didn't you tell me you, you knew he was dead, you two-faced... No. Shut up. I know you were in Stanton's apartment tonight. You had to be, or you wouldn't have had that necklace back. I don't know what you mean. Don't play dumb with me. You picked those pearls up off the floor and strung them together again. All except one. What? You stupid little fool. You left the most important one in the dead man's hand. Oh, no. Now, this is your last chance, Kathy. Meet me in my office in 15 minutes or I go to the police. But I... Be there. Yes? It's me, Kathy. Come in. What? Mr. Parker, what are you doing here? Waiting for you. The fat man sent for me. Where is he? He'll be back. He stepped out for a few minutes. Oh? Come on in. Don't be afraid. Well, I... Come on. Uh... The fat man wants me to show you something. What? Look over there on top of the desk. See it? What is it? A pearl. The largest one of a set. And what's it doing here? That's the fat man's business. He just wanted me to show it to you. Recognize it? I, uh, don't know very much about pearls. Then you wouldn't be interested in buying it. Not from you. Who told you it was for sale? The fat man. He offered it to me for... Uh, what's the matter? Shh. There's a microphone hidden in this bowl of fruit. The fat man must be interested in your reactions. Where do the uh, wires go? Over here, to the window and down the side of the building. He must be listening in another office. Well, he won't listen anymore. Don't do that, you fool. Put that microphone down. Why? Because he'll know you smashed it. Do you want to get... Where's that pearl, Miss Evans? I beg your pardon. 
That pearl. You took it off the desk while I was at the window. Oh, you're mistaken. I haven't been near the desk. Come on. Give it to me or I'll search you for it. Let go of me. Not until you put that pearl back. Open your hand. No, Open I won't. it, I said. Oh. The fat man will kill me if you get away oh. with this. Oh. Come back here, you little devil. Not on your life. Just a moment, Miss Evans. Mrs. Stanton. Yes. I'll take that pearl, please. Oh. Look out. She's got a gun. Stay where you are, young lady. No, you can't make me. Stop. Oh. I told you to stop. You're wanted by the police for the murder of my husband. Get in the cab, Miss Evans. Where are you taking me? Get in. I'll watch you, Mrs. Stanton. Thank you, Mr. Parker. All right, driver. Hurry. Police headquarters. Right. Why don't you start? Gotta wait for the light to change, lady. You gotta wait for me, too. The fat man. Surprise. How do you feel, Kathy? Why, I'm all right. You better have somebody look at that shoulder. Franklin Hospital, driver. Make it snappy. Okay. Just a moment. We're taking her to police headquarters. With a fresh wound in her shoulder? She needs medical attention. But I said... Franklin Hospital, driver, and don't spare the horses. she, Doc? Oh, she'll be all right. Bullet just grazed her shoulder. You're very lucky, Miss Evans. You mean you're very lucky? Don't you know it's against the law to go around shooting people? I couldn't let her get away with that pearl, could I? Why not? That isn't the one they found in your husband's hand. That's just a hunk of paste. But you told us all to come to your office so you could trap the one who tried to steal it. How did you know that? It was obvious. That's no excuse for shooting at him, Mrs. Stanton. Oh, I didn't really shoot. I tried to frighten her more than anything else. Well, in any case, I'll have to make a report to the police. Will you come with me, Mrs. Stanton? Certainly. You're a dead pigeon, Kathy. What do you mean? Even a bald-headed jury won't save you on this one. But I didn't kill him. I think you did. What's your vote, Parker? I won't say until I've heard all the facts. But you know all the facts. Didn't you follow her to Stanton's apartment late this afternoon? Yes, I did. Well, how long was she there? About 20 minutes. And she went right to the railroad station as soon as she left his apartment. But I didn't kill him. He was dead when I got there. Then why did you pick up the pearls and string them together again? Because I knew I was being framed. Somebody put that necklace in Mr. Stanton's hand. Mm, that's a good one. It's true. I didn't have the pearls when I went to his apartment. What? It was stolen from me this morning. Can you prove that? No. Can you prove it to me, Kathy? I don't know. Look at me. I'm looking. I didn't kill Mr. Stanton. I swear I didn't. That's not good enough, Kathy. But I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll help you get out of here. What? I'll give you a head start on the police. Don't be a fool. Mind your own business, Parker. This is my business. If she killed Stanton... Go on. Give her a break, will you? No. I'm just as responsible as you are. You can't make me a party to this. Then turn your back on it. You're crazy. It's a felony to assist a criminal. I'm going to call the police. Get away from that phone. For heaven's sake, use your head. They'll catch her anyway. Get away from that phone, I said. No, don't. Don't I... I can't run away. It'll only make it look worse. Why, of course. The sooner we call the police, the better. Hello? Hello. Get me the police department, please. Yes, sir. You're not going to make that call, Parker. What? You're not going to make that call if I have to pick up one of these knives and jab it into your ribs. Yeah, put that down. Put that down, you fool. Now, you see, Parker? Even on short notice, a man reaches out for the murderer's hand, the hand with the knife. What? Don't you understand? When a man comes at you with a knife, you reach for his hand, not for his throat. What are you talking about? Stanton. He couldn't have torn those pearls off Kathy's neck. If she came at him with a knife, he'd have grabbed for her hand the way you grabbed mine. You mean she was framed? You guessed it. She was framed by a guy who knew every move she made. A guy who knew when he could steal that necklace and plant it in Stanton's hand at the most effective time. Who fits that description, Parker? Who knew every move Kathy made these last three days? Well, why are you looking at me? Because you're it. 
You wanted Stanton out of the way so you and Mrs. Stanton could get married and live on Stanton's dough. You're no private detective. I found that out five minutes after I met you. Drop that knife and stay where you are. I've got a gun. Look out, Kathy. You may use it. I will if you don't get out of my way. Hello? That phone's open, Parker. You're giving the police your whole confession. What? This... Oh! Hello? Hello? Take it easy, Captain. I'm bringing in a murderer. Stanton were just good friends, hmm, Kathy? Mm-hmm, that's right. Hmm, must have thought an awful lot of his friends to give them pearl necklaces. Well, uh, I know you won't believe it, but he was like that. He once gave a surgeon a brand new car just for operating on his hand. What did, uh, you do for the old boy? I went out with him, let him take me to shows and things. Well, here's where I get off. Am I home already? This is it. Night, Kathy. Oh, wait a minute. Am I ever going to see you again? I don't know. Why not? Don't you like me? Sure. I like all beautiful women. The trouble is, I fall in love with them. <laughs> and what's wrong with that? Having to fall out? So long, Kathy. Remember... Nobody loves a fat man. Listen again next week at the same time when the American Broadcasting Company brings you another adventure of Dashiell Hammett's exciting new character, The Fat Man. Next week's story is called The Unfamiliar Face. And as the fat man says... Know a man's face and you know the man behind it. Line for line it tells the story of his life. From the women he's known to the crimes he's committed. Tonight's adventure of The Fat Man, played by J. Scott Smart, was directed by Robert Sloan. Bernard Green composed and conducted the original music. Hold on to your nerves. Next comes a guy who keeps busy chasing fugitives and frails. It's William Gargan as private detective Ross Dolan, shooting his way through the mystery thriller, I Deal in Crime. This is the American Broadcast. The Adventures of Father Brown. And here he is, Father Brown, the best-loved detective of them all. Humanity produces optimists only because it has never produced a really happy man. Masterful and exciting pages of G.K. Chesterton comes that fascinating human being, Father Brown, played by Carl Swenson. <laughs> Underneath the modest exterior of Father Brown is the rich character of a generous, deeply human man with a sensitive and quick-witted mind. In addition to being a man of God, he is a man of the world, a man of science, and a brilliant amateur detective. And now... The Three Tools of Death. Facing the afterglow of a beautiful summer sunset, Father Brown sits alone in the study of his modest parish house. He is half dozing when Nora, his housekeeper, enters. Father Brown. Mm. Father Brown. No. <clears throat> yes, Nora. <clears throat> what, what time is it? Time for your tea. Here it is, nice and hot. Ah, thank you. I'll just set it there, please. Were you asleep? Oh, I was in between, Nora, just in between. A beautiful state of being, I assure you. Half out of this world and half in. 
It's a good thing young Father Peter took over your duties for a day. I told him... There's somebody at the door. Don't worry. I'll take care of that. Oh, good evening, Nora. Is Father Brown in? I'm sorry, Flambeau, but he's rested. No, no, Nora. You you know Flambeau's always welcome. Tell him to come in. Oh, all right. Come in, come in, Flambeau. Have a cup of tea. Uh, no, thanks, Father. I'm all upset. A friend of mine is in trouble. Oh. Will you come with me to Oakville? My car's outside. Here, here. No, not so fast. Get your breath. Sit down. <sighs> Father... You've heard of Aaron Armstrong, the philanthropist and lecturer? Yeah. Oh, Armstrong. The author of those bestsellers on how to be happy, etc. Had that such a tremendous following? Yes, Father, that's the one. Oh, uh, yes. I, I read his books. And I attended one of his lectures once in which he offered his followers an easy road to happiness. Or heaven, as he called it. That's the guy, Father. Yes. As I remember... He um, apparently based his teachings on one of the proverbs of Solomon. A merry heart doeth good like medicine, but a broken spirit dryeth the bones. Uh Uh-huh. Yes. He believed in giving up all the physical appetites, smoking, overeating, and drinking. (laughs) Yes, and above all, he believed in being cheerful. He he dealt with a drink problem with an enormous gaiety. Well, he's dead. His body was discovered early this morning. Well, you don't say... Where? Right near his house, in a ditch on the parkway. What happened? Nobody knows. But according to the police, it looks like murder. Uh, did you say his clo- uh, his house is close to the parkway? Yes, on an embankment, just above it. Well, what makes the police think it wasn't an accident, Flambeau? Well, he was wearing only his dressing gown. And another strange thing, Father. A small piece of rope was tied around one of his ankles. Was any weapon found? No, but it was apparent he'd been struck on the head by a huge instrument of some sort. Cuts and bruises on his body showed signs of a struggle. Well, who put you on the case? Oh, no one. The dead man's secretary, Robert Royce, uh-huh. is an old friend of mine. I, I called him as soon as I heard the news and offered him my services as private investigator. But he, he refused to see me. Well, that's strange. No, oh, yet, yet no. Not so strange if he were implicated. Who else is there beside Royce in the household? Just Armstrong's daughter. A very attractive girl, I hear, but completely dominated by her father's... Cheerfulness. Uh-huh. And there's also a gardener, I believe. And uh, your friend Royce, uh, well, what sort of man is he? Oh, he's a huge, genial sort of fellow, a Scotsman. Did he and Armstrong get along well together? Well, Royce was devoted to him. Ah, uh, yes. Armstrong had many devoted followers. You know, he's always interested me, Flambeau. He did puzzled me, in fact. Puzzled you? Yes. When, when first I heard him lecture, I, I remember thinking that he had a troublesome road ahead. I believe that somewhere in his life, you'll find the secret of his death. But, Father, according to the papers, he lived as he preached. Oh, yes, I know, I know, Flambeau. The old fellow's optimism was phenomenal. But somehow I don't believe he found that easy road to heaven, as he called it. No? No. Neither have I. There is no shortcut to heaven, my friend. But who would want to kill such a man? Well, if if ever I murdered somebody, I dare say it might well be an optimist of the proportions of old Armstrong. His optimism was so out of proportion. I've heard cheerfulness referred to as a virtue. Yeah, well, people like frequent laughter, but a permanent smile, Flambeau. Well, now that that's something else again. As Shakespeare says, the devil hath power to assume a pleasing shape. Oh, Father, it's six o'clock. We're just in time for the news. Let's turn on the radio. That's a good idea. Perhaps there's something further on the case. Listen. Clear tonight and tomorrow somewhat cooler. Now we bring you a special bulletin just handed me on the Armstrong. Yeah, turn us up, Flambeau. John Magnus, the gardener, the millionaire philanthropist, has been reported missing. Oh. Also, negotiable bonds, the dead man, valued at $100,000. The police received this report only a short while ago and are now conducting a statewide search for the gardener. It is believed... Well... That seems to be the first real clue. Do you mind if I use the phone, Father? Uh, I'd like yeah. to uh, talk to Royce again. Yeah. The call uh, will cost you a nickel. Tax, two cents. That's seven cents. It, it just drop a dime in the poor box on your way out. All right, Father. Hello, Royce. This is Flambeau. Now, wait a minute. We just heard the news about the gardener's disappearance. Well, hold on, hold on. You remember the friend I was telling you about? Yes, Father Brown. Well, we'd like to come up. What's that? Oh, I don't get it. Royce. Royce. 
My father, he's hung up. What did he say? He said if we valued our lives, we wouldn't go near that house. Ah, interesting. Well, 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 Flambeau, that's what I call a real invitation. Come on, my friend, let's go. Well, I'm sure there's someone here, Father. Hmm. Ring again, Flambeau. Ah, here's someone now. Yes? What do you want? Oh, good evening, Royce. So it's you, Flambeau. I thought I warned you plain enough over the phone. You did. But look here, Royce. I don't understand... It was plain English I spoke. I know, but you sounded like you were in trouble. Well, I'm not. Oh, come, man. Don't act as though we weren't friends. Oh, this is Father Brown. Ah, uh, I gathered as much. Um, Mr. Royce, I, I, I'm afraid I'm to blame for this visit. Well, it was good of you to come, Father, but I wish you'd both heeded my warning. Man, what kind of a friend would I have been if I had? I tell you, the police have already investigated. I know, I know. I've talked with them. Uh, perhaps we can help you, Mr. Royce. Help? In what way? Well, uh, maybe we could tell better if you'd ask us in. Very well. You may come in. But you should have let sleeping dogs lie, Flambeau. Royce, I must confess I can't find anything here in Armstrong's room that tells us very much. And just what did you expect to find? Mr. Rice. Yes? Uh, what do you make of the gardener's disappearance? Magnus is a fool, maybe a thief, but he never killed Mr. Armstrong. I'm sure it was the deed of a madman. Uh, I see. My, my, my. Well, I would never have expected those to be there. Father, what are you looking at? Well, that pair of socks over there thrown under the bureau. Oh, they should be in the bureau drawer. Here, I'll put them away. Uh, wait, uh, may I have a look at those bureau drawers, Mr. Rice? What for? Well, I'd just like to look. What are you searching for? Well, I'll take a peep at that closet, too, if you don't mind. Well, now that's funny. What, Father? Everything looked so neat when we came in. Mr. Armstrong was always very particular. Everything is in order on the surface. But underneath, underneath... Things look different. What things? Well, in the closet, his socks are stuffed in the hangers with the suits. And in the bureau drawers, under those beautifully laid-out shirts... Yes? A whole lot of ginger spilled from a box. Why do you have to go on with this? The police went over the room very thoroughly. The room, perhaps. But they seem to have missed this piece of rope. Look here. I found it caught in the vine just below the ledge of the window. Well, it couldn't have been there this morning or the police would have found it. Well, I just saw the wind blow an end of it out from under the vine. Royce, maybe you can tell me how this piece of rope got there. What has that got to do with the case? You know perfectly well a piece of rope was tied around the leg of the dead man. That rope in your hand was left from fixing the windows. Well, now, I'm just wondering. Wondering, wondering what, Father? Well, let me take a look out of that window. Why? For a very good reason. The police haven't yet established why the dead man was found on the parkway. No. No, that isn't it. The window isn't high enough for the, from the ground for him to have fallen. Or been pushed or to have jumped. Right. And not high enough for his body to have rolled down the embankment to the parkway. Mr. Rice, isn't there another floor to this house? Eh, uh, there's only an attic. Mm. That's Miss Armstrong. She's been much upset since her father's death. Oh, yes, yes, of course. You'll have to excuse me for a moment. Certainly. Father, hmm. I don't like the look of things. This rope I found in the vine was cut with a sharp instrument. The rope found on Armstrong's ankle was also cut with a sharp instrument. Hmm. And did you notice the cut on Royce's knuckle? Yes, yes, I did, Flambeau. But, uh, you know, I haven't noticed any geniality. He's hardly the person you described to me. Yes, I know, Father. Didn't like him. Nevertheless, it seems to fit his unshaven appearance. It's the first time I've ever seen him that way, either. You're worried about your friend's innocence, aren't you? Oh, I know how the mind of a thief works, Father. I was once a thief myself. But murder... You think he's capable of murder? Well, the answer to that one is more up your alley, Father. Well, in any event, he's hiding something. But I think there is a secret in this house more important than his. And I'm very anxious to find out what it is. Now, first, look at the stains on the wall. 
And, and you felt the dust on the banisters as we came up? Well? Well, but the, 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 the question fairly screams at us, Flambeau. What question? Why are there no servants in this house? Yeah. Well, Armstrong certainly had plenty of money. He could afford them. Mm -hmm. There could only be one reason. If the old man himself had something to hide. Father, you mean you think Armstrong... Well, I... Miss Armstrong's in the drawing room downstairs. She'd like to talk to you, Father Brown. If you will please follow me. Well, I, I hesitate to continue, Miss Armstrong. I, I know how badly you feel. Please go on, Father Brown. I'm quite all right. But that bruise on your forehead, Miss Armstrong. Oh, that's nothing. It doesn't bother me. I bumped it. Your father had a great many followers, didn't he? Oh, yes, he helped so many people. Do you know why your father decided to give up all his servants? Well, great men like my father have their peculiarities. Their ideas are often different from other people's. Yes, very true, Mr. Royce, very true. I was only wondering... Wait. This. What? This. Someone's unlocking the front door. Who could it be? No one has a key besides us. Who's that? Me, Magnus. Magnus? Yes, Miss Armstrong, Magnus. And here is Inspector Vincent. Well, how are you, Inspector? Fine, Father Brown, fine. Uh, hello, Flambeau. I might have known you two would be here. Well, I see you got your man, Inspector. Is this the gardener who walked out of here with $100,000 worth of bonds? Walked out of here and right into my office to place them in my charge. Hello, Royce. Uh, are you feeling better, Miss Armstrong? Yes, thank you, Inspector. Now, Magnus, perhaps you'd care to tell Miss Armstrong why you took those bonds without consulting her. No one in this household is to be trusted. Not even Miss Armstrong. Now, see here, Magnus. Just a minute, Royce. What I want to know, why did you wait so long before reporting this gardener's absence? We didn't think much of it, Inspector, until I noticed the bonds were gone, too. I was waiting for you to report it. Magnus has been telling me some very interesting things. A new angle on the case, Inspector? Well, the close of the case, if Magnus is telling the truth. Inspector, what this man says is not to be taken seriously. He's not been himself. What makes you say that? Magnus used to be my father's personal valet, Inspector. But he was taken off that and put to work in the garden. He's been very upset. He thought it was quite a come down. Hmm. Upset, am I? Well, I like that. I wasn't going to tell the inspector about you two being in love, but now Be I... Be careful what you say, Magnus. You weren't so careful what you said when I heard you two talking in the garden the other night. Magnus! I've stood enough of this. Take it easy, Royce. Inspector, may I make a suggestion? Uh, just I... a minute, Father Brown. Magnus, what are you getting at? About four nights ago it was. I heard them in the garden. He was begging her to marry him. They didn't know I was close by. No... No, Robert, we mustn't. But, Alice, you have no life of your own. Let's face your father now. Let's tell him how much we love each other. Oh, but, Robert, we must wait. We really ought to. I know how important you are to his work, but what about us? Our life, we can't go on waiting forever. Oh, but, Robert, it won't be forever. Oh, darling, you know I love you. You must be sure of that. I am sure, my dearest. Oh, if only I could get my hand on some money. What do you mean, Robert? I'd make you marry me then, Alice. Oh, Robert. I feel guilty even thinking of it. We mustn't, my darling. Not now. So long as he's alive. I'll find some way out of this. Shh. I thought I heard someone. We'd better not talk here. Come. Yes. Come, my dear. Well, that's all I could hear. But I suspected them what they were up to, and now I know. And you know what? That they would be off with the money. Mr. Armstrong's money. The money he had wanted to be used for his work. Inspector, this talk is ridiculous. You don't Mr. think... Mr. Rice, do you use an old-fashioned razor? I? You didn't use it today. Why? Why, I... I mislaid it. When? I don't know. Since, since I last shaved, I guess. That was yesterday. You can tell by his beard. Magnus brought your razor into the precinct with him with the bonds. I'm holding it as evidence. Why? Because it had a smear of blood on it. Oh, well, I must have cut myself shaving and forgot to wipe it. Oh, Inspector, is this all the evidence you have of Royce's guilt? Who said anything about Royce's guilt? Now, Magnus, tell them what you told me just now in the office. I was sleeping in my room over the garage and... 
About four this morning, I heard shots, followed by loud outcries, which seemed to come from the attic. An instant later, I I saw Mr. Armstrong's body pitch from the window and roll down the embankment. When I made sure he was dead, I rushed up to the attic and found his daughter unconscious on the floor with a razor in her hand. You mean Miss Armstrong killed her father? It's a lie! Surely, Father Brown, you for one will take Miss Armstrong's word against this gardener's? But is Miss Armstrong's word against him? So far, she has said nothing. Miss Armstrong, can't you speak? Magnus told the truth. There, you see? I'll get you for this. I'll Magnus. get you. Here now. Please, you'll not say things like that. I will, and I do. Royce, go on. Let go. None of that, Royce. Or I'll arrest you for assault. No. You'll arrest me for murder. Robert. But, man, you've been Armstrong's best friend. What possessed you? I was drunk. Sure. Didn't I find those empty bottles hidden in the garden, piling up week after week? Sure. I knew what was going on here. Now, now, Magnus, you've told your story. Let Royce tell his. Maybe he was too drunk to remember. Miss Armstrong did not pick up the razor to attack, but to defend her father from me. In the scuffle, she hit her head against the eaves of the attic. I hurried down to get something to revive her, and it must have been then that Magnus came in and found her. Oh, Robert! Robert! All right, Royce. Come along. Uh, wait, Inspector. Before you arrest Royce. What is it now, Father Brown? Well, so far we've had opinions and confessions. But we haven't had facts. And we need facts. And where do you think we'll find them? In the attic. In the attic? Uh, yes, Inspector. Perhaps by climbing a few steps nearer heaven, we can come closer to this evil. <laughs> I can't figure out what you expect to find in this attic. Uh, you you sleep here, don't you, Mr. Royce? Aye. And Mr. Armstrong slept in the room immediately below this. Aye, but why all these questions? Well, now, in the first place, Mr. Royce, uh, why did you bring your victim up here at the crack of dawn in order to kill him? Why didn't you go to his room? Well? I confess. Isn't that enough? Well, confession is good for the soil, that's granted, but, uh, Inspector... You, you remember Magnus telling us he was awakened by shots? Yes. What about those shots, Inspector? Were any bullets found in Armstrong's body? Well, we investigated and didn't find a one. Wait, uh, wait. Here is my pistol. I fired those shots. You can see the holes in the carpet. Well, why should anybody fire at the carpet? A drunken man will let fly at anything. Uh, he doesn't pick a quarrel with his feet. And there's the rope. It was from my window here that Armstrong was thrown. And the piece of rope I found fell to the vines below. What about the blow on the head? According to our report, he was struck by a massive weapon. A massive weapon indeed, Inspector. Sure, the good green earth was the weapon. Okay, so the good green earth was the weapon. But look, this room was the beginning of the murder. Even I can see from the disorder. Come on, Royce. Let's go. But the disorder here is all on the surface. The very opposite of Armstrong's room. No, no. It doesn't fit. Too many inconsistencies. Father Brown, Royce has given himself up. No, 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 no. Really, this won't do at all. What won't do? Well, first the police said no weapon was found at all. Now we're finding too many. Too many? Now, there's the razor to cut a person, the rope to strangle, the pistol to shoot, and after all this, Armstrong broke his skull falling out of a window. No, 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 no. It won't do. It's not economical. Alice, they won't believe me. You tell them. Inspector. Yes, young lady. May I speak to Father Brown alone for a moment? If you must, but be quick. We can't wait around here all night. And now what is it, my child? What is it that you wish to say? You're trying to save Robert, but it's no use. I should have realized before this his case is hopeless. Before he came to us, he was a prisoner of war. He had some shocking experiences. Well, you think that was the reason for his drinking? Yes, he wasn't himself at times. Mm. We thought he was getting over it, but... Father, I saw Robert commit the crime myself. Mm. I heard the shots. I ran up just in time to see him leap at my father. Where was your father standing? He was clinging to the windowsill in terror. But uh, the rope... Robert tried to strangle him with it. Father fought back and the rope slipped from his shoulders to his feet, tightening around the leg. Robert was like a maniac. I snatched the razor from the floor and 
managed to cut the rope before he pushed me against uh, the eaves. Miss eaves. Armstrong, what we see with our eyes is sometimes farthest from the truth. Now, you thought that you saw a man about to commit murder. What you actually saw was two men struggling. And then you lost consciousness. But, Father Brown... I want you to go downstairs, my dear. I don't understand. Go on now, please. Do as I say. Very well. Thank you, my dear. Well, Father Brown, I've seen and heard enough to convince me. Unless you know something pretty startling, I'm taking Royce down and booking him. If you don't mind, Inspector, I'd like to talk to Royce a bit before you do. What about, Father? Oh, where's Alice? She's out of earshot, Mr. Royce. So why don't you tell us about it now? Tell you about what? I see. Well, then I'll tell you, Inspector. Those three tools of death were not used to kill Armstrong, but to save him. Save him? Father, I don't get this. Save him from what? From himself. At the time old Armstrong died, he was a suicidal maniac. No, Royce, you weren't drinking. No? No, and you were the only one who knew what lurked behind old Armstrong's laughter. No, no. Yes, you knew what, uh, that behind that merry mask was the mind of an atheist. No. A man who knew nothing of God. He didn't realize until it was too late that human beings need something to worship greater than themselves. I warned Flambeau not to bring you here, Father. I was afraid it might come to this. Well, man, what harm is there in the truth now? Alice must never know. Why? Why shouldn't she be told that you weren't the enemy her father feared? Shall I name the enemy, Royce? All right, Father Brown, you win. This morning, Armstrong was determined to do away with himself. He knew I kept my service pistol in my dresser. And when he heard me go down to the kitchen early at dawn, he left his room and came up here. And you came in and accidentally surprised him. I, I got the pistol out of his hand, but in the struggle I had no time to unload, so I fired at the carpet. Then he found my razor and tried to slash himself. Mm. I snatched it from him and flung it to the floor. I ran after him with a rope to tie him up. And it was then that the unlucky girl ran in and misunderstanding the struggle. She tried to cut her father free with a razor. She cut the rope, slashing my knuckle just as I pushed her, and he went crashing into eternity out of that window. But, Father Brown, you spoke of an, of an enemy, old man Armstrong, fear. I did, yes. You mean the enemy was in this room with him at the same time as Royce? Yes. What? The sin. The very thing Armstrong was so vehement against. You mean alcohol? Who was his worst enemy. The moment I saw the ginger in one of the bureau drawers downstairs, I suspected it was the futile effort of a man who was trying to give up drinking. Isn't that right, Royce? Yes, Father Brown. Armstrong was living a lie, and it preyed on his mind. And he feared his public might find him out. Aye. The more despondent he got, the darker visions he had of failing his followers. The people who looked to him for guidance. So fearful was he of anyone praying into his secret that he hid from his friends and got rid of all his servants. And you were the only one he could confide in. Aye. He didn't understand your loyalty, did he? No, but it was for her sake, you see. And so you kept the knowledge of his spells to yourself, letting his daughter believe it was you, the result of the war. Aye. Well, Royce, I can't imagine why you didn't speak up before. Don't you see? It was because she must never know. Never know what? Why, that she killed her own father. I see. By trying to free him. My son, I think she should know. After all, it was only an accident. And accidents, no matter how tragic, do not poison life like sins. I think you should both be happier now. Surely, two private lives are worth more than the public reputation of Aaron Armstrong. <laughs> Father, at last you're back. Yes, we were worried. Uh, hello, Nora. Hello, Peter. Have you had dinner? I, uh... No, no, I don't think I have. Oh, that's a shame. I'd better go fix you something right away. Oh, my. It's nice to sit down again. Oh, Peter, you missed your story tonight. I'm sorry. Father, I heard tonight's story. Many versions of it. You did? How? From the news commentators over the radio. Oh, They've been reading bulletins on it every half hour or so. I see. Tell me, Father, what made you suspect Royce wasn't guilty? 
were looking into the hidden places of his attic room convinced me of Royce's innate neatness, Peter. I don't quite see. Well, I, I knew that no one as orderly as Royce could commit such a murder. The whole thing was too sloppy. I mean, the three tools of death. But how did you discover that Armstrong was a suicide? Well, the same method, but in reverse. I'm afraid my methods are, are not orthodox, Peter. I'm no real detective. To, to me, a man's inner nature must be revealed first. Armstrong's habits revealed his nature just as Royce's did. They justified certain suspicions I had when Flambeau told me of his death. What do you mean? Well, Armstrong's erratic character was uh, clear to me when I looked into his bureau drawers. See, there, there I saw the compartments of his mind. The neatness mixed with the disorder which his friend Royce had tried to cover up. The litter reflecting the mind of the depressed. Surely you had something more than that to prove he was a suicide? Well, uh, yes, Peter, I had myself. Yourself? Yes. I dare say that I would feel as Armstrong did if I had ever preached an easy road to happiness and then had slipped into a ditch by the side of the road. Yes, Father, I see. Yes. Well, now, uh, good night, Father Peter. Good night, Father Brown. been listening to The Adventures of Father Brown with Carl Swenson as Father Brown. Father Brown's adventure tonight was called The Three Tools of Death. The character of Father Brown was created by G.K. Chesterton in the detective novels called The Adventures of Father Brown. This is the Armed Forces Radio Service. Christie's unforgettable stories of corpses, clues, and crime, Mutual now brings you, complete with bowler hat and magnificent mustache, your favorite detective, Hercule Poirot, in Murder Wears a Mask. I'd like to speak to Mr. Poirot. Uh, won't you come in? Your name, please? Richard Fields. Uh, Mr. Poirot's busy at the moment. Please sit down. I'll tell him you're here. Thank you. Uh, there's some magazines on the table at your left. Uh, Mr. Poirot, it's a Mr. Fields. Eh? Well, he can wait. He's a very patient man. He only rang the bell once. Here, Abigail, I want you to taste this sauce now. Mmm. Mmm, it's good. Good? Oh, ma foi, Abigail, it is superb. There are only three people in the world who know how to prepare this sauce. And you are about to become the fourth. Now, you take two tablespoons... Chief, there's someone waiting. 
Ah, oui. Miss, Monsieur Fields, hein? Eh bien, I suppose we must see him. Come. Mr. Fields, this is Mr. Perot. Oh, how do you do? Bonjour, monsieur. Well, it uh, must be an important matter which calls you away from your business at the moment when it is most active. Well, as a matter of fact, I don't recall mentioning my business. But it was not necessary, monsieur. The Journal of War 